Good morning and welcome to the Agronomist Conference 2022. I'm delighted to see so many of you join us live online, although don't worry, I can't actually see you. And I would also like to extend a warm welcome to all of our speakers for today. My name is Anna Reynolds and I'm Head of Engagement for Cereals and Oilseeds here at HDB. Um, before we get on to the housekeeping and our first session, I would like to highlight a couple of things that I'm quite excited about, both with my HDB and my farming hats on. As many of you will know, we launched our sector plans last month, and as a result, the first phase of a major review of the recommended list is taking place this winter. The latest version of the recommended list itself will be winging its way to you in post um, in early in the new year, together with the updated recommended list app and the variety selection tool, which I'm sure Paul Gosling will talk about in his session later on. But back to recommended list review. We need to keep the recommended list relevant. So if you have strong opinions, we want to hear from you. We need to keep, um, excuse me, a detailed questionnaire will be available on our website, or is available on the website currently for you and your clients to fill out. And we'll be running focus groups early in the new year. So if you'd like to take part, please get in touch. Talking of focus groups uh, and of strong opinions, we're also looking to recruit a latest cohort of monitor and strategic farms to join our network. On-farm trials, demonstrations and discussions are incredibly important. They have never been more important. So we would welcome strong applicants and nominations. Applications are open until the 10th of February. So please join the recommended list review, get involved in a strategic and monitor farm network and help us help you. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Fiona who go through the housekeeping and introduce our first session. We'll be using Poll EV to take questions and for interaction today. You can access Poll EV on another tab on the um, internet browser that you're currently using and go to pollev.com forward slash AHDB. Those details are on the screen for you to copy over. You can also access Poll EV on your smartphone using the Poll EV app or you can use the web browser on your phone and follow pollev.com forward slash AHDB. We will be asking questions throughout the panel sessions um, throughout today, so please do ask questions as they come to you uh, during the presentations. You can like questions that are already posted and that will give a higher ranking to those particular questions, which will make, mean we'll see them and be able to ask those. If you do encounter any issues, you can email um, events at ahdb.org.uk and we will try to help you there. For those of you on Twitter, you can use the hashtag Ag Conf 2022, which again is on the screen, so you can be asking questions and live tweeting throughout the day. There are six basis points and two Neuroso points available for today. If you haven't already given us your, um, your details for points, you can do so on the evaluation form which will be circulated after the event. You can email mykatecha at ahdb.org.uk, her details are on the screen, and her details are also available on the main agronomist conference page. Um, the, if you go to ahdb.org.uk forward slash events and click on the agronomist conference or you can go to ahdb.org.uk forward slash agronomists and you will see um, a plethora of resources that are available to you including a bespoke video from the UK flour millers on ergot management. So this morning's focus is going to be on IPM. Our first session will look at um, trends in wheat ball fly, followed by insecticide resistance and decision support management systems available to you. We'll then be followed by a uh, focus on diseases, looking at stem rust, varieties and what's next for the recommended lists and our annual independent fungicide performance data. This afternoon, we'll look at um, nutrition, uh, optimising nutrition for both economic and environmental sustainability as well as uh, tools to help you in doing so, and we'll look at the environment. So looking at alternatives to nutrition, carbon, greenhouse gas uh, accounting, and net zero. So without further ado, that leaves me to hand over to our first speaker, Steve Ellis, who is the principal research consultant at ADAS, who will be sharing the trends in data um, of AHDB's autumn wheat bulb fly survey. Thank you, Steve. We'll hand over to you. Good morning, everybody. 
and I want to start by apologising actually for the fact that our subject today is not a particularly flamboyant insect, as you can probably see from this picture. It's, it's slightly smaller than a house fly. The males are dark brown, the females are a yellowish grey colour, and generally speaking it's a pretty dull looking beast, but it, it's important nonetheless. Now the larva of the wheat bowl fly is the thing that actually causes the, the problems. It burrows into wheat tillers and goes through four larval instars, and each of those larval instars can kill a tiller. So potentially the, the wheat bowl fly larva can, can, till, can kill the plant before it actually gets going. A fully grown larva is about 10 millimetres long when it's, when it's grown. And obviously because it can move between tillers and between plants, it can potentially cause quite a significant level of damage. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever considered reincarnation, but I'd like to suggest that if you don't really want to come back as a wheat bowl fly egg, and that is for two main reasons. Firstly, your parents are completely irresponsible, and secondly, they are compulsive gamblers. And I say this because basically what they do every year is that they lay their eggs in an area of bare ground and they just pray that that bare ground is going to be sown with a cereal, and in particularly winter wheat. Now, to be fair to, to wheat bowl fly, generally speaking, they get it right. And the larvae then hatch, and the eggs are laid between July and September. They don't actually hatch until the following January or February. So there's quite a period in between while, while these eggs are laying dormant in the soil. Once they do hatch, they invade the plant, and as I said before, they go through four larval instars. And they move between tillers, and if they happen to kill the plant, they will then move to another plant. So, so once, the damage is, uh, once they've started damaging plants, they can potentially move on to others. Now, once you get to about April, March time, the larval development is complete, they pupate, and they then move out into the soil, and the, the new adults hatch. And of course, having learnt absolutely nothing from their parents, they then go on to lay eggs in bare soil and the, and the whole cycle starts all over again. Now, if we're going to develop a sustainable control package for wheat bowl fly, it's absolutely crucial that we can predict risk. So we can do this by soil sampling. And this basically involves taking large volumes of soil and then extracting the eggs from this soil. This gives you an idea of what is actually involved with the soil sampling. So we normally take 10 centimetre diameter cores, which are 15 centimetres deep. So if you imagine they're about a bag of sugar size, you normally take about 20 cores from about four hectares. If the land has been cultivated, you need to account for that, so you have to sample even deeper to cultivation depth. And to cut a long story so short, you can end up with about 20 kilograms of soil, which is a significant weight of soil to have to lug around across the fields. What happens next is that you extract the soil on what we call a salt and holic extractor. And this is basically a bank of sieves of decreasing diameter as you move down through the apparatus. And you can see at the bottom there's a circular sieve, which is the collecting sieve, and ultimately what you end up with is small organic pieces of material and eggs and small soil particles in the collecting sieve. What you then do is you immerse the collecting sieve into a vat of saturated magnesium sulphate, which is incredibly dense, so the flies, the organic material, actually floats to the top. You can pick off the eggs quite easily, count them, and you know how many cores you've taken, so you know the area of ground that you've sampled. You can then make a calculation and calculate the numbers of wheat bile fly eggs per metre squared or per hectare. And that is what you then use as a means of predicting the risk for the following crops. Now, we've been monitoring wheat bile fly now since 1984, so we've actually got a bit more data than the title of the talk suggests. So we're looking at data going right back to 1984, and 
The question is, how variable are wheat bulb fly egg numbers? And I think you can see from this graph that they are very variable. So the dotted line across the middle is the mean count since 1984. And you can see that the, the numbers actually fluctuate above and below that mean. The interesting thing is that since about 2012, the numbers have tended to be below the long-term average, uh, suggesting that perhaps as, as we get drier summers, then the, the risk of wheat bulb fly will actually decline, although we obviously can't be certain about that yet. And we can investigate this a bit further using a running average. And just to say, first of all, that obviously with a, with a running average, the earlier plots are the least reliable because obviously the 1984 plot consists of just one data point. Now as you move through the years, you've got more data points contributing and the, the average becomes that much more accurate. And I think you can see again from about 2010, there's a, a gradual downward trend in the numbers of, of wheat bulb fly. So, why do wheat bowl fly numbers vary? Well, if we're perfectly honest, we probably don't know. But we think that it's probably to do with the availability of food for the adult flies. And the adult flies feed on saprophytic fungi in the wheat ears. So when you get a wet summer, you get a lot of uh, fungi developing in the ears. Harvest is delayed, so those fungi have a longer period to develop. The adult wheat bulb flies are able to feed on those fungi and consequently they're able to develop and lay large numbers of eggs. Now in contrast, in a dry summer, you get a very rapid harvest, as a result limited fungal growth in the ears and the adults are able to feed less well, they develop le lower numbers of eggs and ultimately the less number of eggs are, are laid. So we think this is, this is probably the reason why the, the numbers vary up and down. Now, if the numbers, if we know the well, wheat bulb fly risk, the question then, of course, is what can we do about it? And to be perfectly honest, in terms of chemical treatments, we can do very little. <clears throat> On this table, you can see down the left-hand side, we have a risk category, which is the numbers of wheat bulb fly eggs per million, millions per hectare, and then across the top we got And the reason sowing date is important is because, as I said, the eggs don't hatch until January or February. So the later sown the crop, the more likely its emergence date is likely to coincide with a wheat bulb fly hatch. And at that stage, the crop is very susceptible to attack because it's only got potentially one shoot. So at that stage of the year, wheat bulb fly becomes a significant problem. But as you can see, in September and October, there are no current chemical control options for wheat bulb fly. In November and December, there's only control options once you get above one million eggs per hectare, and that's a seed treatment. And seed treatments are only effective for late sown crops, that is crops sown beyond the end of October. And the reason for that is because if you use a seed treatment earlier, it simply runs out of steam before the, the wheat bulb flies actually hatch. So the question there now is that, or I've already said that you, you can sample wheat bulb fly eggs to predict weeks, to predict risk. But I've also said it's incredibly hard work because you end up with 20 kilos of soil which you have to lug around the field. So the question then becomes, can we develop a model and a model based on meteorological data that we can use to predict wheat bulb fly risk? And there are various sources of MET data available. We've got also the HDB wheat bulb fly survey results going back right to, to, well, data going right back to 1952 in some instances. And... Uh, we, we can therefore use that to make predictions of the risk in any particular year. And the benefit of developing a model to predict risk is that we get our results much earlier than we would from soil sampling. Soil sampling, we tend to get our results around about the end of September, early October. 
if we can develop an, an effective model, we can potentially predict the risk of wheat bowl fly attack before the crop grows in the ground. And that gives us much more scope to be able to come up with potential means to combat the pest. Now, the first model we, we looked to produce was use, it's a, it's, a, it's a very simple predictive model. It, it, it works on a, a linear regression. It's done in a, a statistical package called R. And we look to develop two models. First of all, a seasonal model, which used mean temperatures from winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And also a monthly model to see if the, the increased amount of data would allow us to come up with a, a more precise prediction. And it also says there that model simplification through backward stepwise model selection, which sounds very grand. Basically, all that means is that you look at a whole range of meteorological parameters. If they don't have a significant impact on wheat bulb fly egg numbers, you discard them. Now, the other thing that we were limited with to some extent with our model is that we know wheat bulb fly eggs need low temperatures in January and February to trigger hatch. Now, data on frost days are only available from 1970 onwards. So we were only, allowed, we're only able to, do, to put that into our model, model for data from 1970 onwards. So how effective were our models? Well, first of all, I should say that developing the model is not, is not something new. A chap called John Young and his colleague Joe Cochran had a go at it back in the, the 1990s, and they produced a, a workable model, again, based on MET data. Here you can see two graphs which summarize the, the models that we, we, we produced. The first one goes back to 1952, and the second one, our so-called reduced model, goes back to 1970. And the only reason it's called the reduced model is because it was reliant on less data than the, the model A. So, and that was simply because we didn't have data for frost days from 19, before 1970. Now, when Young and Cochrane produced their model back in the 90s, they were able to account for about 59% of the variability in wheat bulb fly egg numbers, which is quite reasonable. Our first model, uh, our monthly model, was able to predict at the same sort of level, so, so not much progress there. But in our reduced model, where we were able to include frost days, we were able to account for 70% of the variability in wheat bulb fly egg numbers. So that is a significant improvement on the, uh, the Young and Cochrane model and is a potential for, for developing strategies for control of the pest. Now, what parameters actually impact on the numbers of wheat bulb fly eggs? And I won't go through all of these, but these are some of the things that we actually put into the model a whole range of meteorological parameters. And the reason we use MET data is simply because insects are cold-blooded, they, they respond to temperature. So generally speaking, as temperature increases, insects become less active. But you st then when you see these parameters and you see what impact they have on wheat bulb fly egg numbers, then you start to think about how you can explain this biologically. And I don't want to go through all of these, but um, you can see there uh, January mean temperature. As January mean temperature increases, the effect on wheat bulb fly decreases. And this seems to make sense because we know that the flies or the eggs need low temperatures in January in order to hatch. Similarly, frost days, as frost days increase, then that has a positive impact on wheat bulb fly egg numbers. And that probably is because it stimulates hatch, so more eggs hatch in any particular season. Now, from April onwards, right through to July, you could argue that all of those parameters have an impact of potentially accelerating the growth of the crop. And anything that accelerates the growth of the crop and potentially makes harvest earlier has the potential to reduce reap bulb fly risk because the, the, the less development of saprophytic fungi in the ears. So, if we look at 
the observed values from soil sampling and then compare that with the predicted values from the model. The predicted values are on the horizontal axis, the observed values are on the vertical axis. You can see there's, there's a pretty good relationship between those two and we can say that we're certainly on the right track in terms of developing the model. Now we can look at that in a bit more detail and in particular compare it with the results that we've got from the AHDB wheat bulb fly survey. And you can see that there is a predicted uh, region category and also an actual risk category. So in each case, the model predicted the same risk category as did soil sampling. So that's a, that's a step in the right direction. If you look at the overall egg counts, you can see certainly from 2021 and 2022, there's a very close correlation between the predicted and actual egg counts. So again, that is good. Potentially, you could argue what is less good is the individual predictions for the eastern northern regions. And wheat bowlfly is, is a pest of the eastern side of the country and we monitor in the east and in the northeast. And you can see there that the, the, the difference between the counts, the predicted counts and the actual counts, there is some variation. And clearly we need to try and address this to improve the precision of the model. So the question is, I guess, what factors potentially could be affecting those risks in the, the north and the east. And one in particular is the presence of organic soil in the east of the country. And we've shown consistently that organic soil has a higher number of wheat bowl fly eggs than mineral soil. So the question then is, how can we adapt our model to take account of this. And this is something that we, that we will need to do in the future. And we also need to think about other parameters that we are perhaps missing that we can add to the model to make it more precise. So finally, to summarize, you can, you can use soil sampling to access wheat bulb fly numbers, but it's incredibly hard work and it's very time consuming. Now, the current trends suggest that wheat bulb fly egg numbers are actually declining. But that could easily change, and we need to remain vigilant. So we need a method to estimate risk in the future. We've got a model which we developed, which we think now gives a good estimate of wheat bulb fly egg numbers. And potentially, we can improve this by adding other parameters. But I think, nevertheless, we've got a good basis from which to develop a sustainable approach to wheat bulb fly management. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, that was really interesting. So as we've just heard, there are only um, seed treatments available for wheat bulb fly, um, which just proves that uh, maintaining chemistry is really important. Um, and to do so, AHDB fund independent research to track resistance to inform the next generation of insecticide resistance guidance. Next up, we've got Steve Foster, who is a research entomologist at Rothamsted Research, who will be covering the outcomes of this work, bringing together data from the last 10 years. Over to you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, just in case. Um, hi, Mom. Right, let's, uh, let's talk about resistance and the monitoring that uh, has been done um, over quite a few years now at Rothamsted. This is a scene from Jurassic Park where Sam Neill and the children discover hatched egg and he says life will find a way. Well life will find a way when it comes down to insecticide resistance. You apply an insecticide often enough, um, mutations occur and life finds a way and um, you get insects that survive. As I said, we've been monitoring uh, for insecticide resistance in a range of pests at Rothamsted now for quite a few years. Some more recent pests more recently, but as we've discovered resistance, while others like um, aphids we've been uh, looking for over 
30 years or even 40 years in, 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 with respect to some mechanisms. And the way we primarily do this is through bioassays where we uh, apply insecticides in different ways and you can see different methodologies here, a systemic test, a topical test, um, a leaf dip test and also a glass coated glass vial test which we use for aphids and beetles. And we challenge uh, samples that come in to the insecticide and ask the question, are they really resistant? Because sometimes um, resistance isn't there, it's a, it's a consequence of maybe poor application um, and, and, and poor coverage um, to hit the insects. We'll start off with my favourite um, UK pest, the Mises, Mises persicae, which I've actually been working on now for um, 30 years. And you can see it comes in different colours. Unfortunately, it's not colour coded for the resistance. That would really help things and make, th make things move along a lot quicker. So let's start with the neonics. They've been in the, uh, in the press uh, quite, a, quite a lot uh, over the last few years as a consequence of the um, perceived damage that they do to beneficials, including bees. Um, we now know there is uh, uh, resistance in, in mainland Europe that's very strong, and um, if this demonstrates what we currently think is happening in the UK. So we have the categorisation here, fully susceptible, low resistance, moderate resistance, which is conferred by a metabolic-based me mechanism, an overproduction of an enzyme, and a target site mechanism, a mutation, that gives a very strong resistance, which we call NICR++. Um, this mutation, which we call R81T, has been found around the European Basin and Northern Africa. And it initially was just found on the primary host, um, which is um, peach or, or nectarine. But then we found it, 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 it moved on to secondary hosts, which is more concerning because it's basically the, these resistant uh, aphids are, 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 are gaining a, a foothold in, in lots of crops. Interestingly, it hasn't been found on tobacco for some reason, but um, I, I don't know why. So, oh, we've got a bit of a corruption here of, of the slide. Essentially, this should sh show the uh, Mediterranean basin um, where, where we found this R81T uh, mutation. Worryingly, again, this is corrupted. It was okay this morning. So I don't know what's happened. Anyway, um, we found uh, Mises persky on... Um, on, on sugar beets in, in Belgium with the mutation. Of course, Belgium is just across the water. So it does raise concerns that this mutation could, um, uh, could be found in, in the UK. Um, these data go back where we've actually simply applied a, a, a screening dose of imidacloprid as representative of the neonics to the backs of, of, of aphids and asked the question, how do, they, um, how do they do? And interestingly, we see that these low resistant forms, the NICR, have been found in uh, the UK, but by no means will we found the R plus or the R plus plus. So that's good news for the neonics if they're available um, uh, to, to growers. Now this slide demonstrates what we do um, with, with the bioassays and screening doses for other compounds. And this line, uh, the, the, the circles, shows a fully, what we consider to be a fully susceptible type uh, to the insecticide of Mises persky. We then choose a screening dose and we ask the question, how do subsequent samples um, compare to this susceptible baseline? And here we see a quite busy uh, num uh, amount of data, but essentially it's sitting, that over the previous years it's been sitting quite nicely on top of that susceptible baseline. Okay, so this means that that, that, that slide was about pymetrazine, plenum. So it demonstrated that there was no evidence of reduced sensitivity or indeed resistance to that compound, which is important, an important message for agronomists and growers to receive. The bad news is that pymetrazine has been lost, not due to resistance, but due to EU legislation. So not because of resistance, as I said, legislation, even though that compound would work very, very well in the UK and is kind to beneficials. So I'm just going to whiz through a bit of a, a, a quick tour of uh, the different compounds that we've been testing. Flonicamid, Topeki, leaf dip. Again, we have the susceptible baseline, and then we have the data over the years. And more recently, uh, you can see those data, uh, those samples sit quite nicely on top of 
that susceptible baseline. So no, no evidence of any reduced sensitivity or indeed resistance. And when I say reduced sensitivity, it could be an early indicator of something uh, evolving in that, uh, to the, uh, in that in Mysospersky to that particular compound. Spirotetramat, again, susceptible baseline and the data of over the years. And, and good news, um, they're sitting quite nicely on top of that baseline. So no reduced sensitivity or resistance. Cyanotroninopol, systemic test, baseline. There is some evidence that something might be going on in one sample, but I say just one sample, and that doesn't, uh, one swallow doesn't make a summer, but it's something we need to keep an eye on there. There might be uh, reduced sensitivity evolving uh, to cyanotroninopol, which could be the precursor of strong resistance. So Foxaflor, Susceptible baseline and the data again that we have. We haven't got data currently for this year and we're working on that. It's been a bit of a funny year, as you, as you probably know, with, with the uh, very hot summer, which did affect uh, the number of samples that were available. So we, we are uh, planning to test for that in the near future. The other side of the coin um, is we're finding strong resistance to esphenvalerate, which is a pyrethroid, and we've been finding that over the years. So here's not only the susceptible baseline, um, but also a baseline showing uh, strong resistance in red. And we simply put the samples on top of that, and you can see there's variation. Some of them are susceptible and some are resistant, but resistance hasn't gone away to, to that particular compound, which is important. Um, lambda cyhalothin, another uh, pyrethroid, very similar um, message to, to, to com uh, convey to you. Uh, susceptible and resistant baselines and samples that are showing resistance and some not, resist, uh, not resistant susceptibility. So essentially, we, we're monitoring, um, but for those two compounds, uh, they would not work against Mises, and that's a message that we need to uh, ensure gets out, and this is an opportunity to do that today. Moving on, we can, once we know about a, a form of resistance, we can um, actually develop molecular techniques to um, monitor, to diagnose. And we've known about resistance to perimacarb um, conferred by MACE. KDR gives moderate resistance to pyrethroids, and super KDR, the clues in the name, that gives strong resistance. So we've been looking over the years for that frequency of those mechanisms in Mises-Persky. And we see going all the way back to, um, to, to the 90s, um, MACE, we first saw it um, in 94, then, then it fell away, and then it came back again. Um, KDR, a roller coaster ride as well. It just demonstrates you can't rely on previous years to say what you're going to see currently. So it, KDR was very common initially, then it fell away to, to the point where it, we didn't see it at all for a few years. And then more recently it's coming back. And finally, the super KDR. That didn't suddenly appear in that year, 2012. It actually, that's the time at which we discovered a new mechanism. So it just demonstrates how important the bioassays are alongside the molecular mechanism, because the bioassays challenge the insects to that compound. They can't get away from it. But if there's a mechanism in there that you don't know about, that confers resistance, of course, you don't see it until, until you actually, and that's why the super KDR was discovered, the new form of super KDR. You can see quite clearly it's been very common over the last few years. So just to summarise, basically, um, we've got um, sensitivity, we've got susceptibility to a, 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 the, the early compounds, we've got resistance to pyrethroids, which is bad news. So essentially, we need to keep monitoring, we need to keep informing agronomists and growers of what will work and what won't work. Moving on to other aphid species and cereal aphids, so cy cytodium and uh, arpedi, which uh, confer com com convey um, viruses to uh, wheat and, uh, and, uh, and cereal crops. And here we can see a slide that Alan Dewar from Dewar Crop Protection took of virus yellows. And virus yellows here is quite serious, and that will affect the yield of the crop. Um, because of the loss of neonics as a consequence of um, legislation on all outdoor crops now, including the cereals. Growers are reliant in controlling these, uh, this species, these species with just the pyrethroid insecticides. Unfortunately, we have been finding resistance to pyrethroids in, in Cytobium. So as part of um, um, an AHDB-funded project, um, which we did a, a couple of years ago, we received live samples and we challenged uh, the two species 
to a pyrethroid, in this case lambda sahalothrin, in the glass file assay and ask the question, what is the latest with it? So here we can see a susceptible baseline, in, in this case in yellow, and what we consider to be a moderate resistant line in lilac. And we've asked the question, how do the, the samples compare? So these, the, this is a sample which sits quite nicely on top of the uh, susceptible baseline of cytobium. This one is more intermediate, uh, and this one, again, m edges towards the, 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 uh, the lilac um, points, which is moderate resistance. That's about 30-fold resistance compared to the susceptible baseline. The good news is we haven't seen anything further to the right which would confer strong resistance to pyrethroids, and hence um, the pyrethroid wouldn't work at all. And I think we're currently in the situation in the UK where we have some resistance, we need to keep an eye on it, but it hasn't got so serious that, the, that if you hit the aphids properly, you get good contact, you'll be able to control them, and hence hopefully control any um, transmission of virus. Uh, this is our paid eye, and these are the samples uh, that have been tested. That's a susceptible baseline. So again, good news. There's no evidence at all of any resistance to pyrethroids in the UK um, in this particular species. But it's something, again, as I said, we've got to keep an eye on. OK, let's move on to beetles. And here we can see um, a sticky trap um, from a, a year or so ago, um, which, and the number of cabbage stem flea beetles that were caught. So this was a, it has become a very important pest of all seed rape. Um, it, it's, a, it's a pest because... The adults and the larvae um, can uh, cause these um, uh, damage to the, to the crop and to the point where actually, you can see on the left here, the crop is pretty much taken out. So you don't get any, uh, any, any, any crop at all, any yield at the end. On the right hand side, we have a crop that was treated with a neonicotinoid seed treatment. And you see quite clearly how important that seed treatment was, and I stress was because it's been lost as a consequence of legislation not resistance to, to uh, neonic legislation. Um, and this is just a slide illustrating the problems I had initially. I, I, I was screening with uh, pyrethroid and used the glass file um, assay method. And these beetles play dead. They play possum. So they, I was thinking they were, they were um, susceptible, but actually they were resistant. So you, you, you prod them maybe for a few minutes um, and you think, oh, okay, they're dead. And then they get up and walk away. So it makes the bioassay quite hard to do, and you've got to be patient. But I've, at least I've got better at it now. You tickle them, basically, and you can get them to move if they are alive. And these data demonstrate, uh, uh, were created uh, by a, a PhD student, um, Caitlin Willis. And what they demonstrate is, over the, uh, these years, how the pattern of resistance has changed and how more and more resistant beetles have been found. We, we didn't do anything in, in 2021. We had a few samples, but we didn't have enough to do this. We definitely still found resistance. And this year, again, we found resistance. But there were enough data in these years to demonstrate the shift and the very fast shift from year to year of pyrethroid-resistant beetles, which would not be affected by a, um, a normal spray rate, a field spray rate in the field in the UK. So that's bad news. We need to keep monitoring, though, because things could change. And just to finish off, I'm going to go through a few other species where we have been monitoring for resistance. Diamondback moth, you probably recollect uh, in the news in 2016, we had a in, huge I influx of uh, adults from, um, from mainland Europe, we think from Scandinavia. We uh, didn't have a baseline uh, for, resist uh, for pyrethroid uh, testing. I created one but, and found quite clearly that the majority of uh, these uh, moths were resistant to pyrethroids. And that was an important message because initially, the first response uh, to a LEP, a lepidopteran pest, is to spray with a pyrethroid. Um, I demonstrated through the assays that pyrethroid resistance was very, very um, prevalent in this species and widespread. And that allowed an emergency registration of a diamide and, uh, um, to, to, to control this pest. So it just demonstrates how important monitoring and, and knowing what's out there is, is for, rec for recommending which sprays should be used. Willow carrot aphid, again, um, we've recently found pyrethroid resistance in this species. And we think it, pyrethroids would not work against uh, this particular pest uh, of carrots um, and fennel, etc. Et OK, just to finish off, um, it was assumed that pyrethroid sprays would kill beneficial species, things like um, ladybirds, parasitoids, um, um, 
lace wings, etc. But potentially, um, we, more recently, we think, well, possibly, if evolution is working on the pests, why can't it work on the beneficials? And why can't they also develop resistance? And uh, a Euro European-wide um, project called EcoStack has been addressing that question, taking beneficials, putting them into these glass vials and asking the question, how do they respond? Is there any evidence of resistance? And interestingly, we are finding resistance in some species. We found resistance in, in some ladybirds, seven spot to pyrethroids, and also in parasitoid wasps. They appear to be able to tolerate the field rate of, um, of a pyrethroid. So it's not necessarily all bad news. Maybe some of uh, these beneficials are not being killed by these sprays. It's an important uh, finding to make. And it just demonstrates evolution can work in any species, really, if the selection pressure is, is, um, is enough. So in the past, we had this wide diversity of compounds available. Growers could alternate um, these compounds um, with different modes of action and hence keep resistance down. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, it's not, that's not the case. We've not only lost a lot of compounds or some compounds to resistance, but also to legislation. And potentially, this could be the, uh, the picture in the future where we just don't have any compounds that are available to growers, or very few. And of course, those few compounds would be under much higher selection pressure for resistance to develop. So time machine, what, what does the future hold? Is it a case that we, the technology and the new methods um, that, that are being developed, maybe new cultivars, new variants of crops that are being developed that are inherently resistant to, to, um, to, to pest pressure? Who knows? That would be a good way forwards. However, uh, oh, just a slide about um, the climate um, and, 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 and cold. We think, particularly in aphids, that overwinter with active forms, they don't like cold weather. So this is the scene, obviously, from Frozen, so the cold never bothered me anyway. We think the cold does bother um, uh, aphids, particularly in Mysospersky, those that are resistant to insecticides. The bad news is, of course, climate change, and the winters are getting warmer and warmer, and hence more and more uh, aphids are getting through the winter period as ac active forms, and hence more and more available early on in the season to infect, in infect crops. So... Will this be the more likely to be the uh, pictures that we see in the future? Here's beet yellows and another uh, repeat of the virus yellows. So who knows? We will have to see. So just to finish off, just to thank all these sponsors, that uh, are, are funders that have given money to the resistance monitoring over the years. Thank you. Oh, and also my colleagues that have been doing some of the work. Thank you very much, Steve. As we've heard, a calculated approach to IPM is needed, bringing together cultural and safe chemical control options. So our next speaker is Mark Ramsden, a crop scientist from ADAS, who has been working on a number of Horizon 2020 projects, um, looking to optimise decision support systems. Before we invite Mark to the platform, um, we've got time for a quick poll. So the poll will be coming up on your Poll EV. Just a reminder that you can access that on the Poll EV app or on a web browser at pollev.com forward slash AHDB. You'll be able to ask all of your questions there as well once the poll has closed. So if we launch the poll, that's ready to go. Um, so there are lots of tools available to help decisions. Um, so we've got AHDB's BYDV tool and sclerotinia risk infection tool, which bring together um, years of independent research into a, a tool that's easy for you to use. As farmers and agronomists, we always welcome your feedback. So if you do use these tools and have got ways that we can improve, then you can let us know. Hopefully we'll be able to launch those results very soon. Um, I can't actually see them, but I'm sure at home they're very interesting results, um, which is um, it's good to see. Okay, so we'll hand over to Mark. Um, he's going to talk about the projects that he's been working on um, with lots of uh, different people around Europe. Thank you, Mark. It's an excellent summary of, of how a model can be used in pest support. And 
Um, and Steve Foster has given us an excellent overview of the importance of being able to use pesticides and their role in, in management. And uh, so today I'm just going to give an overview of the bigger picture of where we are with decision support systems uh, and some progress being made and collaborative work across Europe. Um, I believe that the, the results of the survey, although I can't see them, um, are everyone who's responded is saying that they are using decision support systems uh, and either sometimes or quite often, uh, very few are never using them. So we know that these systems are getting used and what we're trying to do is improve the number of systems available uh, and the, the, the way in which they're supporting decision-making processes. So decision support systems are part of that, that process uh, in making robust, context-specific specific decisions, um, but they are, they are there to be used as part of the picture and as part of, of the process. And they're no replacement for years' experience, they're no replacement for uh, training and discussion and considering the, the site-specific needs of a, of a crop uh, in a given season. So in the UK, there are various systems available already. Um, I just pulled up four here from the HDB website. There's um, systems that support uh, understanding when crops are at risk from BYDV or from like leaf, leaf spot, FOMA leaf spot, and uh, sclerotinia. Um, and most of these are, are forecast systems that, that use weather data in a way similar to how Steve was uh, describing before in predicting when these pests are likely to become a problem in the crop. So for the UK, we're talking about uh, a couple of dozen systems at most spread across different crops and different sectors. Um, and their use is fairly patchy and they're largely used to inform decisions rather than really um, uh, make decisions for anyone. And the support for these systems comes and goes. And that's largely because it's not always clear um, where people should go to get access to these systems. It's also not always clear uh, how effective they are, what the benefits there they are to, to using them. Um, but also because these systems are developed often in response to a problem. And so there's a, a short-term investment to develop them, and then the support behind it goes away. Um, and this is something we've seen happening not just in the UK, but across Europe as well. In other countries, uh, there are similar networks that have established to help the farmers and agronomists make decisions about pest management. So I've just highlighted a few here. Um, in Germany, there's a long-standing uh, system, ISIP, which uses not only decision support systems, but also observation networks uh, to, to identify uh, risks of different pests through the grain. A similar system is just being established uh, called Edwin in Poland. Um, in France, they have a, a long-established network of farmers um, looking at integrated pest management. And in Norway, uh, there's a, a decision support system that's been online uh, for several years and actually, actually has been running with farmers for over 30 years um, using weather data uh, and observation networks to inform agronomists about upcoming risks. That system in Norway, uh, called VIPS, um, is open access and makes, it, uh, makes the uh, details behind models as transparent as possible. And that, um, that online platform is something that we have now been extending across Europe in the IPM Decisions Project. So the IPM Decisions Project is an is a EU-funded project. Uh, it's been running for a few years with a whole range of different actors and stakeholders, uh, not just in the UK but across Europe, um, to develop a platform that increases access to an uptake of decision support systems. So we're not just trying to come up with what researchers think is the solution. We are talking to farmers and agronomists, and researchers, software developers, platform developers, advisors, weather data suppliers. We're getting that full picture, and we've designed a platform uh, that hopefully will make it as easy as possible to get a quick analysis of what their upcoming risks are. Now, we have created the platform, and we are now uh, bringing in systems that have been developed by external providers across Europe onto the platform, so you can go to one place and see uh, access all of them in, uh, in one arena. And um, if, you're, if you want to have a look at the platform while I'm talking, please feel free to do so. You can scan that um, QR code with your phone. It'll take you to the login page, or you can go to the web address um, listed there, and you can set up an account. It doesn't take very long, 
um, or you can do that after the meeting, uh, after the uh, conference, um, and do let us know any feedback you have. These systems are developed as a result of the, the, the DSS systems hosted on the platform are all developed as a result of various different initiatives and ambitions. Um, so quite often they've been developed with a, uh, their own user interface scattered across Europe. So the platform is bringing them all into one place with a single user interface that hopefully make it easy for you to access and understand them. And we've tried to put as much information behind those systems so you can see where they've come from, what the assumptions are, and how they should be applied. Once you've registered on the platform, uh, you can set up as many farm locations as you would like. Um, so if you're working with farmers across a large area, you can add a farm for each, a farm location for each of your uh, farmers. Um, and then for each of those locations, you can add as many of the decision support systems as you'd like onto that farm. And then you can monitor through the season what the risks are at those different locations. There are some other functionalities we're adding. The ability to compare different systems and compare different locations is already on the platform. Um, and we're also looking at adding an adaptation platform to tweak certain elements uh, that will largely be used by researchers, but that, that will be online in the new year. Um, so please do keep checking, um, because there will be new functions and new systems being added uh, as, as we progress. Once you've set up the systems for each farm, uh, it'll, you can look at the, the use dashboard, and that'll give you a quick indication of which crops are at risk from which pests. You can then click on those to look at a more detailed um, view of, of, that, of a particular system. So in this case, this is showing the barley yellow dwarf virus um, uh, system that many of you will be familiar with because it's exactly the same as on the HDB website, just presented in our platform here, um, indicating where a high risk is, uh, is forecast and showing that it then resets once a, an application inset time, um, has been added to the system as a, uh, as a parameter. So again, you can look at this on the platform uh, and see, uh, see how it works. Um, we encourage you to explore what's on there at the moment. There are going to be a lot more systems added, hopefully next year, um, reflecting the wide range of different pests uh, in the UK and across Europe. Right now, though, um, these are the systems that are available. Um, and about half of them are relevant to UK growers, uh, to uh, arable UK growers, and there's a few others on there as well. Um, and we are working with HDB and plenty of other developers as well, uh, looking at new models and looking at how they can be integrated into the platform and make them accessible. So I said that there, there is uh, still a, a few gaps around key pests and key crops that, that aren't covered. Um, there are lots more models that we know about there that we can integrate. Um, uh, but it's worth saying that, that the UK is not particularly ahead or behind other countries across Europe, but there are complementary systems available. So that's why we're trying to work uh, with developers right across Europe, so that if a good system is developed in a different part of Europe, we can make that accessible to UK growers as quickly as possible. So uh, for next year, we know that there are going to be a few systems available for, for UK arable sector. Um, the BYDV system is already on there. There's going to be some systems for forecasting emergence of orange wheat blossom midge uh, and saddle gall midge. There are already systems there for septoria, tan, tan spot, and gloom blotch. Um, the pollen beetle migration threshold is, is there already, uh, and there are a couple of for, uh, uh, systems for late blight as well. And we're working with those. Um, with VIPs already, we've brought a lot of their systems into our platform. We're talking to uh, both ISIP and the Edwin groups in Germany and Poland uh, to integrate their systems. And we're working closely with, a group, uh, with groups in Denmark as well, where they have a lot of systems that will be applicable to the UK. These are all very good in, in theory, and these are good models that have been validated and demonstrated, but we want to keep growing that demonstration uh, of the systems in practice because it's really important to see these systems working and see, see how they work in, in a kind of farm context. So in the IPM Decisions Project, we've developed a method for estimating the value of decision support systems. Um, and we're also working in a sister project to that called IPM Works to demonstrate those systems in action and quantify the benefits. So the IPM Works project, uh, again, is a, an international collaboration uh, and it largely stems from an existing network of farms in France 
uh, where they've had a long established uh, approach to promoting IPM. And there they have groups of farmers working together um, to ident identify how they can take a more holistic approach to uh, pest management on their farms, bringing all these different ideas together, not just decision support systems, but different tactics, different strategies that can improve their overall production. So we're taking what's been developed in, in France, France in their Ecophyto project uh, and spreading that across Europe. So um, the main uh, approach here is to, to create hubs of farmers. Uh, so this is groups of between five and 10 farmers with a dedicated hub coach who helps guide them in what resources they need, what they can do on their farm and how that's working, and then helps them collect the data we need to demonstrate that IPM really is having a positive impact on, on pest management, on sustainability, um, while retaining profitability and uh, production. It's working, uh, developing ideas that have already been well established in several networks, including the LEAF network in the UK, and taking ideas um, from those and, and building things forward. And then we're also working to get the benefits of the hub approach back into LEAF and other uh, work in the UK as well. We're also looking at the specific benefits of using decision support systems. Um, so this was some work done in Denmark that uh, compared using a decision support system against the other alternative control strategies. Um, and there they found that there was a reduction in the uh, number of fungicide applications needed to achieve control compared to fixed treatment uh, schedules. And the really key thing here yeah, this, this was work done over 12 years across two sites on six different cultivars per year. And they found that the, the decision support system gave the same level of control as standard approaches, but reduced the overall amount of fungicide needed to achieve that control. That was more practical work. We've also been looking at some uh, more theoretical work. So saying if you use this system, if it worked perfectly, and that's a big um, assumption, but saying this, this, the, the system worked absolutely perfectly, um, what are the benefits to you, uh, the agronomist and the farmer, in terms of the economics uh, and, and the performance of the crop? And here's just a quick uh, example looking at uh, potato late blight and the Hutton criteria model. And it shows that uh, we found that um, it, it was possible to reduce the uh, number of applications while uh, maintaining um, control again. Um, so there was a huge reduction in the amount of uh, pesticide being applied while retaining control. So the, using that uh, model is expected to increase the profitability in most cases um, and can reduce the spray number. Again, this was a theoretical approach and we should always use these support systems within the context on farm. So it, it's always important to also do uh, monitoring in the field uh, and, and look at the individual case as well. We are doing more demonstration work. Um, again, in the IPM Works project, uh, we are doing some demonstrations of the models in practice. Uh, in the UK, we're doing one demonstration looking at the BYDV TSUN model, so looking at how it compares to, um, how using it uh, by the book compares to not using a system at all and being very, very risk averse and applying insecticides as much as possible, which is obviously not a, a recommended approach, but it gives us that context. Um, and it's also, we're also comparing it against a much more holistic approach. So only uh, spraying um, insecticides if there is a farm level concern, not a field level concern. And hopefully we'll have some results of that uh, early next year. The use of decision support systems is, has great potential to improve our efficiency of pesticide applications. So we see a lot of evidence showing that um, using these systems can improve uh, decision making about how frequently, how much pesticide needs to be applied to achieve adequate control. So um, the major differences, uh, so the results and are always site and situation dependent, uh, but we rarely see a reduction in pest management using decision support systems. So usually we see that there's either an improvement to pest management or it's equivalent to uh, using uh, a more standard approach. But we also see that reducing pesticide applications without using decision support systems is very high risk. And if you get it wrong, if you don't use the systems and you try and reduce pesticide applications without those systems, 
there is a much greater risk of, of, uh, of a damaging crop um, infestation. We are really keen to be increasing access to an uptake of IPM decision support systems. And again, as, as we saw in the poll, um, most agronomists in the UK are already using systems to some extent. Um, but there are more systems available out there that maybe are not accessible, that are not user-friendly, that don't reflect the kind of um, decisions that you need to be making or that the benefits are not clear about. Um, we also know that they're all isolated and that there's a lack of trust in some of the outputs sometimes and there's a lack of support in how to use them. So across the IPM Decisions Project and IPM Works and other initiatives that we're running in the UK, we're trying to bring all these things together um, in the IPM Decisions platform uh, as well as the networks associated with it uh, and the IPM Works project to try and build this user-led approach to present supporting data, to provide the, the details on the benefits of using the systems, to bring them all together and provide that support and that network to improve uptake and make sure that they're working for you. I know I've said it a few times, but it's always important to understand that the solutions are sector specific, the solutions are site specific. So that if we think about what is optimal crop management, there is no blueprint to achieve optimal crop management. Uh, it changes between fields, it changes over time, it changes with different climate con climatic conditions. We see pests migrating, as uh, Steve mentioned before, uh, that only come in once every 10 years. So there's never going to be a this is what you do approach. It's always going to be uh, a combination of using decision support systems, monitoring and, and uh, discussion with farmers. The risks associated with the need for treatments are context dependent and it really comes down to the, the, the decision support systems are modelling data but the best interpreter of that data is you on the farms with the farmer. There's no better people placed to make decisions than those people on the farm. In terms of where we're heading next, um, we are looking to increase the demonstration of systems and to get people onto farms to show them uh, the benefits in practice. We know that demonstrations are the main route to increasing uptake of decision support systems and other IPM tactics. Um, so we just need more of them. We need to, to engage with everyone um, and as we're creating new uh, systems and increasing access. On that note, we are looking to develop new systems. We're looking to adapt systems from elsewhere in Europe. Um, and uh, increase the availability of support uh, across all sectors in the UK. And we also know that, there, that we need to support you in getting the best out of those decision support systems. As a final note, um, we are working on a, a project, um, uh, ADAS and SIUC are, are developing an online tool to guide IPM planning for all major UK crops. This is part of the proposed sustainable farming incentive for IPM. Uh, and it would be really great if we can have some of you uh, try out the tool and provide some feedback. Um, so if uh, please could you get involved, there's a link on the slide there that hopefully we can keep up for more than 10 seconds. Um, uh, please do get in touch. If you missed the link, please do contact me and I'll point you in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, we're now going to move over to the panel session. Just a reminder that all questions can be asked at pollev.com forward slash AHDB. You can also like questions that have already been asked, which give them a higher ranking, which mean they're more likely to be seen by our panel. So I'll hand over to Anna, Anna to chair the panel. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you very much, everybody, for your presentations. Um, let's kick off with some questions. So I think the first one on our list is on farms that do use insecticides, how do we harness beneficials as a pest management approach? Is, is it actually a viable option? Who'd like to take that one? Yeah, I can, I can start. I can start. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, so beneficials definitely have a, a positive impact on pest management. We, we, we've got quantitative data that shows that. Um, so they are a really important part of an IPM approach. We also know that beneficials need a wider range of resources um, within the, the agricultural landscape than the pests. So a lot of pests, they need the crop, and that'll pretty much keep them going. The beneficials need a, a, a few different things. They need some floral resources. They need different overwintering habitats. 
Um, so providing some of those around the farm uh, is, is a really uh, important part of, of achieving uh, pest management uh, and making sure that the landscape is robust enough so that when different pests come in, there are these natural enemies already there to respond. Yeah, and just to add to that, as I mentioned in my talk, um, we have been recently looking for evidence of resistance, in this case, to pyrethroid insecticides in beneficials, and we are finding it. So that could help, that could assist the situation. But knowing um, what resistance is out there in the pest is very important as well, of course, because if you're applying it unnecessarily because resistance is there, you're un un unnecessarily killing your, your friends, your beneficials. So the monitoring side of things and, and knowing what won't work is very, very important as in, in, in addition to knowing what will work. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we have on our list, I'm going to move it around a little bit, but let's, let's go to the wheat bulb fly. Do we know why they prefer organic soils? I'll give you a simple answer, no. <laughs> But we can speculate, I guess, and I, I thought somebody would ask me this question, and I still haven't come up with a really good answer. But one of the things that, that might be important, if you imagine a, an organic soil and a mineral soil, it's much easier for a fly to gain access to uh, a mineral, uh, an organic soil to lay its eggs and there's a possibility that that is involved in some way. Um, other than that, we don't know, but there is clearly a difference in the number of eggs that are laid in organic soils compared to mineral soils, and we need to take that into account when we develop our models for the future. So, simple answer, no, but we're continuing to, to look at it. Okay, thank you. Um, one for you, Mark. The IPM decision system, which did, um, oh, it's disappeared. <laughs> Could you just repeat which no, decision right. support tools are available on the system currently for UK growers? Um, there's, there's about a dozen, so I can't remember all the exact details off the top of my head. Uh, and so I would encourage you to register an account and have a look. Um, but I know that there are systems for BYDV, for, in terms of the pests, um, Orange Wheat Blossom Midge, Saddle Ghoul Midge. Um, and Septoria, um, Potato Late Blight is on there. Um, there. There's a few others as well, and there are some more being added um, in, in the next couple, few months. So please do register accounts and please do keep looking and, and seeing what's being added as it, as it gets updated. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, perhaps a question for Steve Ellis um, on our list. So earlier sowing reduces the risk of Septoria and higher seed rates to combat crop loss increase the risk of septoria too. How do you balance those things? Well, I guess this, this, goes, this relates to the way that we propose to manage wheat bulb fly in the future, and that is to manipulate seed rate and sowing date in order to create a robust crop which is able to tolerate the level of predicted damage. And... As the question suggests, it's certainly a balancing act because we know that obviously if you sow earlier, you increase the risk of BYDV. Um, but the, there's two sides of that, to that equation. So you've got seed rate and you've got sowing date. So perhaps in some instances we would, we would err on the side of increasing seed rate rather than changing sowing date and looking to balance the two. In terms of uh, fungal diseases, it's not something I, I know a great deal about, but it's obviously something we're going to have to take into account in future. So um, it's, it's another one where I, I don't have a, an absolute answer, but I mean, it's, it's in our mind all the time. And we, when we start to develop these systems, then we have to look across the, the entire rotation to mm, see how it's going to impact on, on other pests and diseases. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. A question that's come up to the top. Um, it's concerning, and I apologise for my pronunciation, by, but um, Satobia novena populations, and is it concerning that no genotyping has been carried out in the UK since 2016? I think some resistant clone available, capable of producing sexual forms has been um, found in Ireland. Yeah, that's right, and that is worrying. Um, I didn't mention it in my talk, but uh, the resistant, uh, what we consider it's a super clone, so all, all individuals have exactly the same uh, genotype. 
Um, that, that genotype, SA3, I think it's called, um, carries uh, KDI resistance in the heterozygous form. So there's one copy of the resistant mm -hmm. allele and one copy of the susceptible allele. And we, we're finding that heterozygotes have sort of moderate resistance. The concern would be if we had a homozygote resistance where you have two alleles that are resistant, it could then get, get much higher and go into the hundreds resistance factor. And they're right in saying, asking that question. It, it would be nice to know what the genotype is out, out there. Is it still this super, um, super uh, clone or is it another one? But for me, the key is the monitoring, uh, challenging these uh, insects, these aphids, with um, uh, uh, the, the actual insecticide itself. And we're not finding any evidence of any highly resistant clone which could develop. Now with respect to the sexual side of things, yes that would be worrying because potentially if a male and a female that are heterozygous mate then you could have a quarter of the offspring in, in, in Mendelian genetics homozygote resistance. In misers, homozygotes are far more resistant than heterozygotes. Until we find the homozygote, until it comes in, I don't know the answer. My main concern actually with cytobium would be something like a super KDR mechanism. So we've got KDR, but if super KDR developed, which is a mutation in another part of the Sony channel, that confers resistance factors of, of thousands, and then it would, my pyrethros would totally not work at all. So. But it would be nice to know what the microsat genotype of the population is more recently, and that, unfortunately it hasn't been done. Thank you. Um, so the question here that's just come up, three thumbs up for this one. Does the panel know of any specific research into viable cropping systems in the absence of insecticides, which looks more likely to be the future for conventional farming systems? Well, I can, I can, I can offer a suggestion, and it's some work that, uh, I mean, they always say you shouldn't blow your own trumpet, but it's some work that we've been doing with the physiologists in ADAS and it's specifically geared to taking account of crop tolerance. So becoming aware of how much damage a crop can tolerate before it actually stops to actually starts to lose yield. And basically what we're saying is just because you see damage doesn't mean you're going to lose yield. And we've, we've done it with wheat bulb fly, we've done it with pollen beetle, and basically what we're looking to do is manipulate against seed rate, sowing day, all these different, all different aspects of agronomy to enable us to produce much more robust crops which take into account the predicted risk of damage in any particular season. So for wheat bulb fly, you might, if you know you've got a high risk, you might look to sow a higher seed rate, you might, sow, you might to sow, see, look to sow earlier, so you, project, you produce a much more robust, robust crop when those wheat bulb fly eggs actually hatch. And equally in pollen beetle, we know the crop can tolerate a loss of so many buds. The physiologists have got a target number that you need in order to produce potential yield. So what we're looking to do is link that, that target number with the actual damage that the pest can do and then in turn you know, only respond when we know that potentially the level of pest damage is likely to reduce yield. That's brilliant. Um, Mark? Yeah, just, just to kind of add on to that, the, the, the other side is that we know that we need a much more diverse cropping system and landscape approach um, in order to, to kind of be able to tolerate more damage or avoid uh, pest infestations becoming a problem. And there's been some good work um, across Europe showing that, but also showing that that, um, that drive for a wider diversity of crops means you've got to learn new crops, you've got to have different supply routes and, and all those things. And so the complexity of actually stepping up to uh, a, a production approach without or with very low pesticide use actually yeah. takes quite a big change in, in the whole infrastructure. Um, so it is a huge challenge to, to overcome. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. The next question is concerning seed treatments. As we're using less insecticide seed treatments, are we seeing new pests or increased damage from previously minor pests? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I, less seed treatment. I, there, I think there are some instances, I mean, certainly in the case of something like gout fly, you might potentially argue that 
seed treatments for BYDV control were giving potentially some incidental control of gout fly. Um, whether that is having a knock-on effect uh, for that pest, we're, we're not quite sure yet, and it's something we need to continue to monitor. But I'm not sure we're necessarily seeing uh, damage from pests which we haven't seen in the past. I mean, well, I disagree with you there. Okay. Uh, just look at the situation with cabbage stem flea beetles. Before the neonics were taken out by legislation, they were very well controlled. As soon as we lost that seed treatment, they, they came to the fore. So, the, yes, pests can, uh, can benefit from, from, from the, the loss of the seed treatments. Also, I think on, on cereal crops, um, Alan Dewar was t telling me last year that he was seeing more leaf hoppers, um, and that hadn't been seen before. So, I think, yes, I think the, the door is open. There's a window of opportunity with the loss of, of seed treatments. I, th I think the other aspect as well, of course, is that we're, we're not going to get more insecticides. The future is going to be low level of insecticide usage. I'll be out of a job. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, potentially, but that, that, thing, that does make things more interesting as far as, as crop protection scientists are concerned because it means you have to come up with alternative methods of control. Now, that's not necessarily what people want to hear at the moment, but... You're always looking for the silver lining, and if we're losing less, using less insecticides, there's less impact on beneficial insects generally, and so there, there could be a development in natural control of pests, which, which potentially we don't have to pay for in the future. So that's something I think we also need to take into account. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Okay, I think we're all nearly up to time, so maybe one final question. Question for Mark, and that one has come from YouTube. Is it possible to combine the light leaf spot forecast and FOMA leaf spot forecast into one dashboard to give one output for these two important oilseed rape autumn-derived diseases? Um, the, the, the short answer is yes, that's what the IPM Decisions platform does. Um, okay. When we integrate these different systems, they both appear next to each other so that you can see the risk of the two systems. Um, reported next to each other. As we go forward, we can also um, develop more complicated models based on those two together that, that could mean something a bit more elaborate. But in the short term, it's, it's, uh, it's what the platform is designed to do. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Excellent. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you for fantastic presentations and asking, answering our questions. Um, we now take a few minutes for a comfort break and we will be back at 10.35. Thank you.
Welcome back to session two. In, this is our second IPM session today. Um, this session will be covering diseases. So we'll look first at stem rust monitoring and then we'll go into variety choice and the recommended lists, uh, finishing with our annual independent fungicide performance information. To start the session, Diane Saunders from John Innes Centre will be presenting the stem rust update from her international rust monitoring work and what that means for the UK. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And today I wanted to focus on a disease of significant concern for re-establishment here in the UK known as wheat stem rust, as we've just heard. And so wheat stem rust used to be a very common disease here in the UK. We'd see frequent epidemics. However, the last epidemic that occurred here was now back in 1955. And then at that point, the disease seemed to largely disappear. However, that situation then changed in 2013 when we saw the first record of wheat stem rust found here in the UK in over 60 years. However, this was just one infected plant that was found in 2013 here in the UK and so not a significant problem for agriculture. But it was quite significant because of the fact it was the first time it had been seen in over 60 years here in the UK. And also in 2013 and in subsequent years, many of our colleagues across Western Europe also reported wheat stem rust in their wheat fields. And for many countries neighboring us in Western Europe, this again was the first time that they'd seen this disease in many, many decades. And in some of these cases, the, the disease was quite severe, such as in the case of Sicily, damaging tens of thousands of hectares of crops. However, here in the UK since 2013, we've also seen a gradual increase in the number of plants that are being recorded every year as being infected by wheat stem rust. And however, it really was up until 2021, just one or two locations a year, and also just a handful of plants at each location. But again, that situation changed in 2022, where we saw the most widespread outbreak of wheat stem rust just this summer since 1955. And so here is an image that Claire Lewis, a postdoc in my lab, took at one of the sites which was found to be infected by wheat stem rust. And we also have to remember that here in the UK, because this is quite a rare disease, we don't have any central recording system for recording wheat stem rust incidences. But in my lab, we were notified of incidences across 12 different English counties and Wales just this summer. And so this was much larger than what we'd seen from 2013 onwards. However, at most of these locations, just a few plants were infected and also up to kind of the scale of around a small plot was infected by wheat stem rust. And in all of these cases, from what we know at least, these plants were all untreated that were found to be infected. And so that means that where fungicides were applied, they were very effective in controlling the disease. However, when you see such a rare disease out there in our UK wheat fields, and in particular this year where we saw such a widespread outbreak of wheat stem rust, of course then the question is, well, where did these infections originate? And to address that question, we firstly have a, to have a really good handle on the life cycle of wheat stem rust, which is very, very complicated. This fungus is extremely complicated. It uses five different spore stages and two different hosts in order to complete its full infection cycle. And it's the part on the left here, the asexual part of the life cycle that occurs on wheat, where it creates uh, vast quantities of these asexual uridiniospores that allow it to cycle on wheat, passing the disease from one wheat plant to the next. And these spores can also be caught on wind currents and travel vast distances, not just spreading the disease within a single field, but also enabling the fungus to move even between continents using these uridiniospores. However, at the end of the growing season, when our farmers go out into the field and start to harvest, this fungus then switches and changes into a different form because it doesn't like the cold winter months here in the UK. And so in these kind of climates, the fungus has to change. And what it does is it creates a different type of spore known as a teleospore, which is a hardy overwintering spore. And that allows the fungus to then survive throughout the cold winter months. And it forms these spores on the stubble that's left behind after the harvest or on the field margins in volunteer grasses. And then in the spring, when the temperatures start to increase, the fungus reawakens and then it infects its alternate host, which is many species within the Berberus genus, including um, common barberry, which is shown here on the right. 
And at this point, the fungus then completes its sexual cycle. It creates new genetic variants of itself in the form of these aceospores, which are released from these tube-like structures that form on the underside of a barberry leaf. And again, these are released in large quantities, but the purpose of these particular spores is not to reinfect the barberry bush, this barberry hedgerow. Instead, the purpose of these spores is to spread that disease back into the cereal crop. And so these spores can act as a local source of inoculum to spread the disease early in the spring back into a cereal field. And so if we then return to our question, thinking about the potential sources of inoculum that could have created the outbreak that we saw this summer, there are, of course, two different sources of inoculum. We have the aceospores that are created on these barberry bushes, which are often present in hedgerows around um, cereal fields. Or we have uridiniospores, the asexual form. And these can be, of course, created much earlier in the season in warmer climates, such as in southern Europe. And then they could move on the wind and move the disease then into the UK. And if we then consider some of the climatic conditions that occurred this year, this year has been a little bit unusual because we've seen a lot more of what we would call these Saharan dust clouds. And this just started around mid-March with the cloud that's illustrated here. And these Sahara dust clouds can help to move spores into the UK. And there was one particular dust cloud that's very notable, which occurred in mid to late June. And this dust cloud, of course, picks up dust in North Africa. Then it moves, the wind moves it through Europe, so moving up through Spain, through France, and eventually reaching the UK. And of course, along that route, it could pick up these uridiniospores and help to then move them into the UK. And indeed, these Sahara dust clouds follow a very well-known route of entry of spores into the UK known as this West European track. And so this particular dust cloud that occurred in mid to late June occurred two to three weeks just before we got a lot of the reports of wheat stem rust occurring in the UK. And so it seems likely that this dust cloud could have potentially helped to move uridiniospores into the UK, thereby leading to the infections, at quite a wide, widespread infections that we saw this summer. If we then consider the different races of wheat stem rust that we find here in the UK, firstly, when we look back from 2013 up until 2021, all of the races of wheat stem rust that we found in the UK is just one single race. Everything that we've taken from the field and typed all belong to a single race. And so there was very little diversity here in the UK. We just had one race of wheat stem rust. However, if we then start to look at the picture from 2022, now we're starting to see an expansion in the number of races that we're seeing in the UK. Um, for instance, this is illustrating the pathology data from a new race, the TTTTF race um, of wheat stem rust, which we found this summer in the UK and has never been reported before in Europe. And so this again would then fit with the fact that we think that maybe we had a very diverse population being picked up through Europe and then moved into the UK this summer. And indeed, this is supported by the high level of genetic diversity that we also found among the samples that we've analyzed from this summer. And so you can see now that we're seeing this kind of increase in incidences of wheat stem rust within the UK. Of course, the question then is, well, why is this happening? So why are we seeing an increase of incidences of wheat stem rust here in Western Europe? And to address this question, we have to really start to turn our minds back to the factors that have prevented wheat stem rust epidemics since 1955 here in the UK, so for more than half a century. The first of these was, of course, removal of the alternate host, these barberry hedgerow shrubs, because this then prevents that local source of inoculum and also limits the amount that the fungus can undergo sexual reproduction. We also have breeding, where breeding for resistance is very important in kind of helping us to protect our wheat crops against such diseases. And also we were selecting for earlier maturing varieties because this is a warm temperature disease and so that can help to provide some pr protection. And I'll return to this point in a moment. And also now we have modern fungicides which are very, very effective in controlling wheat stem rust. As we already saw just this summer um, where we had fungicide application, we didn't see stem rust incidences occurring on those plants. And so now as we look to the future and we're seeing more incidences of wheat stem rust, the question then is, well, how many of these factors remain effective today? 
So if we firstly consider um, Barbary, the alternate host of wheat stem rust, we know that throughout history there has been a lot of legislation and removal campaigns in place across many countries in Europe, America and also Canada to try to limit the amount of barberry around wheat growing areas to thereby prevent it acting as a local source of inoculum. If we consider just one of those campaigns and the best documented has to be the one that occurred in North America, these are just some of the leaflets and posters that accompanied that campaign. And if we think about that campaign, it began in 1918, it went on into the 1970s. And if we just consider the first 15 years of that campaign, in that 15 year period, 18 million barberry bushes were removed from the landscape in North America around wheat fields. And this was extremely effective in dampening down the scale of epidemics that occurred in North America as you didn't have then that local source of inoculum. And it also reduced the number of races that were being picked up every year because it was reducing the amount it could undergo sexual reproduction. But here in the UK, our farmers were even more proactive. They actually started ripping Barbary out over 300 years ago. And this was because when the farmers went to their fields, they saw that if they had one of these Barbary hedgerows next to their cereal crop, the crop tended to get more infected. So as Stackman said in this article, they just showed their good sense and they destroyed these bushes. But of course now with wheat stem rust being a distant memory here for many of us in the UK, this means that the number of these bushes is slowly starting to increase. Because our farmers were so proactive, it meant in the UK we had no legislation introduced to restrict plantings. And so of course with wheat stem rust, a distant memory, the number of these plants is slowly starting to increase here in the UK. <clears throat> also within my lab, we've been able to show that <clears throat> Within the UK, we can identify the full infection cycle of wheat stem rust. And so here is an example where we found a barberry hedgerow that was infected by wheat stem rust. And then in the summer months, we identified a small number of barley plants. We have to remember that wheat stem rust can also infect barley. And these barley plants were right next to this hedgerow and they also got infected by wheat stem rust. And it was clear at this particular location in Suffolk that there was a cycling of the fungus from the barberry bushes into the cereal crop. And so it can actually complete its whole infection cycle here in the UK. And so now with the number of these bushes starting to increase here in the UK, the question then is, well, how do we manage the risk of all of these bushes? And so here I wanted to introduce some work that was done by a very talented PhD student in my lab, Vanessa, where she decided to address this question by trying to work out whether in modern times we could actually guide some policy around where barberry bushes should be located and to identify bushes that might be high risk for monitoring. And to do this, what she set out to do was to identify how many spores are being released from a barberry bush, so how much inoculum would come from a barberry bush and how far it might travel. And so Vanessa did a huge amount of work to try to address this question. I'm just going to touch on a couple of points here. So to work out how many spores could be released from a barberry bush, so the kind of amount of inoculum being released from a barberry bush, she took many images working with our exceptional bioimaging team at the John Innes Center, where she took these small cluster cups, um, the acium, which form on the underside of the barberry leaves, and then she measured these cluster cups, which form the infection site, to work out how many spores are present within um, a single infection site. And so she could measure the size of these cluster cups, the number of rows of spores, the number of cups that were present in a single infection site, and work out how many spores were present. She also looked at a number of leaves, looking at the amount of infection present on those leaves and classified them into different levels of infection, and then took this to the bush scale, analyzing barberry bushes out there in the field and also looking through the literature to see how many leaves on average would be infected by this fungus. And so from this analysis, she could then work out the average amount of spores that would potentially be produced from a barberry bush at different scales of infection. She then put that information into a very simplistic Gaussian plume model, which allowed her to create a point and click web interface, which you can now go and use. You can put in the location of your Barbary bush, and then it will pull down current weather data and work out how sp far spores will travel within your particular location. And so this information around the density of spore dispersal projections can then be used to hopefully guide policy 
around safe planting distances for barberry hedgerows around cereal crops and also to identify current hedgerows that might need some careful monitoring. If we then move on to the second factor which has helped to prevent wheat stem rust epidemics over the past half a century, which is looking at breeding and the selection for varieties with increased resistance. And so here we wanted to go back and have a look at the wheat varieties that we're growing in the UK and see how susceptible they might be in modern times to wheat stem rust. And so to do this, we initially worked with Jane Thomas at NIAB, who took over 40 of the UK varieties that are on the recommended list, and she used them in seedling tests and found that actually over 80% of these were very susceptible to stem rust infection. We also took this a bit further because this is a warm temperature disease and so it's much more likely that these plants will be infected at the adult plant stage. And so we took around 60 different UK varieties. We planted them out then in South Africa where they would be naturally infected at the adult plant stage, working closely with Willem Bossoff at the University of the Free State there. And what he showed over three years of field trials was that all of the varieties he analysed from the UK were highly susceptible to wheat stem rust. And so we don't actually have much resilience within our current wheat varieties that we're growing. But it wasn't just inbuilt resilience that our predecessors relied upon to prevent wheat stem rust epidemics here in the UK. They also relied on selection for earlier maturing wheat varieties. And so to explain this a bit further, here is an image that illustrates the development of a winter wheat variety that has early maturity. And you can see that just like with the winter wheat varieties we grow today, it's planted in around September, October. It then slowly starts to develop throughout the season and it remains green until around the end of June and then it starts to senesce and mature. And so, of course, this fungus wants to gain loads of nutrients from these plants, and so it can only do that when the plants are green in the field. However, wheat stem rust, as I've mentioned, is a warm temperature disease. It only really likes to infect these plants during the summer months. And so by having earlier maturity, this means that these plants are only green, so susceptible to wheat stem rust for a short period at the end of the spring in the case of these early maturing varieties. However, if we now consider a more modern wheat variety which matures that little bit later, you can see that it remains green out there in the field a little bit longer, and so that's now starting to push these varieties into the stem rust danger zone. And if we look at some work that was nicely executed by Alison Bentley when she was working at NIAB, she also looked at the maturity and the flowering time of varieties on the recommended list over the past decade, and she's found that the flowering time is kind of the window has narrowed over this decade and we're now actually starting to select for later maturing varieties within the recommended list. And so we need to keep in mind then how this could then, breeding for later maturity, could then start to influence the incidences of wheat stem rust that we might see in the future here in the UK. But there's also another factor known as climate instability that is also threatening the protection that was afforded to these early maturing varieties. And so to explain how climate instability could um, kind of erode this protection, here is an image of a farmer's field that's very reminiscent of farmer's fields that we saw at the end of 2019, where we experienced one of the wettest autumns on record. And of course, during these very wet autumns, it means that the farmers can't get out into their fields to plant their winter wheat crop. And so they're really faced with a kind of dilemma. And one answer to this dilemma is to not plant winter wheat at all because they can't get into the fields. Instead, they can switch what they're planting and they could potentially plant spring, a spring variety instead. And indeed, that's what people did in the 2019 to 2020 season. If we look at data that's readily available from Ireland, you can see here that they reduced the amount of winter wheat planting by around 40% and increased the amount of spring wheat planting by around 200%. However, this comes with a potential issue, which is that these spring varieties, of course, mature a bit later. They're planted much later, so they're planted after the last frost and then they, take, they stay out there in the field green for longer, pushing them then into the stem rust danger zone where they could then become infected. And so as we start to see this kind of climate instability and these very wet autumns becoming more frequent, we have to keep in mind that moving to more spring planting could also influence the, um, or increase the number of outbreaks of wheat stem rust that we might see here in the UK. 
So now looking to the future and thinking about all of the factors that have prevented wheat stem rust epidemics over the past half a decade, we now know that the amount of barberry here in the UK is slowly starting to increase. But luckily we now have this ACO spore dispersal projection model which can help us to identify bushes that might be at high risk of harboring inoculum and also help us to potentially develop really good policy around safe planting distances for barberry bushes going forward. We know that we have very limited resistance within our wheat varieties and we need to be mindful of this, but where we have identified some indication of potential resistance, our breeders now are aware of this. And we have to be very mindful about how changes in our wheat planting strategies and varietal selection could impact um, warm temperature diseases such as wheat stem rust. But luckily, we still have modern fungicides that are currently very effective as a control measure against wheat stem rust. And so that's a really important point. So as we look to the future, of course, keeping wheat stem rust in check is going to take the efforts of an entire community. And at the heart of this has to be all of the lessons that we've learned throughout history that have kept wheat stem rust in check for the past half a century. And so there, I'd just like to leave it by acknowledging, of course, my lab and all of our collaborators and our funders. And thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to taking questions later on. Thank you very much, Diane. So if you do suspect um, stem rust symptoms on your crops, you can actually send tissue samples to Diane at John Innes Centre. All the details and the address are on the HDB website under the stem rust section. So stem rust was actually seen on some untreated winter wheat recommended list trial plots in Lincolnshire in 2022, which does bring us nicely to our next speaker, Paul Gosling, who's going to cover what's next for varieties of the recommended list. Before we do that, we have got time for another poll. So this can be accessed on PolyV, which again, a reminder, is found at polyv.com forward slash AHDB. So the question you are being asked now are yield and quality more important than agronomics and disease resistance? So that poll is open and you can, um, you can select your answer now. We did actually ask this poll at the Agronomist Conference in 2017. And 25% uh, of people said that yield and quality were more important. So we should be able to see the results coming up on the screen now. Interestingly, that figure has changed to 88%. Um, oh, 78 still. Votes are coming in still. Um, you'll have to be quicker next time. So our next poll, um, we also asked in 2017, and that's whether you preferred the recommended list to be in print rather than digital formats. So you can say yes, no, or that you value them equally. In 2017, 75% of attendees said that they preferred print formats. So it'll be interesting to see if that has changed now. And see all the, re the results coming in, lots of votes coming through. Um, so we can have a look at the results quickly there as well. They should be coming up on your screen. There we go. Yep. So 45% um, do prefer print, which has changed slightly from, um, from a few years ago. So that brings us nicely to Paul Gosling, who's going to talk about the recommended lists and uh, what's next for that, perhaps more of a digital format after the response of that poll, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, and good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Paul Gosling, and I manage the recommended list program at the AHDB. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a, an update on the recommended list. I'm not going to talk about the new varieties, because I'm sure you've seen all the new varieties uh, after last week's release. I'm going to talk about some of the um, findings which don't actually make it into the recommended list. So what I'm going to cover today is three areas. I'm going to talk about the Yellow Rust Variety Watch List. I'm going to talk about Lemon Wheat Blossom Ridge. I'm going to talk about club root. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the yellow rust variety watch list. I think we all know now that yellow rust population has become very diverse and very dynamic over the last decade or so. And that makes genetic resistance quite vulnerable to breakdown. And the resistance rating is quite unstable. And we've seen in, re in recent years the difficulty with the RL keeping up with the, the, the disease in the field. The ratings haven't always matched. Uh, what people are seeing in the field. We have changed the way we calculate the ratings and that is much better now. 
but still the ratings are telling you what happened last year. They're not in any way predictive, and actually what we want to know is what might happen in the coming season. And so launched in winter 2021, the yellow wheat uh, yellow rust variety watch list was aimed at um, predicting what might happen in the coming season. It's based on RL data, but it doesn't appear in the RL. And it's really highlighting those varieties that might be vulnerable um, to a fall in, the, in their rating in the coming year. It has a scale um, from most resistant, that is uh, varieties that look to be resistant at uh, all our trial sites, to those which are um, highly susceptible to at least one race at one site. And what that means, in fact, is that some, at some sites we saw a much higher level of, of yellow rust in those varieties um, than you'd expect from their rating. Now, I did show some results um, from the first year of this watch list last year. Um, it did seem to show that it was doing what it was supposed to do, um, highlighting those varieties at risk, but I said it was only one year's data, so we had to see a bit more data. So now we have two years' data, and what does it look like? We can see the two uh, sets of results from 2021 and 2022, and what these two charts are showing is uh, the change um, in the resistance from one season to the other. So if we look at the chart on the left to start with, on the left of that, on the horizontal axis, we have the varieties that are most resistant. So those are the ones that appear to um, stick with their rating, the disease you'd expect to see um, at all the sites. The ones at the other side, the least resistant, that was where we saw at least some sites much higher levels of disease than you'd expect from their rating. And on the vertical axis, what we see is a change in rating from one season to another. So if we look just at the chart on the, on the left-hand side, to start with last year's data, what we see at that, that most resistant end, the varieties were, weren't changing very much. You do see a little bit of movement up, up and down by small amounts each year, just to, depending on the amount of disease in trials, but not much change. We go to the right-hand side where we see the least resistant varieties, the ones we predicted might see a fall in rating. We do see some big falls in rating, um, up to one whole rating point in those um, varieties and a trend for as you move from left to right uh, for more uh, or larger falls. So that looked like uh, it was working. If we look at the chart on the 2022, so that's this year's data, a slightly different pattern, those varieties which looked like they were most resistant, um, they went up slightly in ratings and I'd say we can get these uh, shifts in ratings from year to year, but again at the least resistant end, the variety we predicted might be vulnerable to a fall in rating, we did see varieties falling off in rating, not quite as much as last year, but definitely the pattern was there. So with two years of data now on this, on this new uh, method of looking at yellow rust, most of the varieties classified as most resistant had stable ratings. They didn't uh, see those big falls. The largest falls in ratings were seen with those classified as least resistant. So it is picking out those varieties that might be susceptible. But it's important to emphasize that not all the varieties classified as least resistant do see the falls. So we yellow rust variety watch list, yes or no, is it worth paying attention to? Well, the evidence from two years now uh, suggests the list is highlighting varieties that are at risk of their fall in ratings, so in the coming season. What do you do about that? Well, the advice is to monitor those varieties, um, identify as least resistant, um, perhaps do more field walking, and if you see more yellow rust than you expect from their rating, be prepared to up the use of rust active fungicides on those varieties. We will update the um, yellow rust watch list in January, so that will be for the coming season. And because it looks like the yellow rust variety watch list is working, we are going to try a brown rust uh, variety watch list. That will again be produced in January. Now, we don't always get very much brown rust depending on the season. It may be that not every year we can produce a brown rust watch list, but we will attempt to do that. And of course, we'll review it and monitor it to make sure it is um, providing the information which the yellow rust watch list does seem to be doing. So moving on now uh, to wheat blossom midge, is it a problem? Well, there is some evidence that it is an emerging problem. Um, we certainly had anecdotal reports, uh, both from agronomists and also from the breeders who have their trials around the country, that lemon blossom midge is starting to become more common. It appears earlier in the crop than orange wheat blossom midge, so if you're walking crops for orange wheat blossom midge, you might not actually see the lemon blossom midge because you, by the time you're walking for, uh, for orange wheat blossom midge, it's actually been and gone. And it feeds slightly differently to orange wheat blossom midge, so it attacks the actual flowers themselves, um, preventing pollination and thus reducing yield. 
However, if you look in the literature, the literature there's almost no information um, about how damaging uh, lemon blossom midge is to, um, to yield. And we have seen lemon blossom midge in our old trials. In 2022, there was a second week trial in North Yorkshire that was badly affected. And the pictures on the right hand side of this slide show that trial and show um, quite severe damage that can occur um, with missing grain sites. But rather than abandon this trial, we decided we could, might be able to get some useful information from it. One of the breeders um, kindly scored the trial for us on a, on a damage scale one to nine, and we took the trial to yield uh, to see what would happen uh, in terms of yield loss. And this is the results we got from that um, trial. So on the horizontal axis, we've got damage uh, from one, no damage on the left-hand side, to nine, the maximum level of damage. And what's on the, on the vertical axis is the difference in yield um, between the varieties in this trial and in the overall trial set for 2022. Fortunately, in this trial, none of the control varieties were affected by lemon blossom leaves. They scored either a one or two. So we could use those controls as normal. This is the difference uh, between how they perform in this trial compared to other trials. Anything below the line, is it performed worse in this trial? Anything above the line, it's performed better. And as you can see, as you would expect, um, as we move from left to right, from no damage to the maximum level of damage, we get an increasing uh, um, reduction in the amount of yield. So up to 20% yield loss um, compared to the whole trial set in this, in this um, particular trial. And that equated to a yield loss of up to 2.14 tonnes per hectare, a, a, a damage level of nine. So is lemon wheat blossom midge a problem? Well, it is a single trial, obviously, uh, so we do have to caveat some of what I'm going to say. Um, but it does suggest from this trial that lemon blossom midge can have a very significant impact on yield where it occurs. We don't fully understand um, how lemon blossom midge um, life cycle works, but we think um, from the literature that it probably needs very similar conditions to orange wheat blossom midge. So warm and wet in May, it needs the, 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 the moisture in the soil and temperatures above uh, 13 degrees C in the soil um, to appear. The eggs are laid earlier than orange wheat blossom midge, as I've already said, uh, around growth stage 51 to 55. And there is no varietal resistance that we know of. We know some breeders are looking for varietal resistance, but so far nothing has been found. The differences in this trial between the varieties were not due to differences in varietal resistance, but differences in maturity when the midges appear in the crop. Obviously, if the, if the individual variety is vulnerable at that stage, it will be affected. If it's actually past that stage or it hasn't reached that stage, it won't be affected so much. As far as I'm aware, there are no products, no insecticide products that have uh, lemon blossom midge on the label. I suspect anything that has uh, effect on orange root blossom midge will also affect um, lemon blossom midge. But as I say, nothing has it on the label. One good piece of news about lemon blossom midge is it's less persistent in the soil than orange wheat blossom midge, so probably up to three years, but maybe as little as two years. So rota rotation should be effective at helping to control it. So finally, I want to talk about club root. And club root has been appearing in some trials, and un unexpectedly, we would never put a trial in a location where we knew there was club root unless we were doing a club root trial. And we've seen this in a couple of cases in the last two years. So in 2021, there was an RL trial in Northern England, just south of Berwick-upon-Tweed. And then in 2022, there was a national list trial, an NL1 trial in Fife, which also uh, got club root. Neither of these sites had a, a history of club root. Um, it just appeared uh, out of the blue. In both cases, club root symptoms became evident, evident in the autumn. And then rather than abandon the trials, we decided to take the trials to yield to see if we could get some useful information from the two trials. So I'm going to talk about each trial individually. First of all, starting with the Berwick recommended list trial back in 2021. The site had medium textured soil. Um, winter rape had been growing four years previously, but as I said, there was no um, evidence of, of club root in the past. And the field was limed prior to drilling. It was drilled on the 20th of August, so fairly standard these days. Um, but by October, the, field op the trial operator had seen there was something suspicious about the trial, so they looked at it and found there were club root systems right across the trial. It was a fairly uniform infection right across the trial. But as I say, rather than abandon the trial, we decided to take the trial to yield and the club root symptoms were scored uh, to see if we could get some useful information out of it. And this is what it looked like. Um, 10th of October, the picture on the left-hand side, um, 
something was going on with the trial, so the, the trial operator pulled some plants up and got some quite characteristic symptoms, the galls on the roots, the clubbing of the roots, uh, let's say quite characteristic of early symptoms. By May, uh, the middle of the picture, there was quite severe stunting in some um, plants. Uh, you can see the, the clubs again on the roots there, um, with that particular plant failing to flower. And if we look on the picture on the right-hand side, we can see that the difference between how varieties were affected. So we've got two plots there side by side, the one on the right-hand side, obviously the plant's very severely stunted there, hardly any flowering going on, whereas the plot on the left-hand side um, looks relatively normal. In terms of impact on yield, well, because this was, the, this was a northern trial, it didn't have the full range of varieties in. The only club root resistant variety in that trial was chrome, but chrome sticks out like a sore thumb. It was by far the highest yielding variety in the trial, uh, yielding four and a half tonnes per hectare, uh, compared to the trial mean of 2.84, so over a tonne and a half benefit for that variety. So clearly a very big impact on yield, as you'd expect. Um, chrome yielding around 160% of the trial uh, mean, um, which rather you'd, you'd expect, um, sorry, of, of controls, would you rather expect it to yield about 100% in a normal trial. The other trial that was affected was this summer, um, an NL1 trial, so most of these are, are not varieties yet, they're just breeding lines. Um, we don't know the name, they're just coded. A slightly different side, a, a lighter soil, a light sandy soil, um, no oil seed rape at all in the previous five years, quite a diverse rotation on this site, including potatoes, and drilled slightly later on the 31st of August. Again, club root symptoms were seen in the autumn, in November in this case, um, but it was patchy. It wasn't a uniform infection, and this site was, it was quite a patchy um, uh, set of symptoms. But again, the symptoms were recorded, and the trial was taken to yield. So what did this one look like? Uh, well fairly similar to the previous um, trial site. By the 25th of March, we had stunted plants with club, clubbed roots um, quite visible. And by the 25th of May, we were starting to see lodging in this trial, uh, plants that had been affected um, falling over. Because it was an, an NL1 trial, we didn't have any club root resistant varieties in the trial itself. But what we did have on this site is a disease observation trial. This is small plots which were used to score disease, and that did have uh, one of the club root resistant varieties, Cruiser, in that trial, in that disease observation trial. And you can see the Cruiser plot in the foreground of the, of the picture on the right hand side, a circle, clearly much more vigorous than the other varieties in the background, again, showing the impact of club root on this side. So, what was the impact on yield? Well, because it was a patchy infection, I've had to um, look at the data slightly differently. So, what I've done is taken just the varieties where one plot was affected by club root and the other two weren't. So then I've compared the yield in the infected plot as a percentage of those not infected. And that's what's shown on the chart. So on the vertical axis, we've got the yield of the infected plot as a percentage of the yield of the uninfected plots. And on the horizontal axis, we've got proportion of the plot infected. And as you'd expect, as the proportion of the plot infected increases, uh, the yield in relation to the uninfected plots goes down. And if you extend that line out to 100% of the plot infected, that would be a, a yield loss of around 77%. So again, a very severe impact on yield, which is what we'd expect with club root. So I've said both these sites um, had never had any evidence of club root in the past. It came out of the blue. So is the club root risk increasing? Well, we know infection is most likely to occur in warm, wet soils. Uh, that helps the zoo spores disperse and infect the crop. Um, and we know our autumns are becoming warmer and wetter um, due to climate change. So that is in increasing the risk. Crops are most susceptible uh, from August to mid-September when there are one to two leaves in fold, um, unfolded. So by drilling our crops earlier uh, to avoid cabbage stem flea beetle, we are tending to put them in a slightly more uh, vulnerable position. If we delay drilling, uh, that will minimise the potential of infection. The soils are, are cooler. But we are, as I say, drilling crops earlier to avoid cabbage stem flea beetle. So that is making them more vulnerable to club root. We have to ask the question, are our, is our widespread use of cover crops now making um, club root more of an issue? We know some co um, cover crop mixtures have brassicas in them. I would hope that anyone growing oilseed rape in the rotation isn't using a mixture with brassicas in. But even if you're using a mixture which doesn't have brassicas in, is that cover crop hiding brassicaceous weeds 
which you're able to multiply uh, the club root um, in that period uh, wh when the cover crop is in the ground. So finally, a couple of slides. Um, first of all, recommended list crop committee vacancies. Uh, the recommended list is run by uh, crop committees. We have a wheat crop committee, a barley and oats crop committee, and an oil seeds committee. And each of those committees has representatives, representatives from the whole of the supply chain, from farmers right through to end users, and it includes agronomists. Um, we have vacancies on, on all the um, committees this year for agronomists. So if you're interested in, in the recommended list in variety development, if you'd like to steer the RL in the future, um, there are vacancies. The committees meet either in May or June, um, August or September, and then finally in November, so it's three times a year. Um, unfortunately, there's no pay um, to sit on the committees, but you do receive subsistence, subsistence and travel expenses. If you're interested in applying for one of these posts, I can't guarantee a post because the, the vacancies are um, quite well, quite popular, particularly with agronomists. Um, but contact me either by email or, or give me a ring. Uh, there's also information on the website about telling you more about what the, the committees do and how to apply. Deadline for application is 5th of January 2023, not 2022, as it says on the slide. Um, and we have informal online interviews on, on the 19th of January um, for that, those positions. And finally, finally, um, you've probably heard that the recommended list review is happening. Uh, we do these reviews every five years or so just to make sure that the recommended list is still providing what growers and agronomists want. Um, so this review is, is live at the moment. Please do fill it in. Please do speak to your, um, your um, clients, your farmer clients, to get them to fill it in. The more, obviously, the more responses we get, the better we can ensure that the recommended list will continue uh, to serve uh, growers and agronomists going forwards. Just want to acknowledge uh, the recommended list team. Um, I'm, I'm just the front man. They're the brains of the organisation. We have a field team and a data team. And also uh, the BSPB, MAGB and UK flour millers. They contribute an awful lot of data and in-kind testing, and without that um, help, we couldn't produce the recommended list in the form we do. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Paul. As we've heard, Variety Choice is an important first step in IPM, and as well as cultural controls and regular disease monitoring, um, understanding the actives in fungicides is really important. HDB fund independent fungicide performance research, which has been running in wheat since 1994, uh, bringing in barley in 2002 and oilseed rape in 2006. Next, we have Rebecca Joint from ADAS and Fiona Burnett from SRUC, who are going to share this year's results. So I'll firstly hand over to Rebecca. If you have any questions, just a reminder, you can ask them anytime at uh, polyv.com forward slash AHDB. Thank you very much. Hi, so as Fiona said, I'm Rebecca um, and I'm here today with Fiona to share the fungicide performance update for wheat, barley and oilseed rake. So the fungicide performance project um, builds on the work Paul's just been discussing about varietal resistance as a factor of your fungicide programmes. The fungicide performance project aims to evaluate different fungicides and their relative performance against different diseases to provide independent data to help support your decision making when building a programme. The trials are designed to create high pressure scenarios. So these include highly susceptible varieties, high risk locations, and we use a single spray timing. These maximise the options to pull out differences between treatments against different target diseases. We use the data to fit dose response curves um, and we show these today up to 200% of full label rate um, and they'll be available online afterwards up to 100% of full label rate. The trials also allow us to separate fungicide activity into protectant and eradicant. Um, so generally speaking, um, where we spray a fungicide application on the slide here shown on leaf two, um, we would expect protectant activity on that leaf and any leaves that emerge subsequently. So in this situation, leaf two and the flag leaf. Um, any leaves emerged prior to this spray would generally be classed as curative or eradicant activity. So in the trials in 2022, um, we tested 10 different fungicides 
Um, so six of which were um, products containing a single mode of action, so the straights or the solos, as I might refer to them going forwards. Of these, two of which were azoles, um, pathiconazole and methventrifluconazole, two SDHIs, floxaproxad and benzavindiflupire, a QII in fenbicoximid, and folpet as a multisite. Um, we also tested four mixtures, um, so products containing more than one mode of action, um, Revistar, Univoc, Alatacera, and Ascrex Pro was tested in the barley. Um, important to say at this point um, that the further seven products that aren't commercially available were tested in trials. So these are in the process, um, expected to come to market in the future, and so the data for these will be available upon their registration. So starting with the wheat. So we tested 10 trial sites in 2022, uh, seven of which focused on septoria and a single site each for yellow rust, brown rust and fusarium. As I mentioned previously, we use highly susceptible varieties. So for the septoria trials, varieties such as barrel and elation and a spread of sites across the country. So of the seven septoria sites, uh, we used different spray timings to help generate different types of activity. In 2022, um, we saw protectant fungicide activity at all seven sites. Um, perhaps reflective of the season, um, many regions were very dry through the spring and saw late epidemics for septoria, um, meant that we only saw curative or eradicant data at Carlo and at Telford. So starting with the protectant data, the seven trials in this season. Um, so the blue diamond on this start, on the right-hand chart, well, the right-hand chart in general shows products containing a single mode of action, um, and the left-hand chart shows products containing a mixture. Um, the dose response here goes up to 200%, so the 100% mark is in the middle where the two diamonds are shown. The two diamonds are products um, that were in test just at a single full rate application. So the blue diamond being Proline, and the red diamond being Arizona Folpet. In this trial series in 2022, um, we saw the Proline at a full dose give around a 30% control of Septoria, with the Arizona giving around a 45% control in these seven trials. The two lines at the bottom there, the brown line being Mephentrifluconazole in Myresa, and the grey line being Fenpicoximid in Pectiga, were giving good levels of control of the target disease. We also, on the left-hand chart, uh, applied these products as their commercial mixtures, so Revistar being Mephentrifluconazole and Fluxaproxad, Univoc being Fenpicoximid and Prothioconazole, and these also gave good levels of control. In an eradicant situation in 2022, so just two trials, um, we saw similar levels of control from Proline as we did in the protectant situation overall. Both Pectiga and Myresa performed very similarly at a full dose rate. You can see there the lines overlapping. Um, Myresa appearing to give slightly greater levels of control when applied dose for dose at lower rates compared to Pectiga. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, Revistar and Univoc, um, and consistent with what we saw in the protectant trial series, there's a small degree of separation between the two products, with Univoc giving slightly greater levels of control. And these trends carried through to yield. So across the trials in 2022, um, we were seeing around a 0.2 tonnes per hectare yield response from a single application of either Proline or Arizona, compared to the untreated. There was some separation here between Myresa and Pactiga, but this is only a six trial subset. Um, around about half a tonne between the two full rates. This was smaller where the um, active ingredients were applied as their commercial mixtures, so Revistar and Univoc. We were seeing less separation between the two, although Univoc did appear to yield slightly higher when compared dose for dose to the Revistar. So what did this look like in the field? And um, these are some photos taken in Herefordshire at the Rosemond site in the 27th of June, 2022. Um, so this trial was a T2 trial. Um, so we're predominantly looking here at flag leaf control. And you can see the untreated on the left there. There are lots of septoria lesions on the flag leaves. 
the difference between the middle photo of full rate of proline and the right hand side reflects what we can see in the data with the Arizona treatment from Folpet um, showing clearly greener flag leaves. But I must stress again that this is a very highly protectant situation. To demonstrate here what the dose response might look in the field, I've shared um, some photos of Revistar from the same site. So again, from left to right, moving from 50, uh, 25 to 50 to 100 percent. And you can clearly see as we move towards the right hand side, the flag leaves in the 100 percent full rate um, are clearly greener than the lower dose rates. So you can also share data across the last three seasons. So this is a large number of trials, 17 trials across 2020 to 2022. Um, so these trials have, this graph has a slightly different uh, subset of products in. Um, we include products in these graphs where they've been tested in at least two of the three seasons. This means that we can share data on Proline and Imtrex, but Pectiga drops out of the chart as it was only in trial in 2022. So you can see here uh, on the right hand side chart, the Arizona giving consistent performance across the three years to what we saw in 2022 with around a 50% control of that single application at full dose rate. Applications of Proline, Pathyroconazole and Imtrex, Fluxaproxad are still providing useful levels of control in a protectant situation. However, there's a clear step change to the newer active of methantrifluconazole in Myresa. When you look at the chart on the left-hand side, you can see that the Revistar and Univot lines are sitting closer together than what we saw in 2022, perhaps reflecting uh, the earlier seasons in this data set. Looking then at eradicant data, so this is 10 trials um, across the three years, you can see broadly the same trends. Um, the two things to point out that are slightly different on this chart um, is the difference between Myresa, Mephantrifluconazole and Revistar. So looking from the right hand side chart to the left hand side chart, you can see a benefit of the mixture partner Fluxaproxad in Revistar adding to disease control. Also in these charts, the slope of the gradient changes up to 100%. We can see a shallower dose response showing that there's a benefit to increasing dose rates in curative situations in comparison to in protectant. And these trends again carried through to yield across this 19 trial subset. So you can see on the right hand side um, the dose response there from Arizona, Proline and Imtrex, broadly similar um, with a clear step change up to Myresa. With Myresa giving around about half a tonne yield response over the older azole prothioconazole in this subset of trials. Looking on the right hand side, you can see the benefit of the mixtures. The full dose rate of Univoc giving around a tonne per hectare yield response over the untreated from that single spray application. So as well as what we saw in this season, um, we can also look back through previous seasons to see how field efficacy has changed. And so this chart shows uh, azole activity since 2001. Um, so looking on the y-axis here is percent control of septoria in protectant situations. You can see for the grey diamonds that this has changed from around 80 to 90 percent control in 2001, declining to now around 20 to 30 percent control in the last two years. There is a degree of seasonal variation here. Um, as we can see, perhaps in the uh, red diamonds that are showing methantrifluconazole. The difference between uh, the 21 to 2022 season for methantrifluconazole is not dissimilar to what we've seen in previous seasons for prothyroconazole, perhaps if you look at 2009, 2010 to 2011. So it'll be interesting to see how this chart plots out going forwards. And that said, um, methantrifluconazole is still giving levels of activity comparable to what we were achieving from Proline applications around 10 years ago. So we've looked at field activity. Um, we also look at lab sensitivity monitoring in this project. Um, so these projects are quite hard to, uh, this graph is quite hard to um, explain without a pointer. So I'm sorry if it loses anybody. 
Um, so the axis along the bottom is showing um, sensitivity. So the concentration of product required to achieve a certain level of control. Um, more sensitive is towards the left-hand side of the chart and sensitivity decreases as you're moving to the right-hand side. The different lines on the chart, different colours represent different years and each isolate is represented by a point on that line. So you can see the furthest left-hand chart Furthest left-hand line on the left-hand chart um, is from 2003, looking at prothioconazole sensitivity. And gradually, as you move to 2022, these lines shift to the right, showing a decreasing sensitivity to prothioconazole of these septoria isolates, um, which are from the same population at Rothamsted. The 2022 line is shown in yellow, it's orange uh, circles, and you can see that this is broadly in line with what we've seen in previous seasons, um, with perhaps just a slight change in the middle, with more isolates showing uh, moderately reduced sensitivity. Looking at the chart on the right-hand side, which is methantrifluconazole, um, you can see the 2022 line compared to the three previous seasons sitting in line with what we've seen previously, suggesting that there's been no shift in sensitivity. So going back to the field, um, this is field performance, field control um, from the products containing mixtures of different modes of action up to a full dose rate since 2017. Um, so you can see that there is a degree of seasonal variability um, as you look 2017 to 2018 and back to 2020, um, the overall level of control changes. However, in 2021 and 2022, uh, for both Revistar in the green line and Univoc in the red line, you can see that the overall level of control is lower. Um, this may be a seasonal factor. Um, it may also be, as we've just shown previously, the activity of the mixture partners, such as prothioconazole in Univoc, is declining over seasons. The other thing to point out in these trials is the relative rank order of products. So from 2017 to 2019, you can see the green line of Revistar was giving slightly higher control than the red line of Univoc. But in recent seasons, this has switched and we can see that Univoc is giving slightly higher levels of control than Revistar. So to round up on Septoria, um, just to cover a few more points on lab sensitivity monitoring. Uh, so the 2022 data, as I've shown for prothioconazole, but also for SDHIs, shows no significant shifts. All the isolates were within the bounds of the previous ranges. That being said, um, we are seeing that these isolates with reduced sensitivity are slowly accounting for an increasing proportion of the population, and these isolates are becoming gradually more complex. It's important to remember, though, that septoria populations are heterogeneous, um, and samples will vary by site and season, and even within a season. Um, so monitoring in this project, pre and post application, has shown that a single fungicide application is sufficient to drive changes in the population, and therefore really um, sort of coming back to the point that resistance management, so mixtures, alternations and multi-sites, are key considerations when building a programme. So to move on to yellow rust, um, I hope the photo is showing as clearly on your screen as it does here. Um, you can see this picture um, on the left, which was taken at the yellow rust site in Norfolk early in the season. You can see a clear line where the trial area starts and the field turns yellow, um, showing what a high pressure situation this was. And that's reflected in the data with the untreated having 45% disease severity in the field. Um, all products gave good levels of control. Um, on the right hand chart here, uh, Myresa and Pectiga are giving good dose responses up to a full label rate. Um, and comparing across to the mixtures on the left hand side of the chart, you can see the benefit of fluxoproxad in Revistar and prothioconazole in Univoc adding to the level of control. The green line on the right hand side of the chart is Benzavindi flupire in Elatus Plus, um, which remains a leading active against yellow rust. This is consistent across seasons. Um, so you can see the green line on the right hand chart, again giving very 
high levels of activity, as does the green line on the left-hand chart, which is a latticera, so benzovindiflupi and pathiaconazole. Looking across seasons, this chart also allows us to include proline, so pathiaconazole in the dotted blue line, and imtrex fluxoproxide in the yellow line. And you can see here that these actives are still adding very good levels of uh, activity on yellow rust. When you look to yield, uh, the trends seen carry through uh, with Imtrex and Proline giving around a ton yield response at a full label rate from uh, the over the untreated in three trials across 2020 to 2022. The standout here um, is the products containing Zovindiflupire, so Alatus Plus and Alatus Era, both showing the persistence of control reflected in the yield responses uh, achieving around a tonne and a half for a full rate of Alatus Era in this subset of three trials. So moving on to brown rust, um, four products to share with you this year. Um, again, reflecting that there are unregistered products in the trial that will be available to you when the products are commercially available. Three of these products in trial this season were acti uh, straight actives, so Pectiga, Alatus Plus and Myresa, of the three, Myresa, Mephentrifluconazole, showing the greatest level of activity in 2022. Again, you can see the benefit of the mixture partners in Revistar, so uh, Mephentrifluconazole and Fluxoproxad, showing the highest levels of control. And this again is consistent across this trial over the last three seasons. Um, the, on the left-hand side, the orange line of Revistar there, proving highly effective even at low dose rates. On the right hand side again, you can see uh, methventrifluconazole showing strong levels of activity in the brown line, as does the green line of Alatus Plus. Um, the two other lines on the right hand side chart are Pectiga in the grey and Proline in the dotted line. And you can see these are also giving useful activity, although less than methventrifluconazole or benzovindiflupa. And looking across these three trials into yield, um, you can see these trends remain. Uh, so seeing around a ton yield response from the full application of methentrifluconazole, benzovindiflupa, or the mixture of methentrifluconazole and fluxoproxad in Revistar. Um, again, this is a, a single T2 spray um, on a highly susceptible variety. So finally, uh, on the wheat, uh, just a slide on fusarium control. Um, so two products to share with you are Proline, so Pathiaconazole, which remains a, a leading active for fusarium control, giving around a 50% reduction in visible ear blight symptoms. Myresa also adding a small amount of activity. So to summarise on wheat before I hand over to Fiona, um, for Septoria, methentrifluconazole and fempicoximid remain the leading actives, both when applied as solos and when applied as the proprietary mixtures of Univoc and Revistar. Um, on yellow rust, all mixtures performed well, um, Alatus era, in particular Benzovindiflupia, standing out in yield. Again, with the uh, brown rust, methentrifluconazole and SDHIs showing high levels of activity. So with that, I will hand over to Fiona. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm uh, Fiona Burnett from SRUC, so I'll be following Rebecca and describing the barley fungicide performance uh, for last year and then moving on to the LC rate. And Rebecca's given a, a great introduction to the, the format of the, of the trial series and broadly the barley follows a very similar protocol. So we're looking at um, sites that predisposed to the disease, so high-risk sites, weak varieties, um, and single timings of the fungicides. The sites that we had last year um, are set out there, so usually we would have eight sites uh, in the trial series for barley, two targeting Rhynchosporium, two targeting net blotch, um, and then we have the sites that target Ramularia, and we have the Irish sites um, that similarly, we have one there that targets Rhynchosporium and one that targets Ramularia. 
clearly the 2022 season was particularly dry early on, so we lost one of the sites um, at Cardigan where there was high levels of BYDV, which is why we have nine sites shown there, um, and the Powys site was brought in to replace that Cardigan site. Similar to the wheat that we're looking at single timing, so that's important. These series help guide you to programmes, but they're not representing programmes, so we're testing products at a single timing. Um, and for Rhynchosporium, we tend to go for a T1 timing in barley, which is helpful because that's broadly representative of commercial practice. For Ramularia, we tend to um, go for the T2 timing, which again is standard practice. And you can see there that for some of the sites, we were on a T1 and a half. So we treat once we've got disease in the trial rather than obliterating it early doors and then failing to generate useful data. But as Rebecca has, has given the context for the wheat, it is important to recognise that we're really going for high risk situations in the, in the trial series. So moving on to the data, um, starting with Ringosporium here, which is probably the most damaging of the foliar diseases that you'll get in the barley crop when it comes to yield robbing. So we've set out the data here as protectant on the left and eradicant on the right. So if I start with the eradicant set of charts, um, if you're looking at the most effective um, products, so again, you're used to this trial series where the most effective products give you a nice tight curve into that left-hand corner. Um, if you look at Proline, which has been a very standard um, offer in barley, you can see that as the dotted blue line. And if we're comparing that with the other azole, which is the, um, the Revisol azole, uh, methane trifluconazole, um, you can see the differentiation there in the two products. So proline um, for Rhynchosporium pulling ahead of the Revisol curve. And then we're also looking at Imtrex there as the dark line uh, and Ascra Pro. Um, and you can see there that um, Imtrex for a single product is giving a very strong curve. Um, but as caveated by Rebecca, really important that we use these products in mixture. And again, there you can see the power of Ascra X Pro, um, so that mixed product um, doing well as a, as a standard in these trials. If we move to the right-hand chart there, you can see that essentially in an eradicant situation, all the products are having to work that bit harder, so um, the, the curves move away from that good corner of the chart. Again, you can see that Imtrex pulls forward very strongly as an eradicant, so that's a very strong curve for a single product. Um, and then if you compare the two azoles, you can see that in this situation, the curves have really flattened out and they cross over. So again, we're dealing from full rate up to double dose. Um, but if we're looking at around the full rate there, they're pretty much on a par in that eradicant situation. Although you can see that the Myresa line is, is essentially straight. Um, the curve has come out. Um, and again, you can see that Ascra X Pro does well in an eradicant situation. So again, the power of a of a joint product um, in, a, in a practical situation. Broadly, the yields um, reflect that disease data. So um, if we pick out the two um, azole products there, the Proline and the Myresa, um, you can see that they are perhaps more similar than you might expect from the disease data, but that they, the Proline pulls ahead. Uh, again, you see the power of, of Ascra X Pro as a mixed product. And you can see that Imtrex, um, you know, for a solo product, is performing very strongly. Um, quite high uh, responses in the, in the trials last year. Um, so you're, you're seeing responses there of over half a tonne um, in the kind of range that you would be working in um, with these products. If we look at the overyear disease data, so we're starting to pull in products from previous um, trial series. So again, as Rebecca set out, this allows us to compare products that we couldn't keep in trial this year. So um, you can see that from the previous slides, we have space for eight products in the trials. We only had four products we were showing you. So we have four that are coded products that will come through. When we look at the overyears data here, um, I can bring in probably the most useful comparison that I brought in here is Revastar for you. So that allows you to compare the Ascra uh, SDHI azole mix with the, the Revastar um, azole and SDHI mix. 
And here you can see that, that Rebastar really performs very similarly to Ascro, so that gives you a choice of, of two strong mixed products um, for Rhynchosporium protection. And again, if we're comparing Proline there uh, with Imtrex, you can see those two solo products um, sitting quite close together when it comes to a protectant situation. Um, but again, that you know, strong message that we're really operating in mixtures in every situation. And then if we look at the right-hand side of the chart there, we can see the Rhynchosporium eradication charts. So we have six trials in this mix. Um, probably the one to pick out there, you can see that the proline curve, it, it's a good curve, um, but a single lays all there um, trailing behind the other products. Um, but again, you see Imtrex really being extremely strong as an eradicant um, product for a solo. And you see both the Ascra X-Pro and the Revastar XC um, performing in a very similar range uh, within the commercial usage that you would be using. So that gives us a, a, you know, a strong position to be managing Rhynchosporium going forward. And then looking at the yield um, that comes out of those, those trials, so we've got eight trials in, in this um, merged data set that I'm showing you. Um, the one that comes out there, particularly at lower doses, is the Revastar XC um, coming to the top of the chart there. And then the other three products, um, the Ascra, the Proline and the Imtrex, are really running in a very similar, very similar fashion. Um, and you can see there that the yield responses, again, are around that half a tonne range um, up, to the, up to the full dose there. So moving on to net blotch, um, it was a kind of lean year for, for net blotch uh, data. Uh, as I've said, uh, a very dry and very unusual start to the season. Um, so we're showing you one trial uh, in this uh, series from 2022. And again, we've separated to protectant and to eradicant activity. So if we look at the protectant activity first, as we did in the past, um, you can see the proline there is a dotted line. So if we take that as a long time standard um, for um, barley, barley work, um, it's sitting in the middle of the pack there, giving, you know, it's reasonable protectant activity there as a solo product. Um, you can see the Ascra line, so again, improving on that uh, proline curve. Um, and you can see that the Myresa line, um, if we're comparing that to, to proline, is just sitting somewhere behind the, the proline. It's not a long way off, but it's slightly behind the proline curve. Um, so again, the, the power of mixed chemistry in Ascra X Pro. Uh, and again, Imtrex in a protectant situation is, is doing quite a good job. However, if we move to the eradicant chart on the right there, um, we know that we have underlying uh, SDHI resistance issues in net blotch. And perhaps this is what we're seeing coming through in the 2022 um, data here. So you see that the Imtrex line is actually some way off the other three products now, um, perhaps reflecting uh, those underlying resistance issues. And you see the two azole products, the Myresa and the Proline, lying very close to each other. Um, the other one there, clearly Ascra Espro again, a, a mixed product, um, giving a nice strong curve for net blotch eradication. Moving on to Ramularia protection. Um, so clearly, Ramularia, we know we have major underlying concerns with both azole and SDHI resistance in the population, which is very patchy um, between sites. Again, I'm showing you four products um, in the, the trial series uh, from last year, but that means we had four um, products in tests that we hope will come to market um, in, in the future. So I suppose the encouraging thing, knowing that we have underlying resistance issues with Ramularia, is in fact all the products we're testing are giving some uh, benefits when it comes to Ramularia symptom suppression. Um, the one that really comes to the front of the pack, though, in this situation, if you look at the Myresa curve sitting in the, at the bottom of the chart there, so good control coming through from Myresa. And if we're comparing that to the other azole in the trial series, the prothiaconazole, you can see that in the Ramularia context, it's the Myresa, the methentrifuconazole, which is sitting ahead of the prothiaconazole. Prothiaconazole, though, bringing some benefits um, despite the underlying uh, azole resistance issues. 
Imtrex sitting behind that, so again, we know we have uh, issues with, um, with SDHI resistance. So in this context, it's, it's the poorest product in test, although still useful in suppressing symptoms. Um, you'll see there that we're showing four trials there. So for all, we only had two target trials going for Ramularia. We actually brought in data from other trials in the series. Mildew um, is a problem that we don't actually target in the, the fungicide performance work, but we do gather the data where it occurs. And actually last year we had quite a lot of mildew come into the trials um, and we've merged that with data from the previous uh, two years. So I'm showing you three years worth of data here merged over four trials. And I mean, clearly mildew can represent an additional cost if you're having to add in a mildewicide to a programme. So it's useful to know what inherent activity you're getting from your standard chemistry. Um, so again, if we look at the proline curve, well, we've always known that prothioconazole had reasonable mildew protectant activity. You can see that dotted blue line sitting in the middle of the chart. Um, and we can see that Ascra X probing some improvement on that single product. The Revistar XE also performing strongly. And perhaps the one tailing slightly is the Imtrex, but then it, the SDHI's uh, mildew was never their, their strongest suite. Um, but useful protectant mildew activity there in your standard chemistry, um, which is helpful to know. Similarly, we don't target brown rust in the trials, but we do record the data um, where we find it. Um, so here we have uh, brown rust data from one of the trials last year. Um, really, the encouraging message from this is that all our standard chemistry has very good control against brown rust. So three of the lines are sitting right on top of each other there. So you have Imtrex Pro line and Extra Ascra X Pro um, giving a very tight um, control at very low doses. Um, and the Myresa also, that's an excellent curve. So it's only sitting slightly behind that. So encouraging to know it's clearly a very varietal dependent problem, um, but where it does occur, the standard chemistry bringing excellent control. So to summarise the um, barley data there, um, prothioconazole, fluxoperoxide and methentrifluconazole all giving very effective rhincosporium control, particularly in that protectant situation. And it's the prothioconazole and the fluxoperoxide that we're pulling ahead of the methentrifluconazole. But a mix of actives, the Ascra Expro or the Revistar XC, much more effective than straight products, as well as being a, an effective anti-resistance strategy. Um, so in a practical context, it's giving you control of a number of scenarios and a number of diseases, but particularly good in that rhincosporium situation. For Ramularia, we had good control, um, particularly for methentrifluconazole, but prothioconazole also bringing something to that Ramularia control. Fluxoperoxide was less effective, but bringing a small degree of control or at least symptom suppression to the scenario. And then brown rust, as I've said, very well controlled by all the fungicides tested. For mildew, STHIs um, in, in Ascra Expro, so that additional um, fluopyram and bixofen adding to the activity of prothioconazole, but we were also getting good control from Revistar XE. And for net blotch, um, the easels were particularly strong in that eradicant situation, so clearly adding to the activity that we get from STHIs. So that concludes the barley summary. Um, and if we move on to the fungicide performance update uh, for oilseed rape, this is managed by Faye Ritchie at ADAS. Again, broadly, the trial protocols are similar to the barley and to the wheat. Um, except that we're treating twice um, for, uh, for the oilseed rape diseases. But again, it really is a situation where we're trying to um, set up sites and situations that really predispose to getting the disease, so they're the highest risk scenarios. So here we have the varieties that were in trial last year, two uh, FOMA sites and two light leaf spot sites. So doing our best to pick varieties that are as weak as we can find um, for those two diseases. These are the oilseed rate products that we either had in trial this year or that we've got in the trial series where I start to merge the data um, and show you previous year's data as well. Um, and 
really quite a positive situation. So after a long period of years where we were very, very reliant on easels when it comes to managing acid rate diseases, you can see that we now have a range of products which either mix a DMI with a QOI or an SDHI, or in fact move away from easels entirely. So running down that list, we've got Proline as probably a very standard DMI or easel uh, inclusion in the trials. We've got Priory Gold as an older um, strabilurin and an older easel. Um, and then we move on to slightly newer products. We've got Aviator there, uh, an SDHI easel mix, a straight SDHI in Filan. Um, we've got Architect, so that's mix mixing a growth regulator with a strabilurin. Um, we've got Shepherd, so again a newer product um, that came in in 2021. So that's one of the newer products that's allowing you to move away from ASOLs and SDHI and a strabilurin or QOI there. We've then got Plover as a straight DMI, so a comparator to Proline, Amistar uh, and Pictor. So again, that's representing a product that's mixing a QOI and an SDHI. So if I move on to the FOMA um, data from last year where we had two sites uh, in Norfolk and Herefordshire. Um, again, you can see from the sparsity of lines on the chart how many we've got in test at the moment, which is kind of promising you jam tomorrow. Um, but again, a fairly consistent message as I begin to go through these slides that the newer products are bringing advantages when it comes to disease control, but they're also um, bringing an advantage in terms of, of yield. Um, last year, 2022 season, we were really just at low to moderate um, canker levels. Um, and you see the levels uh, shown on the, the axis there. Um, but again, just to reiterate, if you look at the shepherd line, so that's your QI uh, SDHI mix. Um, it's giving you the tightest curve there. Aviator X Pro um, sitting just behind that. And then Proline as a straight product. Um, sitting behind that. You'll notice that these charts only go up to 100%, so that's probably another key difference in these trials, um, also rate being that bit more sensitive to phytotoxicity damage if we go over um, the full dose. If you look at the yield coming through from those trials, you just see the additional benefit of those newer products, so the aviator and the shepherd coming to the top of the pack there, so tending to add around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a tonne to existing chemistry in the form of, of prothioconazole proline there. If we start to look at the merge data, um, the charts look a little bit more generous for you. So here we're merging data going back to 2015 and it sets out the full range of available chemistry. Um, but again, if you look at the two extremes, you've got the, the newer products there in the form of, uh, you know, Shepherd coming to the front there uh, as, a, as an offering, a newer offering. You can see uh, Aviator, which you could see on the previous charts. And at the top of the chart there, um, you can see um, Plover, so the older uh, azole chemistry, diphenoconazole, um, sitting at the top of the chart. Priory Gold, again, another older set of chemistry, um, sitting you know, at, at a poorer end of the chart. Prothioconazole sitting kind of in the middle of the chart there for you just ahead of Phelan. And again, if you look at the yield there, it's a fairly consistent story with what we saw in 2022. So it's the shepherd um, that's tending to come to the top of the pack there uh, and the aviator really running pretty close. And again, probably a kind of key message there, you see the charts flatten off at above the 50% dose. So little benefit to increasing dosage above that half rate in the FOMA scenario. Uh, again, the, the lower yielding ones are tending to be those older products, um, so things like um, Plover sitting at the bottom of the pack there. If we start to look at just the sites where we had quite high levels of stem canker, that's a much more stretching scenario um, for the fungicide. So I've just put this um, chart in the pack um, to show the, the differentiation there at a very high pressure disease site. So we've picked out two sites where the canker levels were above 80%. Um, but as in previous charts, you see that the, it's the newer chemistry in terms of efficacy that's pulling to the front there. Um, so again, we could pick out um, Shepherd 
and architect, which I actually probably not mentioned um, as I should have before. Um, so again, it's that um, growth regulator plus QOI giving very good um, control in this um, situation. You've got Aviator um, doing quite well in this scenario, but again, you're seeing either the single prothioconazole or the older um, plover uh, azol chemistry um, really toiling in that um, higher pressure situation. And again, if we look at the yield um, data, that's, that's reflecting that um, ranking order. So again, it's that newer chemistry. The yields are slightly higher in terms of yield response in the, in the high disease pressure situations. But you see the newer chemistry, um, such as Architect and Shepherd and Aviator, pulling to the top of the pack. And again, it tends to be that 0 0.2, 0 0.3 um, tonnes uh, per hectare yield benefit that you're seeing. And again, you can see the products um, before the plovers, the prothio, um, that are sitting at the lower, the less responsive end of that um, trial series in these particularly high pressure situations. Moving on to light leaf spot, um, we had a, a lower um, disease pressure year in the trials last year. So I'm showing you data from five trials uh, merged from 2019 to 2021. And essentially what we're seeing in a light leaf spot situation is very little differentiation between the products that we're testing. Um, so they're all sitting really quite close together, although you can see some benefit to the, the more mixed chemistry. So again, if we look at um, prothioconazole, which is probably a, a product that you're all very familiar with, it's sitting sort of nicely buried within the other lines uh, for the, the light leaf spot um, control that we're getting. Um, you see the control there from Filan um, sitting at the, at the top of the pack there, so marginally poorer than the, the Priory Gold. Um, and you're seeing Shepherd there um, as quite a strong curve, particularly at the, at the lower doses. But like I say, those, those curves are all really um, pretty close together when it comes to light leaf spot uh, management. Again, the curves flatten off, so um, there's little benefit to going above the half dose, although we would still recommend that in the particularly high risk um, sites. So, you know, particularly the northeast of Scotland, where we have particular issues with night, light leaf blotch, we may, we may go higher. Looking at the yield responses, you can see that um, yield responses are, are, you know, relatively encouraging. Um, so we're, you know, well over the, the half tonne for some of the the best options there. Um, but again, um, very pleasingly, it's the newer chemistry that's coming to the front there. So we see a very strong um, curve there for Shepherd. Um, so that, like I say, it's moving us away from azole chemistry where we've been so reliant, particularly in the lightly spot context. Um, so we're using a QOI and an SDHI there and getting a good disease, a, a good yield response. And then the Aviator X Pro also giving a very strong um, dose response there. Um, so actually at the 50% dose, it's, it's matching Shepherd. So that's very pleasing to see. Really for the other three products, they're sitting very close together. Um, so, you know, not much to choose between um, the Priory Gold, um, the Proline or the Feline when it comes to um, yield responses there. Sclerotinia is clearly a disease that um, you're managing at the end of the season and relying on the chemistry that you've used perhaps previously in the spray programme. So most of the options, all of the options in fact, that we've just talked through um, can also be used to manage sclerotinia. So we don't have new sclerotinia data to share with you. This is showing you um, data between 2015 and 2017. And it's really here just to highlight what the products we've talked about previously bring you in the sclerotinia context. Um, so the left-hand chart there, looking at sclerotinia um, stem rot um, in, the, in the context of, the, of this trial series. Um, and again, you can probably see there the sort of range of, of options that we've seen before. So Priory Gold um, giving a slightly poorer curve um, than the other products. Um, and again, it's some of those newer products that are bringing you um, some of the, the better, stronger sclerotinia stem rot control. Really important when you're thinking about sclerotinia management, though, that this is an opportunity to try and alternate away from the chemistry that you've used in the rest of the season. So for all, you may not be targeting FOMA 
or lightly spot um, at the flowering sprays, they will still be present in the crop and part of the isolates that go on to influence the sensitivity of those pathogens in the coming season. So a nice and a practical example of where you can alternate away from chemistry that you've used previously. Maybe to pick out prothioconazole in that disease management chart as being one that you might have used earlier in the season, it's bringing very good control here and is certainly an option, um, but we could move to some of the QOI or SDHI chemistry as well. If you look at the yield responses there, uh, again, you can see that it tends to be the newer products that are coming to the front of the pack there. Um, as you would expect, the yield responses when it comes to managing sclerotinia can be quite high. Um, so it is a disease that can be fairly devastating when it gets into the trials. Um, but again, it's a consistent message really through this trial series that it's the, the newer products that are tending to bring you um, the best responses when it comes to sclerotinia management as well as the other diseases. So to finish with a summary of the oxid rape um, charts that we've just been through, um, for FOMA stem canker, um, you really have those effective azole and non-azole options now for the management of FOMA stem canker. And the yield responses that we were showing really ranged between uh, 0.4 of a tonne up to a tonne in 2022, but with little benefit from applying more than that half dose of the full label rate. And, you know, as said, we were using this as part of a two-spray programme. Product differences in canker control and yield were more evident where the disease pressure is high, so that probably intuitively feels right, that we get the best responses where the disease pressure is high. For light leaf spot management, again, we now have options that can move us away from being reliant on the easels. So both those easel and the QOI SDH options were giving us effective control, not much differentiation between the products, um, and both those um, options were available for use in, in the the autumn, so you perhaps have already applied. And for sclerotinia stem rot, um, all those mode of actions that we looked at are available for sclerotinia and can be used elsewhere in your programme. So as I've said, it's a chance to consider um, what you've used previously and then try and mix and alternate um, from a resistance management point of view. And then just acknowledgements to the staff involved in this uh, fungicide performance trial series. So the staff at AHDB, the staff at ADAS, um, NIAB, SRUC, Harper Adams, Nicola Hawkins at NIAB who's done the resistance testing and Stephen Kildea who brings in the Irish and the, the Chuggis data. Thank you. Thank you very much Fiona and Rebecca. That was a very interesting uh, presentation can tell by all of the questions that are coming through on PolyV. Uh, we're now going to move over to the panel session. If you have got any questions, you can um, put them into PolyV at polyv.com forward slash AHDB. Uh, you can also like or dislike questions that have already been asked, which will um, change where they are in the ranking. So we'll just pass over now, now to Anna and the panel. Thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, time for some questions. Keep the questions coming in. Uh, we'll start with one that I've received uh, in advance. A question perhaps for Diane to start with, but everybody else, please do chip in. Did your research show other diseases on the horizon? So with climate change, what should we be preparing for next? Yeah, so I think this is a really important question. So I think many diseases are likely to shift in their abundance and also in their geographic distribution based on climate change. Um, I think it can be difficult to predict because also at the same time we may shift what we're growing in particular areas. Um, so it's very difficult to predict, but it's very clear, at least now for wheat stemmers, that we're really on the edge of that shift and um, it's starting to occur, so yeah. Okay, any, any comments from anybody else? Anything coming up in the future? Maybe just to pick out, it's just the change of what something like brown rust in barley where we mm. wouldn't have seen that so much in the north because it's a warmer weather disease mm. but I think yeah, Paul you too. highlighted that it's the changing in practice that goes with a changed climate so earlier drilling mm. you know it's it has an influence too. Yes of course right thank you very much mm. next question is does Folpet have any part to play in barley programs? Yes <laughs> so nice um, and straightforward there, thank you yeah. very much. So no, I mean, particularly for something like Ramularia, where we have really significant resistance issues, 
Um, Fulpit's kind of interesting that when we tested it as a street product in the fungicide performance, it didn't show particularly promising activity. Um, but it does seem to do something when used in programmes, more than something. So it adds to um, what the other chemistry is doing. And again, in a scenario where we know we have azole um, and STHI resistance, it's really important to bring in that multi-site. Um, but similarly, it, it adds to programmes, um, both for Rhynchosporium and, and Netblotch as well, in support of the other chemistry. Okay, thank you, Fiona. I think we've got another similar question here from, from YouTube. Um, how does Folpet used against Remularia compare against the fungicide trial this year? So, kind of as I've highlighted, if you look at it on its own, it doesn't give it a particularly um, fair shot. Uh, where it is useful is where you look at it um, either once or twice in spray programmes mm -hmm. in support of the other chemistry. Um, so I think I'd rather see what it adds to the other chemistry than yes. to see what it does individually. Um, whether you use it one th once or twice um, is you know, a, a discussion point. It does tend to add to the efficacy. When that then follows through to yield, it's less clear whether once or twice is the most beneficial when it comes to um, margins. Um, but I think if we just think in terms of efficacy, then we do see it um, where it's used twice in supportive programmes actually doing quite well. Okay, thank you Fiona. And barley seems to be very popular, so there's another question. It's voted quite highly. Um, so where is the alternation strategy in barley for anti-disease resistance when we constantly base our programmes on PTZ? That's been a concern for a long time. So, I mean, I think at one point we were sitting at about 85% of the barleys all getting prothioconazole. Um, so, yeah, clearly that ongoing pressure has been a concern. Mm. I think the nice thing, though, in barley, it, it perhaps more genuinely than wheat, it has been an opportunity where we could um, use QOIs and SDHIs. So they, still in the barley context... Um, QIs are still quite strong for rhynchosporium protection, so we could more genuinely mix. Um, we also tend to be on lower doses than in wheat, and again for fungicide resistance we know that that's helpful in reducing the selection pressure. Um, we've had sort of strong usage of, you know, previously CTL, but you know now we've got full pit, so we've been able to bring quite a lot of other things to the party, and then. We still have, if you like, older actives like saprodnil, which for a winter barley crop, um, if you're doing a very early a T naught after winter cleanup, um, you can actually start with something that's not prothioconazole based. So, yeah, we are very reliant on what's been a very strong um, piece of azole chemistry, it remains a very strong piece of azole chemistry, but we do have options um, that perhaps we didn't have until recently in heat. That's great. Thank you. Next question is something quite topical, I think, for, for this season, this year. Does the panel have any information, maybe even anecdotal, about any products that may have an effect on ergot development? <laughs> <laughs> there are seed treatments available with ergot on the label. So some seed yeah. treatments. OK, maybe have a look um, at those. Thank you. Do the panel have any comment on claims being made within the industry that yellow rust is becoming more aggressive and that we are at more risk from changes in virulence due to sexual reproduction? Yeah, maybe I could comment there. Yeah. So um, we know that yellow rust doesn't undergo sexual reproduction in this part of the mm -hmm. world. So we know that it only occurs in the near Himalaya region. And so it's not undergoing sexual reproduction here. However, we know that around 2011, that a new set of races of yellow rust moved into the UK, and those were highly diverse. And so we have now got a much more diverse population than we ever had previously, where previously it was just a clone that was slowly developing over time. Um, that very diverse um, population that came from sexual reproduction then moved into the UK and in many places in Europe, and now that has really replaced what was here previously. So we do have much more diversity. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Any Thank further you. thoughts on no. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. Okay, another question, Prothioconazole. Um, is it an effective mixing partner in septoria control relative to other triazoles? 
to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we still see thiaconazole adding um, activity when you when you look at the curbs um, over the last three years, and um, we still see activity from thiaconazole, um, and it is still adding resistance mm -hmm. management in the program, and probably adding to control of other diseases. Um, so, for example, yellow rust. Um, when you compare um, some of the straight active ingredients and then the min mixture with prothiaconazole, you are seeing a benefit there as well. So when looking sort of in commercial situations where you're unlikely to have a, say, purely protectant septoria situation, there are benefits. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that. what we're always trying to do is get aim for a balanced mix. So if you're yeah. doing your own prothiaconazole yeah. mix, it might mm -hmm. be a question of flexing the dose with your mixing partner so that you begin to just aim at that idea that they're equally balanced. Okay. Thank you very much. The next question is, do you have any comment on the message coming out from certain quarters that it's not worthwhile treating oilseed rape for light leaf spot in the autumn or winter? Well, the correct answer is it depends on the season because you, what you want to be is ahead working protectantly with a light leaf spot situation. So. Where the risk is high in the autumn and the disease establishes early, then absolutely it's worthwhile doing that early protectant spray because if you're waiting to try and treat in the spring, mm -hmm. it's too well established. If, however, we're in a season where likely spot doesn't establish until after Christmas and into the spring, then the autumn spray may not have been beneficial, but we don't know that with any confidence until retrospectively. Um, so um, with the value of the crop at the minute, um, the protectant approach may well be one that people steer for at the moment. Okay, thank you Fiona. Um, another topical question on cover crops. Uh, with the use of brassicas in cover crops, would determination of a winter cover crop in January or February mitigate against increased club root incidence in oilseed rape later in the rotation? Probably not, um, because actually it can cycle really very quickly. So okay. in a warm season within, I mean, Paul's data showed that beautifully, you could see the problems in the autumn. Yeah. Um, so four to six weeks might be enough to cycle and leave stuff back in the soil. Okay, thank you. And can you report whether differences between products, both for reduction of disease and yield response, are statistically significant? Rebecca? Yeah, so we, we don't put stats to the curves, um, but I think as a general rule, we say if the products points and lines are separate between products, then you can probably say they're significantly different. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Question on the recommended list. So the recommended list fungicide programs have been increasing cost as we chase lifting, shifting sensitivity. Is it time to wean the trials off of very high fungicide inputs and select the varieties under a more commercial programme? So one for you, Paul. Uh, Tough question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the issue with the fungicide programme in the recommended list has been in discussion for many years now. And the issue is if you move um, away from uh, what is effectively a, a disease elimination programme uh, to one which is a commercial programme and you change the nature of the trials themselves, it no longer becomes a test of genetics, it becomes a chest test of genetics by fungicide. Um, and, and from a practical point of view, um, if you think about the varieties that are in trial, you, you wouldn't commercially, or at least you shouldn't put the same program you put on Crusoe as you would on Zayat, as you would on um, Skyfall. So actually in a trial, which commercial product system do you put on? Um, it becomes very difficult, difficult logistically um, as well to do. And you wouldn't use the same fungicide program in a trial in Devon or in a variety in Devon as you would in Cambridgeshire. Mm -hmm. So actually there are some quite difficult practical things you'd have to overcome to try and use a commercial product or commercial program, as well as moving away from that, fun that fundamental change that it would no longer be a test of, of um, variety by environment, it would be a test of variety by environment by fungicide program. And then it becomes much more difficult to actually interpret the, the results. Um, as I said, there is a review going on. We will look at this again, but I suspect we'll come back to the same position that actually um, having a series of treated trials and a series of untreated trials is the best compromise. Hmm. 
Thank you, Paul. I think that's, um, that's a key point to pick up on. How can we use the untreated trial data compared to treated to perhaps perhaps arrive at a response uh, and, and, and the guidance that would be equal to um, tailoring the trials and having lower inputs? Mm -hmm. I think that would be, um, is that something that is already included in the y yes. RL app, perhaps? Um, I mean, uh, obviously there's, um, we have the untreated trials and we have the, the fully treated trials and there's a, a curve in, in terms of response between those and, and different varieties, well, that curve will be a different shape. Um, interpreting where your programme sits on that curve would be very difficult to do. Okay. You've just got two points, one at each end. Um, so actually, that would, again, it would be something very difficult to do. Okay. There was a piece of work done, a five-year project, looking at how you can adjust fungicide inputs. I can't think what... Um, the agronomy project, mm -hmm. looking at how you can adjust fungicide inputs by variety. Um, mm -hmm. That's an HDB project, if that would be on the website. Yeah, there have been a number of, of, of different a, projects over the years yeah. looking at different programmes on different varieties yeah. uh, to try and find where that curve Supporting is. Supporting the RL yeah. data mm -hmm. set. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And as, and as Paul said, certainly these things are, are part of the recommended list review. So if you've got you know, strong opinions and views, do you fill out that questionnaire and take part in the focus groups so we can perhaps find other ways of getting the answers to you? Um, thank you. Uh, next question, again, uh, uh, the RL. Uh, so recommended list trials, are they affected by pests and diseases? Are trials affected by pests and disease included in the RL data, Paul? It depends on the trial. So um, the trials I was talking about today, so the, um, the club root trial that was very patchy club root, that was included because um, we could cut out effectively the bits of the plots or the whole plots that were affected and just use the rest of the data. And we, where we can do something like that, we try to include the data um, because obviously we pay for that trial, we want to use the data. But for a trial like the, the lemon wheat blossom midge trial, because that... Um, affect different varieties differently depending on when the, um, the varieties were in flower. Obviously that would be unfair to include that because the variety, none of them are resistant but some of them are affected much worse than others. So in a situation like that we wouldn't include the data. We do try and include the data where we can and uh, because we've, as I say, we've already paid for the trials we want to include the data. And if we can't include the data there might be situations like today where you can report on the information but not include it um, in, in the actual RL itself. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, a question here perhaps for Rebecca and Fiona. Is there any work comparing the resistance of various clubroot resistant varieties to give an indication if any are more aligned to the pathogen population that is prevailing in the UK? Well, actually, we know very little about the prevalent situations. So it's okay. some years since ADAS and SRUC had worked to look at the what the pathogen, what the, the makeup of the population is. But I mean, broadly, we are reliant still in the commercial varieties on that single source, the, the Mendel resistance. Um, so the worry there is that where it's being deployed multiple times previously uh, in a rotation, that you've selected the parts of the public population mm -hmm. that can overcome it. And that you know, remains a very key concern. So it would be great to know more about the mix. We know it's quite complex. Um, and in fact, the kind of complexity of the UK population was kind of a contrast to the European situation, but it maybe kind of reflects a kind of rich heritage, lots of crops yeah. in our background that are susceptible. But it's a complex pathogen, and we had a complex population, and complexity only adds to the risks of shifts and problems. Yes, thank you, Fiona. Can the panel comment on whether the best combination now with the decline of Imtrex and Prothia efficacy is Bifentrificlozol with Fenpicoximid? It's an interesting question, one for <laughs> Fiona and Rebecca. Have a think for a minute. I'm rereading it. <laughs> okay, so... Okay. <laughs> Sorry, the screen changed. Yeah. So, yes. um, <laughs> so it both... Um, the charts show that, you know, Revistar and Univoc, um, you can see the benefit of the flux proxad in um, Revistar and the prothyconazole in um, Univoc when you compare to the um, products tested as straights, so the Myrisa and the Pectiga. 
um, in terms of a resistance management point of view, um, your ideal mixture partner would be something that is um, equally balanced. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Fiona has any comments. Yes, I mean, clearly the best mixes will be the strongest individual yeah. products put together. Yeah. Um, but as we kind of alluded to in the previous one, it doesn't mean you can't use the slightly weaker ones mm. if you just adjust the dosage yeah. properly. And I think for me, it's the kind of practical power that comes from a mixture as well. So we have the luxury of separating the data yeah. today into protectant and eradicant. Yes. In a real life situation, you're dealing with both and you're probably dealing with other pathogens as well, because um, real life is not that simple. So again, the mixed chemistry it brings you that practical resistance management. It brings you those kind of the win-wins that actually it's, it's covering many of your bases. So um, yeah, absolutely the newer chemistry is taking us some way forward, but that idea of balance mm. remains very important. Okay, fantastic, thank you both. And perhaps a final question, um, one from YouTube. Bearing in mind that TEB is a much cheaper fungicide than most others, what are your thoughts on including it in yellow rust programs and wheat and oilseed rape disease programs? Maybe if I take oilseed rape. <laughs> yeah. <do> <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. Yes, I mean, clearly um, it's so much cheaper than other options that mm -hmm. its usage is, is very prevalent um, in oilseed rape. So it would be excellent to include it as a direct comparator to the other easels that we've, that we've got in trials. Um, we know from our own work that, you know, that it, it can sit somewhere around the sort of older easel chemistry that we're looking at today, because again, we, we suspect there are easel issues. Well, we know there are easel issues going on in like this spot. Yeah, and I think many of Fiona's comments apply to yellow rust in wheat. Um, we, we know that um, tebuconazole has good activity against yellow rust in wheat, so yeah, definitely worthwhile considering including it in a programme. Thank you both. Fantastic. That was our final question. Thank you very much, panel, for fantastic presentations and just a wealth of data. I'm definitely going to go back and rewatch some of those just to absorb it all. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time and for joining us. We will be breaking up for lunch and we'll be back by one. So see you at one o'clock. Thank you.
Trump's going to give you a thumbs up, okay? Welcome back to session three of the Agronomist Conference. This afternoon is looking at optimising nutrition use. So the first two presentations will share the latest findings from re recently completed nutrition projects, followed by Mark Topliff covering the impact of higher costs on nitrogen use. Just a reminder for basis and neuroso points, you can email events at ahdb.org.uk. You can also e email Maya Kotecha at ahdb.org.uk. Her details are available on um, the website. And there will also be an opportunity in the evaluation form, which will be circulated after today's conference. So the results of the research projects covered in today's session feed into the RB209 Arable Technical Working Group and Steering Group to decide if amendments to guidance are necessary. So we're going to start this session off with a poll. So do you use RB209 for nutrient management planning? Just a reminder that the polls can be completed at pollev.com forward slash AHDB. So you can just click um, on yes or no as whether you use RB209 for nutrient management planning. So as mentioned before, all of the um, updates to the nutrient management guide are in partnership with a lot of other organisations. So the partnership is organised as a steering group supported by three technical working groups who fund research and knowledge exchange on crop nutrient management to generate independent, scientifically robust, practical data on crop nutrient management for the UK. So let's take a look at those answers. So that should be coming up on your screen. So 97% of people do use RB209 for nutrient management planning, which I'm sure our first speakers will be uh, very pleased to, to know. The next poll is how you access RB209. So do you primarily use a hard copy publication? Do you use an online PDF or do you prefer a PDF, um, an app format? So again, you can click the poll, which is coming up on Poll EV to see there. You can see all the results coming in on uh, my screen down here. Um, so we can take a look at the results there again, please. So primarily, most people, hopefully that will come up, um, is online PDF, which is interesting. 58% online PDF and 31% hard copy publication um, and very few people using an app. So moving on to the research, the first project covered today by Steve Hode from SRUC looks at nitrogen and sulfur fertiliser management um, to achieve grain protein quality targets for high yielding winter milling wheat. So, Steve, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Fiona. So, as just been explained, the first presentation is in relation to quality in milling wheat and how we use fertiliser, in particular sulphur and nitrogen. So, the report has just recently been published and here is the, the front page, so I'd uh, urge you to, to look at this, but also in context of our recent research, such as the reviews of how we use fertiliser at, uh, certainly nitrogen, at uh, high fertiliser uh, prices. I'll refer to some other examples of recent research during the presentation. So as background to the work, we were involved with a, a large project team led by NIAB, so uh, uh, Nathan Morris at NIAB, but also very strong support from the, the milling and baking sector through Mark uh, Charlton at uh, ATC, and the other lead author was uh, Duncan Robertson at, at Agri. But you can also see we had strong representation from the breeders as well as fertiliser companies and agronomists. So in terms of our background and the research questions, I've just outlined the details on, on this slide. Essentially what we wanted to do was, was to understand whether we would need to make changes to practice, considering that the uh, newer, high-yielding uh, Group 1 and Group 2 varieties might respond uh, differently to the way they utilise nitrogen and, uh, and, and sulphur. 
So these are some of the key questions. And what you'll see here, certainly from the middle point there, we had a strong link to quality. So I think a significant aspect of this project was really linking the agronomy all the way through to dough rheology and baking performance. So I'll just start with just a brief part of the review work that we took. Now in the PDF that will become available, there will be two additional slides that you can look at with uh, recent um, research reviews uh, by S Susie Rock's uh, leading one and other works by authors uh, Shuri uh, Sugu and, uh, and Curtis. So please look at these um, at, at, at your leisure. So in this first slide here, what you can see is for a run of years, the difference in the amount of nitrogen applied to milling wheat, milling winter wheat and non-milling wheat here. And so you can see that um, the difference between the two over the five years is uh, 24 ki kilos of nitrogen per hectare. Now that's less than the additional 40 kilos that's currently recommended in the nutrient management uh, guidelines. The 24 is actually quite close to previous research that suggested that um, uh, 25 kilos was sufficient to uh, raise protein by about half percent. But we'll touch on this a bit more um, uh, later in the presentation. Reasons for the difference between the nutrient management guidelines and what we see in the table. We couldn't discover one particular answer, but it, it's likely to be the way that farmers perceive their nitrogen becomes available through the soil end supply. It may be uh, understanding of the varieties perhaps needs to re, uh, be improved in terms of the way they capture and, and utilize um, nitrogen. So we'll cover some of these aspects as we go through the slides. Another part of the review, and this is, this is a key point here, if you, if you look at the, um, the left-hand side, this is from the, the HDB's quality survey. You'll see that when we've got a high spec here in terms of um, specific weight, protein, and Hagberg, you can see that the proportion of the crop, proportion of the samples achieving all of those features together is only about a third. So specific weight, Hagberg's doing pretty well, but protein, only about a third of samples reaching that level. What last year's results showed is that the, the spec, for, certainly for, for protein, was lower than, it, than, than in previous years. And we're trying to partly explain how we can um, offset some of these seasonal and sometimes site effects by the way we think about uh, the fertilizer management, uh, particularly nitrogen. So onto our project. We had a range of sites, growing conditions, over three seasons and two main series of trials. Nitrogen, which was timing and uh, rate. And then we had nitrogen with uh, variation in, in sulfur uh, rates and timings as well. You can see we've got three of the leading um, milling varieties here. So two from uh, group one and one, one from group two. And then the measurements we made went from grain quality through to processing, so rheology and test baking. And we also looked at the production of asparagine as well. So this is in relation for the potential that during processing the acrylamide can, can be produced. This is the structure of the treatments for the nitrogen fertilizer uh, timing and rate work. So here you can see that we we reference uh, RB209 throughout, and then we made adjustments around that. So plus 40, uh, plus 80, and at a maximum of plus 120. And you can see that we've got different timings for ammonium nitrate application, and then we've got a late folate application as well during the um, uh, grain, grain filling stage. Here, this is the, the yield response to those different nitrogen rates and timings. Now, as expected, we didn't get any significant difference above the standard, so the RB209 uh, level here, but we, we just wanted to check to reference the yield change 
which was small in relation to the change in protein that, that we certainly got with, with our treatments. Okay, so you can see that um, there, there was a small increase, certainly with the um, ammonium uh, nitrate um, application, but, but it, this wasn't significant once we get to that level of fertilizer input. So when we look at quality now, so this is grain uh, protein percentage here. So we've got the three varieties, and on the left-hand side, you can see the range of treatments as well. You can see that we've got this uh, gradual increment as we go up in the amount of nitrogen that, that, that's applied. If we look to RGT Skyfall at the RB209 um, row there, that that particular percentage is, is fairly consistent with what we might expect under the RB209 um, amount of nitrogen that, that, that's applied. So that amount of um, pr protein it will be fairly typical and the, the Zyat and Siskin values are perhaps a little bit under what we might uh, expect. The right hand side just shows the, the increments there uh, with um, e each of the treatments. Just to look at this in another way, in, in graphical form, you can see on the left-hand side the change in, in, in protein. There's a slightly different um, response uh, among varieties. And on the grain offtake um, side, the, the grain nitrogen side uh, in total there, you can, again, you can see the trend. So the continual increment as we've increased the um, uh, nitrogen uh, dose, but also there's uh, a response, an extra response to the late applied nitrogen as, as foliar nitrogen. We wanted to bring in other measures of quality and it's really quite clear that we have to consider specific weight, especially uh, along with Hagberg, when we're thinking about milling quality and processing quality. You can see from this slide different sites and variation in specific weight. Very large site season effects here. Varieties were consistent in their performance according to the recommended list of rank order. And you can see that we had some quite challenging years where we, we weren't up to the UK FM um, um, threshold level. So uh, a mixture there in um, specific weight levels. But that was quite useful because when it came to processing, we could really tease out the value of specific weights as part of this uh, story of, of optimizing um, fertilizer management. Hagberg falling number here, again, quite a range of different responses across the sites. So this actually influenced the sites that we chose to go forward for, um, for processing. This particular slide, we can actually spend quite a bit of time on, actually. But, uh, but briefly, what, what this is showing on the x-axis here, we're showing the grain uh, nitrogen uptake in relation to the end that was applied. And on the y-axis, we've got yield in relation to the nitrogen that was taken up. So these are components of what we call nitrogen use efficiency. Now, the key thing here is that it's the site season influence. So you can see these clusters, the different sites in the different colors. It's the site season effect. It's, it's really highly variable. So our challenge really then is to be able to influence uh, the uh, efficiency of, of the growing system, improving quality, but improving efficiency by taking into account the appropriate variety choice and the way that variety is, is managed. The negative slopes that we can see in some of those trends relates to the, um, the lower levels of efficiency that we tend to get at the, at the higher levels of nitrogen input. Just moving on to sulfur now, so this is just a brief um, summary of the, the way we uh, applied the treatments across, across these uh, multiple sites. And again, we used ammonium nitrate as well as folia N as well. Now, in terms of yield, there was no consistent yield response of the different sulfur treatments you can see on the uh, left-hand side here. This particular slide is actually for, for, for protein. So we tended to get um, uh, a small protein response over uh, zero application of um, 
uh, of sulphur here, but, but, but this, this was non-significant. Now, this is, it is probably because uh, our sites were perhaps uh, not uh, so deficient in, in sulphur during these um, growing seasons. Just on to asparagine here, just got the range of asparagine levels. So asparagine is, is an amino acid um, in, in the grain. And as I said before, um, high levels of, of asparagine can during process, processing lead to um, uh, high levels of, uh, of acrylamide. And the asparagine concentrations here are typical of those that have previously been recorded in research such as that by uh, Tanya Curtis. Again, at our sites, there was no significant difference in asparagine um, uh, across the, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the sulfur fertilizer treatments or between the varieties. You can see that there's a small um, increase in concentration of asparagine in Skyfall, a small negative in, in, in Zyot, but, but this, this wasn't uh, significant uh, across the different treatments. On to just rheology and baking now. This particular slide uh, summarises the samples that were taken across the different um, uh, sites or, or so, certainly seasons and, and varieties. And you can see some of the measurements that we uh, made. The, the phrenograph measure is, is actually uh, a measure that's made to, to look at the, 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 the dough uh, qu quality, the, the way it mixed mixes and particularly its, its, its stability. So we included this, this measure along with um, uh, um, dough uh, elasticity and extensibility as well. This slide is particularly important because it shows grain protein on the x-axis with flour protein on the, on, on the y-axis. So this is a typical loss between those two uh, particular uh, measures. But um, What's really important here is that um, once, once milled, um, flour proteins were significantly increased at the higher end doses. And certainly good specific weight contributed to having good uh, flour extraction. And we can see that from this slide here, where we've got four slides on the left-hand side, and then some quality measures um, you can see at the top there. So you can actually see that where specific weight is significantly compromised, we start to lose flour extraction rates and also um, increase protein loss. Just on uh, rheology now, just um, working towards uh, f finishing up now, you can see here in the top um, figure, this is protein across the range of different treatments. And you can see a trend here where uh, flour proteins were higher as, as the um, nitrogen uh, was increased, particularly where we were using foliar uh, urea. And you can see the figure, there is a difference there, certainly 11.2 to 11.8% uh, there. The bottom figure shows one of the quality measures that, that, that I mentioned here. Uh, not great significant difference uh, along here, but certainly this was really establishing the relative strengths and weaknesses of individual varieties, and certainly shows um, a variety like Skythor with, with strong gluten that does perform um, consistently well. Just completing now, just a little bit more on the, on the individual varieties here. So we've got the extensor graph, so a measure of uh, resistance and, ex and uh, extensibility in the top figure, and then a bread score in, in the lower figure here. And again, you can see the key role that variety plays in having consistency in these uh, very, very key um, measures. And just to return now to an aspect of the ammonium nitrate versus the foliar urea effect, certainly from the nitrogen trials here, um, we, we found that there was, there was no um, compromise, there was no significant negative effect when we were applying foliar urea. So we wanted to make uh, sure that we, we tested the, 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 this effect. And if anything, the use of foliar urea, the late applied foliar urea, um, the sample was at least as good as the, the other um, uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, fertilizer through uh, ammonium nitrate. So you can see here with things like the low scores and the bread scores be, being very similar. Likewise, 
doing a very similar comparison from um, samples from the sulfur trials, you can see that the foliurea actually did um, uh, relatively well for, the, for those samples, both in terms of the farinograph, extensograph, and the, uh, and, and the final baking scores. So I think that's, uh, that's kind of a positive message there coming through for that particular way of, of applying um, fertilizer. So just um, a, a minute on, on the rec um, recommendations and messages. Certainly, we, we felt from our review, it's really important that we, um, we consider the, the, the soil end supply aspect of, of our story here when, we, when we're considering site variation in, in protein uh, content. In terms of grain uh, quality responses here, you can see the figures I've got in the slide. Um, so, so you can see we're, we're staying with this um, idea of around about plus 40 um, kilos of, uh, of, um, of nitrogen for a 0.5% increase in, um, in protein. Moving on to, to sulfur here, as I say, we had no strong responses uh, to sulfur across our, our, our treatments, but we are suggesting that um, where there is a deficiency in sulfur application, the evidence suggests that uh, this can minimise the, um, the, the negative effects of, of asparagine. And, and then finally here, the key thing is to consider all of the characteristics of quality, not, not just protein, but also specific weight in, in particular. And certainly the bullet point there that says that um, processing performance, when all the attributes are, um, are, are optimised, means we can have flexibility in the, in the actual grain protein concentration. That's a very good point going forward and could have a key role to play when it comes to the nitrogen use efficiency story. So I'll just leave you with the with acknowledgements to, to the project team and all the various contributions that, that they made. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Steve. It was great to uh, hear the impact of looking at uh, ammonium nitrate and folia urea. That's actually something we're looking at at the Strategic Cereal Farm Scotland, which Steve is working with us on that project, looking to see how different nitrogen applications affect uh, crop development and quality. So next up, we have got Sarah Clark from ADAS, who is going to be covering uh, nitrogen and sulphur use for oats. This project came from a 2016 review of RB209, which highlighted the need for additional research on winter and spring oats. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really good to be here today. Uh, my name's Dr Sarah Clark. I'm a crop physiologist at ADAS. And uh, as we've heard, I'm going to be talking about uh, nutrient management for oats, for winter and spring oats, for yield and quality. I've put this presentation together with Catherine Howarth, who's based at Abris with the University, who's developed most of the quality aspects of this report. So as you may well know, there's an increasing demand for oats um, and also there's been in increasing supply by growers responding to this demand. We're not seeing any slowing down of this increasing demand, but I think we need to uh, satisfy this demand, not just by growing more oats, but also by thinking about the quality of those oats that we're producing. Achieving quality specifications is really important for milling oats. There's a couple of aspects that we usually see uh, when we have to uh, uh, grow oats for quality. The first thing is specific weight. The recommended list threshold that we see is over 52 kilos per hectolitre, although that may vary depending on your contract and the miller that you're working with. <clears throat> and then also screenings is another important aspect. And we want screenings levels to be below about 6%, but again, this may vary. 
it can be quite difficult for some growers to achieve these quality specifications, especially specific weight. And certainly in areas like East Anglia, growing spring oats can lead to some lower quality if the dry springs that we've been seeing continue. There are also other parameters that are really important to the millers. Uh, one of those is kernel content. So that's the percentage of the kernel um, to the whole grain, which includes the husk. And then the other is the ease of dehulling. And this is really important to millers because uh, an easily dehulled oat makes milling a lot smoother and quicker and more efficient. So we need to think about how these may be affected by fertiliser inputs. They're obviously affected by variety, but we've also been thinking in a project about how it can be impacted by fertiliser. So when we last looked at the oats data available for RB209 back in 2016, we found that there was rather a lack of information about oats. We found that there was not enough data to derive robust recommendations for winter oats. But what we did see was that actually there seemed to be, uh, end rates seemed to be too low for what uh, the optimum nitrogen rates were, were for the trials where we looked. So we've actually increased the uh, nitrogen recommendations for all SNS indices and all soil types um, by 40 kilos. So that was done after the 2016 review. There weren't any data on winter oats nitrogen timings, nor were there any data on spring oats rates or timings, and there was nothing on sulphur either. So uh, there is obviously a need for further understanding. So in 2018, um, AHD commissioned a project with the aim of providing advice on appropriate rates and timings of nitrogen plus sulphur uh, for both winter and spring oats. And as well as looking at yield, quality was a really important aspect of that. The project was led by us at ADAS and the lead on the quality aspects was Aberystwyth University. We were really lucky to get really good engagement from the whole oat supply chain, from breeders to millers and everybody in between. And I'd like to thank them for all their contributions because we wouldn't have managed to achieve what we have done without them. So what we did in the project is that we looked at a number of different trials, both on winter oats and on spring oats. So for winter oats, we had two seasons worth of trials. And you can see in the map here on the right, the blue markers show the locations of the winter oats trials. So they were carried out in Herefordshire and North Nottinghamshire. And we had three varieties in each of those trials. Uh, Muscani, which was and continues to be the most popular milling oat variety. Uh, RGT Southwark and also Penrose. For spring oats, we carried out trials in Scotland and the east of England, and they're marked by the green markers on the map. So we had three seasons of spring oats trials, and we looked at three varieties at each of the sites. So in Scotland, we looked at Canyon, WP Elian, and Conway, but in the east of England, we swapped the Conway for Aspen. So in each of these sites, we had two lots of experiments. We had one experiment which looked at six nitrogen rates, which meant we could fit a nitrogen response curve and calculate the economic optimum nitrogen rate. And we also had six nitrogen timings. Um, and also included a sulphur treatment as well. We also were lucky enough to have additional trials hosted by the project partners 
including ones in uh, West Wales and in Ireland. Unfortunately, I haven't got time today to talk you through all the results of the project. So I'm just going to summarise some of the results that we found. So firstly, I'm going to look at the winter oats results. So we have here in the table uh, winter oats results from the notes, uh, which is what we call this project, the core trials for this project, and also the additional trials. And that included partner trials within the project and other trials that we were able to take from other sources. So in this first column, we have the average recommended nitrogen rate, which would have come from RB209 uh, for the core notes trials and the additional trials. So they were quite similar, the average at 175 and 168 kilos of N per hectare. Uh, and you can see the range there in brackets. The following column shows the average actual optimum N rates, N opts, uh, and the ranges for the core notes trials and the additional trials. You can see that for the additional trials, the actual optimum N rates were very similar to what had been recommended by RB209, but the range was a lot larger. However, in the core notes trials, we found really low optimum N rates. And there's a couple of reasons for this. In Herefordshire, we had quite a lot of lodging, which affected the shape of the curve and what the optimum N rate was calculated to be. In Nottinghamshire, we had really dry springs, and it's a really sandy site. So actually, we weren't able to achieve the yields and the optimum N rates that we were hoping. We also saw variety differences, but there weren't actually any interactions. You can see from the last column there that the yields were generally pretty good and there were some quite high yields achieved in some of those experiments. So we can see that from certainly the additional trials, the actual optimum end rates were pretty similar to what those have been recommended by RB209. But we then thought whether not the nitrogen requirements actually vary according to yield. In RB209 at the moment, there is no standard yield for oats as there is for wheat and barley. And there's also not a relationship or an adjustment uh, to N rate based on yield. But we wondered whether this should be applied to oats. And when we looked at the data, we found that actually there was a significant positive response between yield and the optimum N rate. So it is looking like there should be those yield adjustments. Then we thought a bit about the effect of uh, nitrogen rate on quality in the winter oats trials. We looked at how the nitrogen affects the plant architecture and increasing yield, but this can have a detrimental effect on quality sometimes. So we see when we increase nitrogen applications, we get an increased number of grains per metre squared. And this is a result of increased panicle numbers and also the increased numbers of grains per panicle. Unfortunately, sometimes in oats, when you increase this grain number, not all the grains can be filled effectively. So actually you end up with a lower thousand grain weight, higher screenings and a lower specific weight. And this is what we saw uh, when we increased the nitrogen rate in some of the winter oats trials. We looked at uh, the three different varieties. You can see here the Muscani, Penrose and Southwark. Um, and we looked at the effect on specific weight in the graph on the left and screenings in the graph on the right. And you can see in the graph on the left that as you increase nitrogen rates, uh, specific weights do decrease. Um, however, there is a variety interaction and you can see that Muscani um, and Penrose maintain their specific weight um, more effectively than Southwark. 
But at the uh, nitrogen rates that we generally look at, specific weights are still sufficient. When we looked at screenings in the graph on the right, we can see again that there is a variety interaction where Muscani is maintaining its uh, low level of screenings. When we looked at timings, uh, we found uh, a number of interesting uh, things. The, in the graph on the left, you can see from a combined analysis, we got some variable yields and significant differences depending on when we apply the nitrogen, which is shown in the table below. The first treatment on the left is RB209 standard treatments, and the one on the far right is RB209, but without sulphur. We found significant variety and treatment effects, and we also found that nitrogen at tillering, so the third and the fifth treatment, um, if you don't include those, you do get uh, a reduced yield and also quality. Sulphur was important for yield, but only where it was likely to be deficient. So the Nottinghamshire site, which was very light, um, we saw that no sulphur was detrimental to yield. However, the sulphur didn't affect quality. But overall, for winter oats, RB209 timing seems to be um, a good solution. For spring oats, uh, this is a similar graph, a uh, similar table again, uh, looking at the average recommended N rate and the actual optimum N rates. For both the core and the additional trials, the average recommended nitrogen rate was very similar, um, although again there were some um, different ranges. Whereas if you looked at the actual optimum rate, they were similar for the core and the additional trials, but they're all about 30 kilos more on average than what would have been recommended in RB209. And you can see the ranges there were very large. We saw some very high optimum rates and very high yields for the spring oats. But actually, when we looked at the relationship between optimum N rate and yield, there wasn't a significant relationship, which was quite surprising. I think we do need a bit more research on spring oats. In terms of spring oats rate on quality, again, we're seeing uh, a reduction in specific weight in the blue lines here uh, when you increase the N rates. The graph on the left is uh, the result of the Scottish site and the one on the right is the result of the East Anglian site. And you can see the one on the right, the specific weights are generally lower. And so when you are increasing N rates, you are getting lower than optimal specific weights. We found some inconsistent results uh, for the spring oats, nitrogen, timing and sulphur and nothing in half of the trials. We found that where differences were evident um, on yield, uh, the highest yields were actually when all the nitrogen had been applied to the seed bed. And at one site, the yield significantly reduced where no nitrogen was applied in the seed bed. Looking at the quality, again, seed bed nitrogen did seem to be important and it did lead to higher specific weights and 1,000 grain weights. So thinking about the key messages from this project, um, we're looking at the winter oats nitrogen rates. It appears that the current recommendations are appropriate. However, for quality, variety choice is very important and it does appear that Muscani is stable in terms of its quality. We have proposed to the RB209 working group to move to more of a system as per the spring barley uh, system, looking at um, adjusting for yield and SNS index. For winter oats nitrogen timings, it does again appear that the current times timings are appropriate for both yield and also in terms of quality. And it's quite important to 
apply some nitrogen at tillering. For spring oats nitrogen rates, the recommendations generally appear to be about 30 kilos of N per hectare too low. There's no clear evidence that high yielding crops need more nitrogen, um, but quality might be reduced with higher N rates um, at sites in East Anglia. I think more research is needed. In terms of spring oats nitrogen timings, having a good proportion in the seed bed is really important. We're still waiting to hear back from the RB209 working group as to what changes will be adopted uh, into the next version of RB209, which should be coming early next year. Um, but hopefully we'll hear about that soon and we can let you know. Thank you very much for listening and um, I'll look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. We have had quite a few questions come in for Steve and Sarah, which will be covered in the panel session after our next speaker. So based on RB209 guidance, Mark Topliff and his team at AHDB have developed a tool which brings in RB209 guidance as well as fertiliser and grain price to suggest potential um, adjustments to nitrogen. So I'll hand over to Mark to tell you some more. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, yes, I'm going to take you through what this calculator that we've created is, is all about, if you do not know it already, um, but hopefully a lot of you are already aware of its uh, existence and are using it. But I'm just going to start by going through some analysis, really, around fertiliser usage, uh, using some data that we have available to us, but just to try and put into context the, the situation in which we're seeing the, the input prices at the moment and the impact on cost of production. Uh, we've just done some analysis looking at farm bench data. Um, farm bench is our HDB benchmarking tool, which uh, is, is available for anyone to use. It's based online. And when we look at the last five years, the cost production figures um, for the middle 50% performance anyway are 6% rise uh, for those combinable crop uh, sort of, um, enterprises. Looking at 2022, we're seeing probably a, a rise of about 15% in the cost of production based on what we've seen in terms of those input prices increasing as the, as the harvest year went on, really. And looking into sort of 2023 and ahead to that, we're probably going to see another sort of 30-odd percent increase in cost of production uh, because we're going to have a, a full year probably of these elevated input prices. Particularly looking at uh, winter wheat margins and the effect on that uh, in terms of the far bench figures, we could see uh, an increase in those margins of about 80%, we estimate, for the 2022 harvest year. But for next year then, it's probably going to fall uh, by around about sort of two-thirds um, for those middle 50% performers because of those high uh, prices uh, of inputs and the fact that they are um, impacting more significantly this year. So I don't think we need too much reminder about where we are in terms of fertiliser prices and, and the trends that we've seen recently, but this is just a, a reminder of some background of what we have seen. So certainly in terms of the ammonium nitrate prices, compared to this time 12 months ago, they were up 48% uh, and up even further than that if you go back further. Uh, and from the, the DAP, it's, that's up around about 46%. So um, some significant increases even just 12 year, months ago. But what's the impact of that on uh, fertiliser costs then? And again, using the farm bench figures as a basis for this, uh, we've looked at, well, if you made no changes in terms of the amount of fertiliser applied, what would be the, the fertiliser cost per hectare? So we looked at each of the uh, crops here that we can see on the screen, and uh, these are the actual fertiliser cost results that we saw for the 2021 harvest year. Uh, for each of those, so you can see it ranges from about £124 per hectare up to about 205 depending on, on the crop type. But then if we sort of lay up uh, next to that the, the cost of the fertiliser purchases which were made either in the sort of summer, so around May, June time, versus those purchases that were made in the autumn time, uh, what would be the impact of those, those purchases would be on the actual fertiliser costs? So this is the... Uh, 2022 estimated costs uh, if you bought the fertiliser back in summer 2021 and if we added on the, 
the, the purchase costs of in autumn, um, you'd have an even more significant increase in those fertiliser costs. So we're looking at a range of about 60 to 247 to pounds per hectare uh, difference uh, over what we saw the prices in 2021. So some quite significant uh, in increases in there, as long as there was no quantity changes. But we do know that some growers did cut back on their fertiliser usage, but it did vary uh, from farm to farm. Just thought it'd be interesting to show this little bit of analysis, again, using farm bench data. And this is looking at inorganic nitrogen applied kilos per hectare versus winter feed wheat yield tons per hectare. Uh, and this is something I've seen replicated with other data. Uh, I know ADAS have sort of shown this data before now, but it's just to re-emphasise the fact that we don't see this strong relationship when you just look at inorganic nitrogen versus yield. And this is looking at particular data of, uh, on clay soils over the, uh, over the years 2018 to 2021. So it's um, a relatively tight set of data. Um, but it's not unusual, but it, it just shows there's so many other factors that are in play that influence that relationship between the amount of nitrogen applied and yield. What we're looking at here now is looking at those farm bench data, that farm bench data but splitting out the, the top 25% versus the bottom 25% based on net margin performance and the sort of amount of nitrogen applications that they have in each of those groups on average. So you can see there, starting at the top, that yield is, is slightly high for the top 25%, just over one uh, tonnes per hectare. The amount of nitrogen applied is slightly high as well. But when you sort of do a sort of look at the, the ratio of the amount of nitrogen applied per yield, then you can see actually the top 25% apply slightly less per tonne of uh, yield. Look at total fertiliser costs. They also spent a little bit less on fertiliser as well, about six pounds per hectare. And when you split that out, that total fertiliser cost split that out proportionally between inorganic, organic and trace elements. They also, as a percentage of that cost, spent less on inorganic fertiliser and more on organic. So it's interesting to see the sort of the way that that, that top performing group was using um, fertiliser to get the, the yields that they did. So that was just looking at a little bit of analysis of, of interest. Uh, what I'm going to go on to now is explain a little bit more about the calculator that we've created. And of course, it's based on the Nutrient Management Guide RB209. Within that, there's the a table, of course, which shows the, uh, the changes or the adjustments that you make depending on prices of, of uh, fertiliser and, uh, and grain. And um, this, is, this calculator is really just taking it one step further so you can put in your figures and get a bespoke result out. Um, and that tool can be found on the tools page of the HDB website, so it's very easy to find. And uh, just go down to the Nitrogen Fertiliser Adjustment Calculator on that tools page. The basis for the calculator, just to give some background to that, it's, it's using the, the algorithms which created the tables within the RB209 publication, uh, which is all based on the economic optimum end rate. And uh, one of the key aspects of that calculation is look at the break-even ratio here. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm sure, a chart you're familiar with, uh, which um, we, we, we've used as the basis to calculate those impacts on the adjustments to the recommendations. Currently, the RB209 uses recommendations based on a, a break-even ratio of 5 to 1 for cereals and 2.5 for oilseed rape. Of course, we've seen much higher ratios than that uh, this last year or so and uh, they've been up around sort of 10 to 1 uh, for seals, for example. Uh, one thing I just wanted just to point out before I sort of go into explain how the calculator works, is just to say that the calculator is not there to calculate what the recommended nitrogen application rate should be. Um, it's there to look what the adjustment in the application should be. So if you download that tool, uh, I do encourage you uh, to download it again uh, if you haven't done it for a little while because it has been updated um, over the years, we've improved it and made adjustments. So uh, if you haven't uh, sort of made any, any uh, recent downloads of it, then do go in and get the latest version. Uh, this is what you see as you, as you open up the tool. And this is just an introduction to that and just to give some background. Uh, and then if you click on the main uh, tab on that calculator, it's just an Excel spreadsheet. What you'll see there is the um, function to be able to put in three cereal crops and three oilseed crops side by side within this tool so you can do some side by side comparisons. But let's just focus in on doing one crop or so on one of those sections. It's very easy, there's just two very simple steps really. 
So firstly, if we look at a cereal crop, you, you, you select the type of crop that you are looking at uh, and put in the fertiliser price. Uh, that could be anything. And then put the content of the nitrogen in, within that fertiliser percentage. And your expected uh, sale price of the grain as well. And what that does is just those simple figures. It calculates that cost of that fertiliser as a pound per kilo of nitrogen. But most importantly, it calculates the, the break-even ratio. And that will then allow us to work out through the algorithms in the background how much to decrease the, or increase, it could be the other way as well, uh, the recommended amount of nitrogen application. So in this case, using these figures, it recommends uh, a decrease of 40 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. What it also calculates is the uh, effect on yield and on crop income using those figures that have been inputted above and also the expected uh, reduction in nitrogen fertiliser cost as well. Now you can put in a two further fields, uh, which are the recommended nitrogen rate, so the, the rate which typically you might have used on this crop or, or looking to use on this crop, and also the area planted. And that then calculates two further uh, figures, which is one, adjusting your nitrogen application rate, and also the amount of product required for the area being grown. So very simple, very straightforward, uh, and gives you some really uh, sort of useful, I think, uh, figures there to be able to apply to those crops. So that's, that's it in terms of the calculator. Look forward to the questions. Here's just a range of tools which are available. So do take a look uh, and do uh, go into the, the latest version of the adjustment calculator. And uh, yeah, welcome any feedback on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's a very interesting tool and I'm sure lots of you listening will be looking forward to trying that out if you haven't already. So now we are going to head to our third panel session of the day with all of our speakers from this session. We've had questions come in on PollEV at pollev.com forward slash AHDB. You can thumbs up or thumbs down particular questions to affect where they are in the ranking. So we'll hand, it, hand over to Anna for the panel session. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, fantastic presentation. So we'll jump straight into the questions. And um, the first question I'm going to ask actually isn't the one that's just on the screen before us. I'm going to start with a bit more of a context setting one. Um, how long does it take to update RB209 guidance? And should we be using the research findings already now before they're ratified? Um, well, I think AHDB are updating RB209 more frequently nowadays. It used to be that we did one huge update every number of years, but mm -hmm. now there are annual updates. And so any research findings that are um, found to be really useful to update RB209 can more quickly be, go into um, updates. Uh, so I think the, the research that... I've done on oats. Um, we've made proposals to the RB209 committee, so hopefully some of, some of those can be taken up uh, for next spring. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. I suppose that highlights the importance of looking out for that online version of RB209, seeing if there are any changes because your booklet might not be completely up to date if you haven't got the latest one. Um, so the next question is then, what are the next steps for the research projects that you've talked about? Um, okay, I'll Steve go first. <laughs> um, so I think we found some really useful snippets for winter oats um, in terms of uh, rates and timings and also in terms of spring oats uh, timings particularly. I think there are more questions that we have particularly on spring oats so it would be great if we could carry on that funding. There is no current project but if we could um, gain more funding for that, I think it would be really helpful. Thank you, Sarah. Steve? Yeah, I see that in, in relation to another question that looks like it's, it's, just, it's just popped up. But I, I think it's about the way we, we can use emerging technologies to improve the decision-making during the season as well, particularly in relation to the nitrogen that might become available mm -hmm. during the season. And if we, we can use both the crop and the soil as indicators of that and that's something we're we're hoping to develop on the basis of our strategic farm work with HDB but I, I think this this has a lot of um, potential linking groundwork with remote sensing so I think that's yeah. the exciting opportunity that there 
That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want to expand on that, Steve, in terms of the work? The question we have um, in front of us is about real-time decision support tools, so SAP testing, SPAD testers, and kind of how, how do growers gain confidence in using those? Yeah, we're doing quite a lot on the, the SAP testing and the nutrient testing. And the real frustration, really, is, is the time it takes to get results back. Okay. So even, even a fantastic lab uh, that, that we might work with, it, it can take two weeks to get results back. Um, mm. So we're trying to do things in real time using SPAD, bricks, and other techniques like that. And things that we can do on the ground that might be amenable to being sensed remotely. I, th I think that's, that's the key. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Does Sarah, do you have anything to add no, to that? that yeah, thank you very much. Okay, and the next question is about how, well, this is it's a tricky question to answer, but how, how do you make sure when you translate trials data into advice on end rates, um, given the variability between seasons and sites, that you, you're confident that it's, you know, the, it's good advice? Yeah, it's really difficult. And uh, we spend a long time agonising about all these questions. Um, we do find increasingly uh, dry springs is now the norm and we're finding some sites which are very variable and we're seeing differences across the country um, and so I think the best that we can do is to uh, collate all the data that we have. Uh, we've analysed the data statistically so we can be confident with individual results um, and then we do have tools available to combine and do meta-analysis of whole sets of data, mm -hmm. though we can be a bit more confident with those as well. But I agree, it, it is difficult. And I think acknowledging your experience in farming on particular land is really helpful and just getting to know um, what's likely to happen mm -hmm. and how to adjust is really important. Thank you. And I guess a linked question to that would be, how, how, where do you see the role of on-farm trials and maybe expanding that data set for your use? Yeah, I think that on-farm trials are really useful to understand in a particular context what mm. can be helpful. Certainly on nitrogen, um, we are looking at uh, lots of different um, inputs in terms of biostimulants and other products that people can use. Or if it's really good for the LEARN project, which we did for HDB a few years ago, we looked at uh, on-farm trials where farmers tested their standard end rate with 50 kilos more or 50 kilos less. Mm -hmm. And then we could see whether or not that was having an impact on the yield and also the quality. So I think there's a huge role for on-farm trials to play. Fantastic, thank you, Sarah. Um, next question is, could you comment on looking at nitrogen use efficiency from the previous year when planning nitrogen use in terms of using it as a decision support tool? I think you can build up um, aspects of nitrogen use efficiency over time, like, like with other measures. Mm -hmm. And I think with the, the, the figure that I showed, most of the variation in those components of NUE were site and season. Mm -hmm. And I think some, some farms, say if we take a, a, a wheat milling, quality milling um, farm, that they will have more, perhaps more consistency in, in achieving uh, the, 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 pro, the protein spec okay. and being perhaps more, more efficient in the way that they, they're using inputs. And uh, so, it, so it's getting a feel, I think, for the uh, records over time, perhaps particular fields on, on farms and placing the rotation, th this kind of thing. Okay. Okay, fantastic. I think also it's really useful to be able... There, there's lots of different nitrogen use efficiency metrics and... Lots of people mean different things when they say NUE, which makes life a bit difficult. One thing that we're advocating more and more now is looking at grain um, testing to understand whether you fertilised correctly the previous season. And that's now in RB209 in terms of phosphorus grain pea concentration as well. OK, thank you very much both. Next question is about mealing wheat protein. Um, so should the requirements be lower to help reduce the need for large doses of nitrogen trying to hit the 13% protein? 
wants to take that one? Th th this came up when um, Nathan Morris presented to, to, to the technical group. Okay, yes. So, so the view is that um, if we if we could cope with that sort of reduction mm -hmm. and still maintain the quality of of the end products, then that that could be a you know a real step step forward. And I think that's something that is being looked at both in the UK and on the continent as well. So trying to, and I think it's really mm -hmm. trying to join up all the other characteristics that go into make a good, you know, a good a dough and, 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 and then a final, final product. Mm -hmm. So I think, I believe that's, that is beginning to be investigated now, but, mm -hmm. um, but that, that is, I think that's, that's a key area. That's good, yeah, yeah taking a holistic view on, yeah. on quality. Fantastic. Um, another question we have for Mark. Um, just to clarify on the nitrogen adjustment tool, can it be used for milling wheat and oats? So yes, it can. It can be used for those. And yeah. uh, what we've also got in there is uh, there's a separate tab. It's got some guidance which is being pulled out from the RB209 uh, about those as well and some of the latest advice that ADAS has sort of, um, done in their latest reports as well. So that's in there uh, all in one place. So you can yes. pull that Because if you look at oats, um, Mark showed the figure of the relationship between the break-even ratio and the adjustment. And there is a line for cereals and a line for um, all seed rape. There, there it should be another line for oats, which is now incorporated no into the tool right. as well. Yep. So the, the, the standard nitrogen response curve for wheat and barley is different to oats. So we've made different yep. adjustments for oats. Fantastic, good, thank you. The next question is about increasing uh, nitrogen use efficiency by substituting soil applied nitrogen with foliar nitrogen. The question is, would you support this approach? I think we need more information. We don't have, we don't have a good uh, experimental data set to be able to answer that question at the moment. We certainly don't. I okay. think NUE opportunities, it, it depend, depends on the end use. So, um, so a, a bread making wheat is very different to a distilling wheat, where there might be different opportunities to change mm -hmm. the over, overall um, headline a, 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 NUE. But something I neglected to to, to mention was that it, fertilizer efficiency is actually one of the key bits of the story. And I think in terms okay. of um, sort of costs and, and policy, g g going, I think um, capturing more of the fertilizer that's supplied, I think is. Is, okay. is, a, is a key part, really a central part of this. Yes, and do you see the role of, of foliar nitrogen in, in that is being that? it's being looked at um, uh, both on, on on plots plot scale, but also tramline mm -hmm. scale. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Um, perhaps one last question. Um, the question is: Should be, should RB two hundred nine be more regional um, in terms of its nitrogen recommendations and particularly timings? Who'd like to take that one? The role of regional variations, is that practical? Well, I, yeah, we discussed this quite a lot in the notes project, actually, mm -hmm. because we do see huge variation between the Scottish sites and the East Anglian spring oat mm -hmm. sites. And we, we discussed whether we should be looking at things in, on a regional basis. Um, but actually, where we've got to, certainly with the winter oats, is um, thinking in, in a similar way to the spring barley, so looking at um, uh, nitrogen rates being adjusted based on yield and soil nitrogen supply index. And we feel that those would take account of a lot of the things that are um, mm. affecting the different uh, crops in the different regions. So mm. I think... On that basis, that's probably as good as we can get it at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Super. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, the panel, uh, for answering all of our questions and fantastic presentations. Thank you, Steve, Sarah and Mark. Uh, we will now break for a short break and we'll be back at 20 past two. So we'll see you soon.
Welcome back to the fourth and final session of the Agronomist Conference. We've just heard the nutrition research updates and now we're going to look at alternatives to relying on artificial nutrition. First, we've got Henny Louth from the Organic Research Centre, who's going to cover findings from an innovative farmer's field lab on living mulches, of which AHDB was a sponsor, as well as the Live Wheat Project, which tests wheat varieties in low input and organic systems. Over to you, Henny. Afternoon, everyone. I hope you've had um, a really interesting morning. Um, and thank you, Fiona, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so. This afternoon, uh, I'm going to be presenting two sort of case study projects um, as an example of ways that you can reduce your artificial inputs. So I'm going to start with the Living Mulches project. So this was um, sponsored by this is an innovative farmers field lab um, that was sponsored by the HDB. We also worked with Organic Arable and also with Cotswold um, Seeds. And the idea of this field lab was to um, work out if we can successfully direct drill crops into a clover lay. Um, and this has been a three-year project, um, and so we're just coming to the end of its third year. So yeah, as I said, this was looking at the establishment of a semi-permanent forage legume as an understory to cash crop production. Um, so for the trials, we used a... Um, a medium leaf clover and a small leaf clover, so that was Aberace and Aber Herald, and the trial mix was in a 70-30 proportion. So why should we use living mulches? Um, so obviously the title of this is about reducing artificial inputs, um, and living mulches should um, support reducing those inputs. So um, Clover can act as a really good weed control, it can act as a designated weed if you get good ground cover. It's obviously nitrogen fixing, so it works really well for nitrogen accumulation and improving the nutrient cycling. It can also uh, help with the self-regulation of pests and diseases, and um, in organic systems, it can reduce the tillage and enhance the soil um, physical characteristics. With good clover cover, you can also get really good soil protection, um, and this can really help with uh, your soil health also acts as a very good catch crop and has a green manure function and it really can improve your above and below ground biodiversity. So this is by no means the only way that you can implement a living mulch into your system but I just wanted to give an example of a living mulch uh, system in an organic um, cycle. So in the first year this is when you would um, initiate your living mulches so you would you plough, you'd put your spring cereal into the ground and then you'd under sow that spring cereal with clover. Um, then you would harvest your spring cereal in the summer, manage the clover um, through grazing or otherwise, and then you would direct drill your winter cereal into that clover cover. Um, and you would then manage the clover throughout the season, harvest your winter cereal and then theoretically then go into a third cereal direct drilled into that clover. As I said, there are many ways to implement this living mulcher system. This is just an example. So to the trials that we put in place, so these um, so far have only taken place on organic farms. Um, and here we have two examples of how they can be implemented. So in one of the farms we had the living mulch um, in half the field and the control on the other half. Um, and then in our other farm based in Oxfordshire, we had two control strips either side and a living mulch strip down the middle. Uh, we carried out assessments twice during the year, twice, twice during the growing season. So at growth stage 32 and um, at growth stage 65, so um, flowering. So we collected data on clover cover, um, weed cover, crop vigour, crop height, um, and spikelet data, etc. And then we also collected um, yield and quality data uh, for the cash crop at the end of the season. And in October, in the two trial years, we also carried out soil analysis in the mulches and the control. So we've had two trial years so far. So in, uh, in 2020, we established the clover into the spring crop. Um, and then we had winter oats and rye were direct drilled into the clover. We had two farms um, with successful trials. So we had one based in Oxfordshire who had winter oats 
and we had one based in Shropshire, which had winter oats and rye. And in the Oxfordshire trial, they also included a direct drill control, um, so that was without the mulch, but just using a direct drill. And then this year, um, we only had one successful um, trial. So the clover was under sown in spring 2021, um, and then the cash crop was direct drilled in the autumn. And again, this was using winter oats. Uh, this farm also trialled grazing half of their um, mulch and control to see if that would have an effect. On the farm in Oxfordshire, who had had winter oats um, in their living mulch in the winter, they then tried uh, in spring 2022 to put spring oats direct drilled into their um, living mulch, but unfortunately um, that wasn't successful. So onto the results. Um, combining the yield data from 2021 and 2022, uh, we found that the average um, yield difference between the control and the mulch averaged out at about 32%. And obviously farms are businesses and um, this was an, an expected result when we measured the vigour and the height and also the spikelet number, for example. Um, this was an expected result. We had two different results in terms of weed cover. So in 2021, when clover cover was slightly lower, we did find um, a significant increase in weed cover um, in the living mulch system. Um, in 2021, we had the inclusion of the direct drill control, which suggested that the clover did actually help to control the weeds to some extent. However, in 2022, um, where the clover cover was slightly higher, so from about 60% in 2021 to up to 85%, we found an opposite result, and we found that the mulch did have um, lower weed cover, although not quite significant compared to the control. In the trials where we had grazed and ungrazed, um, the oats that were grazed by the sheep over the winter did show um, significantly lower weed cover compared to those that were ungrazed. When we look at the relative weed abundance, um, in both years we did find a move towards slightly more aggressive perennials like your docks and your thistles in the living mulch system. Um, which does suggest that at the moment the system can only really be implemented for one or two years before you would need remedial action to remove those perennials. Um, but in future trials we would like to look at management practices that could help alleviate those issues throughout the season. When we look at the soil health from the two years of the trials, what we found was that over double the available nitrogen was in the mulch compared to the control. Um, and we also found a trend for much higher microbial activity under the living mulch system. And this was seen once again in 2022 as well. Um, and in both years, we also found significantly more earthworms present in the, in the mulch compared to the control. So as you may have seen, there's obviously some grounds for improvement. Um, the yield penalty that we see is obviously not ideal. Um, as well as, as I said, this move towards the more aggressive perennials. Um, so there are um, aspects of the system that we're looking to try and improve. So that's whether we can um, look at different mulch um, species or varieties, whether we can try different um, crop species. Obviously oats are quite competitive, so they're a good um, crop to use, um, as well as rye. We also need to look at potentially different sowing dates um, and particularly mulch management. So that's helping the cash crop get away and reducing the amount of competition that the clover imposes on that cash crop. So whether that's interim mowing, whether that's grazing over the winter, whether that's employing crimping systems. Um, and we also have a trial um, lined up hopefully for the 2023-2024 season that will be looking at um, strip tillage, which should allow the hopefully allow the cash crop to get away from the clover. There are obviously um, other benefits that are perhaps not quite so easy to quantify. So we need to look at the yield versus the, the profit. So we do have this 32% yield penalty, but um, the farmer based in Shropshire did um, added up some of the numbers and found that actually the reduced tillage, um, the uh, reduced cost to his machinery, reduced labour, um, counted for about a 20% um, 
accounted for about 20% of that 30% yield penalty. So really we're just looking at improving that 10% gap that we have at the moment. Um, and for organic systems um, who employ a lay during their rotation, having that extra bonus year of, of cash cropping by incorporating the lay into their cash crop um, could improve and increase their rotation. We also want to look at the rotational benefits. So um, as a nitrogen uh, fixing legume, um, clover can potentially improve the crop the following year. Um, and also those soil health improvements that we saw, the increase in nitrogen, the increase in microbial activity. Um, and we also would like to look at working with water companies um, to see if we can quantify the reduced runoff. Um, so what's next for living mulches? So we have trials um, in place for 2023. So we've got one on organic farm and one on a conventional farm. And then in spring 2023, we hope to be setting up several more um, trials um, to then carry forward into 2024. Um, we'd like to look more at this clover management. Um, so we'll be carrying out um, grazing again over the winter um, and looking to reduce that yield penalty. And we'd also like to look at quantifying those other benefits that I mentioned. So that's Living Mulches, a whistle stop tour. Um, so I'd now like to talk through our live wheat project. Um, so this is a three-year project. Um, well, it's sort of technically five years. So the first two years were called live seed. And the past three years um, have been called live wheat. And these are farm-based organic variety trials. And we're just coming to the end of the third year now. Um, so these are some interim results that I'm going to be showing you. So what were the objectives of this project? Um, so for organic farmers, uh, at the moment, their only real tool um, for improving their crops is variety selection. They don't have the benefits of um, additional inputs that um, conventional farmers have. So at the Organic Research Centre, we wanted to explore how we could improve um, the organic and low input wheat performance and how could we empower the farmers to uh, make variety selections that were better informed. Um, we wanted to look at a multi-performance of these crops, so not just focusing on yield and quality, which obviously are very important, but we also wanted to look at their weed suppression ability, their nutrient use efficiency, their abiotic stress tolerance and how they dealt with diseases and pests. So how are we going to address these objectives? So we wanted to look at the genetics. So we obviously wanted to look at to what extent variety selection um, can uh, help to improve uh, the performance. So what, for what's available on the market and also um, heritage varieties and populations. We also want to look at the environment. So what was the impact of the environment um, on that crop performance? And also what is the impact of different management strategies on that crop performance? So this is just an example of our experimental design. So as I mentioned before, these are on-farm experiments. So we had um, about 15 farms uh, in a network um, across the three years. Um, it varied from year to year. So I think we had between 10 and 15 farms involved each year. Uh, and each of those farmers would have a strip of each variety between six and sort of 24 metres wide and would be the whole length of the field. So these weren't plot-based trials, they were field-based trials. Um, and on the right hand side here, you can see an example of um, how we sort of spread the varieties across those farms. So we had siskin, which was the control, so that was present um, on all of our farms. So on the right hand side, you can see here, that's our network of farms that we had across the country. Um, we found that we had these three management systems that appeared within this network. So we had the organic narrow row system, um, which is sort of 12 to 15 centimetre distance. And then we had the organic wide rows. So these were more like 23 to 36 centimetres. We also had um, included some conventional no-till farms as well. So when you look at the management effects, uh, we found that grain yield, um, protein and nitrogen harvest was uh, higher in the chemical based systems. Um, but only significantly different from the uh, na uh, organic systems for nitrogen harvest. 
When you look at the diseases, we had a huge variation um, on disease severity when you look across the varieties. So it ranged between 0.2% and 40%. Um, so Malika, uh, which is normally a spring-grown crop, we put in the autumn um, and found that that was uh, the, mo the worst affected. Um, in organic systems, we do find that unless varieties are particularly susceptible to diseases, because there are less inputs, we do find they are less um, negatively affected by disease. Um, as expected, we found septoria across um, almost all of the varieties, um, and we found yellow rust quite particularly in Malika and in Gleam. So when you look at the weed abundance, you find the varieties sort of split themselves into three groups. Um, so the ones on the left-hand side of that graph, those are the varieties that were um, had the lowest weed cover, so they show the greatest weed suppression. And then on the right-hand side, you have those varieties that um, showed greater weed cover. And interestingly, in that group, you see Theodore and Dawson. These are two varieties that were uh, sort of highlighted as low input in varieties um, due to their good disease resistance. However, when these are actually put in low input systems, what we find is actually their um, ability to cope with weeds isn't as good um, as these other varieties. And it sort of really highlights that varieties that are supposed to work well in low input systems maybe need to be trialled um, actually on those low input farms. So the next few slides that I'm going to show you will be looking at dynamic stability. Um, so this is looking at how varieties um, perform over sort of a range of environments. So from all of the varieties, we took a subset of those that had at least five occurrences um, across the past three years. And we um, plotted how they performed over a variety of different environments. So um, on the left hand side, it's a low weed cover environment at growth stage 32. And on the right hand side, that's a high weed cover environment. The dotted line that you see through the middle, um, that's siskin, that's our control. So the more, the flatter the line compared to that siskin dotted line, that is a variety that shows greater stability across these environments. So what we found that X days showed um, dynamic stability for weed cover at growth stage 32. So environments that generally tended to be higher weed environments, um, X days showed significantly lower weed cover compared to our siskin control. Crop cover at um, growth stage 32 and at growth stage 65, we found that X days and YQCCP um, showed great st dynamic stability. Um, so at environments that usually had lower crop cover or that Siskin had lower crop cover, both X days and YQ um, showed greater crop cover. Um, for those of you who don't know, YQ is um, also called the ORC Wakelands population. So this is a cross composite population. So it's a gen genetically um, diverse uh, winter wheat variety. When you look at ear density, we found that X days, YQ and Maris Widgeon, which is a um, heritage variety, show dynamic stability for ear density. Um, so in, variety, in environments where uh, ear density tended to be lower, those three showed um, greater ear density. When we look at grain protein, so across the three years, um, YQ and X days both show dynamic stability for grain protein. And what we would potentially take from this is does genetic diversity and that early vigour that we saw from X days, so the good crop cover from X days, does that then translate into better resilience um, in grain protein? In grain yields, so across the organic farms, um, and over the three years, we found that X days had... Um, showed dynamic stability for yield um, compared to the siskin. So as you can see, in environments that tended to have lower grain yields, um, X days had significantly higher than the siskin. So in 2019 and the 2019-2020 and the 2021-22 um, years, these were both characterised by a spring drought. And as I'm sure you remember from the summer of this year, we had those heat waves. Um, so we drew out the information for these two drought years and we found that the dynamic stability, um, there was a dynamic stability advantage for YQ, this diverse population, and for Maris Widgeon, this heritage variety. So we found that historic cultivars and diverse genotypes um, appeared to be more resilient to drought and heat stress. 
which is particularly relevant when you consider the sort of long-term projections for our climate. I think these spring droughts and very hot summers are only going to become more um, prevalent. When you look at the nitrogen harvest in those drought years, again, we found that YQ showed um, dynamic stability, um, which again raises the question if genetic diversity uh, translates into better resilience um, for nitrogen uptake in those drought years. And when you look at grain specific weight, so this is a quality indicator and it's um, a, a good indicator of the post anthesis um, climatic pattern. Um, we found that YQ, uh, a Siskin X days mix, and the X days um, all showed uh, dynamic stability. So that's a combination of this sort of genetic diversity from YQ and from this Siskin X days mix, and the early vigour that we saw from X days, um, a sort of translating into better specific weights. So I'm sure many of you will know um, that as grain yield increases, uh, grain protein tends to decrease. This is sort of a well, um, a well known phenomena. Um, so, and that's exactly what we found um, over, the, over the years. We found that as grain yield increased, grain protein did decrease. But I want to draw your attention to the three varieties that you see sitting above that line. So that's Mariswijan, Malika and YQ. Um, and what we found was that Mariswijan, um, which sit quite high above that line, displayed something called grain protein deviation. So this isn't suggesting that it had the highest yield or the highest um, protein content. What it suggests is that it has a higher protein content than would be expected from its yield. And once again, this is this historic um, variety that was actually released in 1964, and it's the only cultivar that showed this significant grain protein deviation. When you compare the varieties to Siskin, that control, what you find is that YQ also shows this significant advantage and does show this significant grain protein deviation. We also found that Crispin um, was almost significant in this grain protein deviation, which is interesting. This is a um, hard feed um, wheat variety, which is no longer available on the market, but was um, preferred by organic farmers. So just some interim conclusions from these results. So what we found is that organic farming is not one management system. We had this wide row system um, and this narrow row. We found that the genetic diversity, either by evolutionary breeding or through these mixes, and looking at high early vigour through X days, can translate itself to better dynamic stability. We found that in drought years, um, again, these historic varieties and genetic diversity emerged as the most resilient for yield, um, as well as YQ being the most resilient for protein and nitrogen harvest. Um, so I think what we'd like to highlight here um, is that these that genetic diversity and these historic varieties should be a really key starting point for um, future breeding for organic and low input. I'm conscious that I may have run over a bit, so I just want to say thank you very much to all the farmers who participated in all of our trials and also to our project partners. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Some interesting work going on there. We've had lots of questions come through on PolyV, so do keep those coming and we'll cover them in the panel session at the end. So taking you to PolyV again, we've got time for our final poll of today. So as we're moving away from... Um, artificial nutrient application. We want to know what are your clients asking you most about? So um, the cover crops, the impact of reduced tillage, uh, the use of organic materials, the use of biostimulants and biological products, and the impact of soil health. I appreciate your clients are probably asking you about all of those things, but what, what is it that's, um, that's being brought up the most? So you can, uh, can see all the results coming in now. Um, our strategic cereal farms are actually looking at all of these um, these elements separately on the, the four strategic farms that we've got running at the moment. Um, as we go forward with the trials, we'll be able to draw a few more conclusions from, from the work that's been going on at the moment. Um, so biostimulants seem to be uh, the thing that's coming in most, but fairly even across the board. Oh, reduced tillage has just taken the lead. It's like watching the, the races at the moment. Um, so that's uh, really interesting to see. We seem to have settled on 28% of um, being focused on the impact of reduced tillage, followed by biostimulants at 23%, uh, 
Organic materials and cover crops both at 19% and then the impact of soil health at 11%. Um, but Ian Robinson now is going to talk about the interaction between soil and crop nutrient management. So thank you very much, Ian. Right, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, yeah, my name is Ian Robertson. I'm from Sustainable Soil Management. Um, what we're really looking at doing in the agricultural sphere is looking at soils in a much bigger, bigger um, context than just one-dimensional soil chemistry, soil biology, or soil physics. So we've got 20 minutes. We're going to run through, or try to run through, the integration between soils and how, how they allow plants to draw up a lot more nutrition than we do uh, apply out of a bag. Um, so when we're joining soils together, or soils and plants together, what we're really looking at doing is trying to understand some key measures within the soil and within what the plant requires. So the first part is actually how many nutrients have you got in the soil? Now there's lots of ways of measuring it um, and those measurements sometimes are just one dimensional again, they're through a chemical uh, assay of the soil. What we've got to do is again draw back and think how is that soil reacting or uh, inter interacting with our plant and just because you've got lots of nutrition in the soil doesn't necessarily mean that the plant will be able to access it. And that's what we're going to hopefully explain further as we go on. Once you know all the soil, uh, the, all the nutrition that's in the soil, you then need to think about how many nutrients do my plants actually need? So there's a lot of talk and work done on uh, offtake. I, when you harvest a crop, you remove X amount of kilos of product, uh, nutrition from the field. What we've got to remember is that there's a thing called peak demand. So your crops require an awful lot more of certain nutrients to get to the architecture, to grow the, the uh, leaf four, leaf five, stems, tillers, etc., to hold the grain to take it through to harvest. They're the numbers we want to be looking at rather than just thinking about offtake. So we'll talk about that shortly. Um, then we think we've got the measurements. How functional? We're all talking about healthy soils. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see healthy soils, healthy soils. I kind of get a little bit hung up on healthy soils, and I think we should really be talking about functionality of soils, because the functionality of soil allows you to extract nutrition into the crop you're trying to grow, the cash crop, you're trying to make some money, to, to hold it, to take your harvest through to yield. You can have all the nutrition in the world in your soil, but if it's not extractable, then the plants will struggle. And at that point, we start talking about functionality. And the functionality com comes to water. It was mentioned earlier on, water is really important. Nutrient cycling, biology. And they are all playing a massive part in how functional they are. If we've got a very functional soil, active soil, we then have to get the plants to access it. So again, a lot of the HDB it, it has done a lot of work on root mass, root architecture. And I think plant breeders are now looking at that as well. That again is the simple term, the roots are the hands of the plants. The bigger their hands, the more food you can shove in. And that's really what we're trying to get the plants to do in the early growth stages. Put a big root system down, access your soil, access the nutrients, and then draw it up to create the architecture to take your yield through. So we're gonna look at the soils. Um, I apologise now, those that have seen me talk before, have <coughs> been to college recently, have seen this kind of slide time and time again. It keeps popping up in the press everywhere. Three aspects of, of soils, the physical, the chemical, and the biological. Now, they are all and totally interactive. We can't affect, we, sorry, if we affect the physics, that will affect the chemistry and which will affect the biology. And I believe that we've kind of over-focused on the physics and chemistry because they're easy. You go physic, the field is brown, you plough it, sorry, the field is green even, you plough it, it goes brown. The field is green, you put some round up some glyphosate on it, it goes brown. Very obvious things that we're doing. The difficult part is knowing how that affects the biology. And a lot of the biological testing that's going on has been the preserve of laboratories or research institutes, because it's been quite expensive. And as, as we'll find out, biology changes all the time. So it's very difficult to really pin our hopes on biology. I think the poll just came in that people wanted to look more about biostimulants. Now, biostimulants lead into biology. I'm a bit more simple in that I think if we get our physics and chemistry right, a lot of our biological aspects in the soil will actually rectify themselves because biology is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It, it's happening all around us. But the biology is driven by your chemistry and physics. And when we talk about physics, some of the key things I tend to get involved in is soil texture. And we'll touch on that in a minute, why that's important. 
and also soil structure, because as I said earlier, you can have all the nutrition in the world, but if you've got a poor soil structure, then the plants can't access it. So it's a fundamental thing that we to get our physics right. When we look at the chemistry, fundamental part is pH, nothing new there. And then the, the amount of nutrients we've got in that soil, there are, again, we always measure in kilos per hectare, um, rather than milligrams per litre, because then we can understand and try and join what the plant needs to what the soil's got. And then biology, really exciting place. Um, however, it's really dynamic, really changes. So we tend to look at things like the trophic layers, second and third trophic, how imbalanced are they with the, with the second trophic? And then we look at what is the food source? Have we got organic matter going in there? Have we got carbohydrates coming from living plants, etc.? Have we got enough food source to support our trophic layers? And, and the easiest thing to do to check your biology is go out and count worms, and, which is brilliant. A lot of people go and count worms when it's too dry. So that there are other things that we can do, um, which again, we'll come on to shortly. What are the physical attributes of the soil? And the SFI soil standards is out there where it's um, helping us or encouraging us to go out and dig holes in fields and look at what's happening, which is brilliant. The, Things we should be looking for, if, we, if you can do it, is look at organic matter, the colour of soil. Does it change? So the picture on your screen there, you can see quite dark soil dropping down to lighter soil. I really like that soil profile because there's no distinct line between the two soils. You've got a blurring of lines, so you've got connectivity between your topsoil and your subsoil. Can we texture the soil? Are we comfortable sand, silt, clay fink with our um, physical texturing in our hand? Or if not, send it to a lab. Get it analysed for sand, silt, clay. Again, that will become really important in a minute. Bulk density. You know, how heavy is your soil? Obviously, if you're on farming very organic soils, it's very light, it's very open. If you're, if you're farming sandy soils, it's very heavy. And that means that how you've got a huge amount of mineral in your soil, or in your cubic metre, that can then cause problems with soil structure and then root accessibility. So measuring those elements allows us to understand where and how the soil should perform, which takes the guesswork out of what the soil's physics should be like. Both those lead into structure, as I said. Porosity, I think we've mentioned earlier about water. We'll come to that. Water, water all the time. Really, really important. The majority of nu nutrients taken up by your plant are taken up in water. No water, no nutrient uptake, very poor microbial activity. So we're really not then utilising the soils to its best ability. Um, consistency, are we seeing layer, layering in our soil? Again, it comes back to very simple visual soil assessment. What are we looking for? Are we seeing different bulk densities, uh, different sand striations of sand, silt, clay? Um, dig a hole, have a look, see what's happening. Colour, I should put smell in there. Um, smells really, really, really good. However, if you dig a hole and the soil is really grey and it kind of smells quite bad, you don't need to smell it close up because it's a really nasty smell, and you don't really want to be doing that. Um, the last part there is stone content. Um, if you think all your soil is soil, it's not. There can be an awful lot of stone in there, and if you've got up to, say, 20% stone, that can have a massive effect on the amount of nutrition you've got in your soil, because it's stone. There's not a lot of nutrition in a lump of stone. So take those things in consideration when you're looking at your physical attributes of the soil. Chemistry. Um, again, I put it all on one, one slide at once here. The chemical attributes of the soil, we really want to be looking at the nutrient holding capacity of the soil. How big is it? So cation exchange capacity, total exchange capacity. Simply, the way I describe it is the fingers again. How many hooks can I, or fingers have I got to hold on to nutrition in my soil? The bigger the number, the more nutrition you've got. doesn't mean it's balanced, but you've got a lot of nutrition. You go right down to a sand, very skinny sandy soil like a beach, you can only have, say, two or three holding. A big blue clay can be up to 50. And when you've got those un understanding of that, you can understand how the soil wants to be fed nutrition. So if you're on a very low cation exchange capacity sandy soil, don't go feed it an awful lot of soil, uh, nutrition. It hasn't got the hooks to hold on to it. Likewise, with a clay, you can feed it quite a lot of nutrition because it's got the ability to hold on to a lot of, a lot of nutrition at one time. Then you look at what is on the clay colloids, calcium, magnesium, any of your rooms, calcium, magnesium, potassium, aluminium, ammonium, hydrogen. They will affect, obviously, pH, and that, in turn, will affect how nutrients cycle, root accessibility, accessibility etc. 
Um, in there, you'll have organic matter. Um, I love organic matter. Um, however, I sometimes get a bit frustrated that we always talk about is carbon or raw organic matter. To me, organic matter is something that's living, breathing. We want to put organic matter into the soil. Soils respire. Microbial activity breaks your organic matter down, releasing carbon dioxide, because that's what it's meant to do. Your little wheat plants on the outside catch your carbon dioxide in the stomatas and grow. The worst thing we can have is bare soil, because your soil will not stop respiring. And at that point, it's breaking down organic matter, which it'll do, but it releases the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and you don't have a plant to capture it. So carbon is really interesting, organic matter is really interesting, but we've got to look at what pools of carbon we've got in the soil, how the organic matter is cycling, and what we are doing to capture it, re-push it back down into the soil again. Um, so organic matter and carbon linked, and they're linked really by biological attributes. Um, love this picture, um, I took it myself, so you're pleased to know. Brilliant picture of a worm linking in with roots in a soil. The soil food web, which is the microbes that live in uh, the soil and feed the plants, are there to feed the plants. They're not there for our benefit, they're there to work in, in, in um, synergy with the plants. But they will only work in your soil if we have the right soil structure. And that is the right soil structure giving us 25% air, 25% water, 45 mineral and 5% organic matter. That's delivered by structure. And I think we all forget that structure starts right on the right hand side of the picture, 0.003 mil, tiny, smaller than your hair. If we don't have that structure right, there's no point pushing big machines into the field to try and create structure. Structure starts at very small size. That small size is where your second trophics, your uh, bacteria, fungi, nematodes that live on the water film that derive the whole nutrient cycle. They need food, and that's coming from the organic matter and plants you're putting in there. If you get it wrong, things can go wrong quite quickly. So example on the right-hand side is the same field of maize that was power harrowed twice, put a cap on the top of the soil. Below it, you can see really nasty gray um, soil. That's gone anaerobic. The pH has dropped to 5.6. So we've affected the physics, it's affected the chemistry, it's affected the biology. This, what we've got to look at is what, it, what caused it. That was caused by us power harrowing at once too many. Not the soil's fault, we created that problem. And what we're trying to do all the while is bring everything we're doing in farming to connect it to the soils, and that is all through microbial contributions. I appreciate I'm running out of time, so I'll jump a few of this. When we look at microbes, we want to be looking at them as a cycler, bringing more of our nutrition out of our deep freeze, which is in the soil complex, into the fridge and up to feed plants, rather than the old moron principle, which is if I haven't got enough readily available nutrition, we'll put more on. We want to be looking at things that we've got in the soil and make it available. And then you look with HDB, we've got some great growth guides out there. Convert the growth guides into kilos per hectare. So you'll see on the right-hand side that the plant is growing, how many kilos of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, etc. does the plant require? We have all these numbers. We then link those numbers to how the plant grows, to what the soil's got in it, and decide what the best plan of uh, attack is. If you look at micros, it's easier, because micros are in grams, so we can either try and get them from the soil, and the more biologically active our soils are, the less micronutrient deficiencies we're seeing, or again, because they're so small, as you can see, you can apply them through a sprayer. Um, one of the big things about structure we talked about earlier is about water. Sand, silt and clay give you water differently. So the more sand, silt you've got, the more water we will be able to uh, give to the plant. The more clay you've got, the less water. Um, and I think this is again why I think we should do, look more and more into our texturing of our soils to understand what's going on uh, with water, because water is fundamental to it. Again, old graph, but the more roots you have at flowering, the bigger the yield you'll have. It's direct line correlation, so anything we can do to grow roots is better. I can jump these, I'm going to run out. And then getting to the end of it, you then look at measuring the amount of plants, the amount of nutrition the plant needs. An example here of magnesium. If we've measured the plant and it's 10% short in magnesium at gross uh, T1, that's the equivalent of 660 grams of mag required. Now that could either be product A at 4.1 kilos applied or product B, 9.8 litres. 
So don't guess. If we are doing this stuff, measure it and then apply what we need. So where, where, where do we all fit in? Well, ultimately, as I said earlier, we need to look at the soils, measure the physics, the chemistry, and the biology. You can map soils, things like TerraMap, very detailed soil digital mapping service to, to link it all together, and then do plant analysis in your growing crop. So tissue test, sap test, ultimately looking at grain analysis, or you do above ground biomass and join it all together. And so summary, measure what you've got in the soil, think holistically, I know it's an awful word, but we've got to think about the big picture. Get the functional soils, you can bypass soil, don't get me wrong, you don't need it, but it's very expensive to keep putting more and more nutrition on. Know what you like to grow and match what your inputs to what your soil's got to make sure you, you match it up together. Be realistic about what you're growing. Don't think, you, don't farm on hope, basically. Know what you're trying to do. Feed what is required, not what you think is required. Measure your progress, which we all should do. Um, be kind to your soils. Don't underestimate what a good root system will do for you into a well-balanced soil. And fundamentally, get out there and get started. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ian. That was excellent. We, uh, again, we'll have questions at the very end, so you can enter those at poll ev.com forward slash ahdb. So the last two presentations for today are going to be looking at carbon and greenhouse gas reporting. So to be net zero by 2050, agriculture is looking to adopt new practices to both reduce emissions and to sequester carbon. So um, we'll hand over to Nick that is going to talk about carbon and greenhouse gassing and where we are now. Thank you. Hey, um, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to run a short presentation through and set the scene for my colleague John uh, Foote, who's Head of Environment at AHDB, who in a minute will talk about a net zero cropping report and get into a bit more detail. I'm going to give a bit of a 101 overview of what the current situation is facing uh, farming in relation to net zero and carbon and GHGs, explain some terminology, give some context. So measuring carbon is the title of this section. Carbon, as we know, will get used as a little bit of a shorthand, lazy term, in a sense, to talk about all greenhouse gases. Uh, so do bear that in mind as we go through. So on this slide, you have a collection of commitments. It has been quite a a, quite a picture and quite an aggregation of uh, policy commitments to net zero over the years. Going back to the 2008 Climate Change Act, which set an 80% reduction target by mid-century for the UK, and then, of course, Theresa May's government escalated that to a net zero commitment uh, for the UK. And this, this phrase net zero relates to, we're going to take a minute to talk about net zero and what it does relate to. So it comes in as a planetary concept in international climate agreements, planetary net zero by mid-century. In effect, global climate neutrality is the phrase that's used in relation to things like the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. When it gets translated into a national commitment, again, you know, the UK's GHG footprint has to be uh, net zero by 2050. But it's being picked up, applied to sectors, it's been applied to companies, major corporates, and right the way through to farm level, we're all affected by this commitment of, of net zero. Um, what it actually means is it does mean a balance between emissions and removals, removals going through natural cycle sequestration, carbon sequestration, However, when it's applied to individual business entities, um, it's tending to fall out not as a simple balance, but as a rapid need to decarbonise. In effect, um, the, the latest uh, commitments coming through what's called the Science-Based Target Initiative, which all large corporates will be signing up to, uh, or the majority of large corporates anyway, their net zero commitment will require a 90% reduction and will only allow 10% of the footprint to be offset through compensatory measures. So do bear that in mind. It's not just about the balance between removals and emissions. It is about an escalating and increasing drive to decarbonise and to reduce greenhouse gases. So all of these commitments coming through, 
Um, and of course, it comes in from different directions as well. There's the, <clears throat> the, the planetary health dietary work on that slide as well. Lots of different drivers bearing down on, on, on agriculture. The UK's Climate Change Committee is a statutory advisor. It, it's, it can't set the direction, but it criticises the direction or it provides a commentary to the UK government on how well different sectors are doing. On this slide, you've got examples of the kind of mitigations, the climate change actions that are required to help to decarbonise uh, farming in the UK. And these are very familiar to us. Uh, we've, we've seen these phrases such as the suggestion that 10% uh, of farmland could be put over to agroforestry, for example. A number of commitments on this slide that, which you'll, you'll have seen. Um, an important thing to bear in mind, I mentioned with the Committee on Climate Change, is that it, it doesn't set the direction. It has to be mitigation neutral in a sense, but it will comment to government on how well it's doing. In its last progress report, agriculture was one of two, uh, if you like, two sectors, shall we say, that were flagged, given a red flag, effectively, as being behind the curve on the progress being made. Uh, the other one that was worse than agriculture was the state of the nation's housing stock, which, um, which has been a, a long-running uh, concern for many years. So key threats. Um, there's a whole range of activities coming through and, and that will drive change uh, for farming and agriculture. So changes to markets, diet change, we've talked about new assurance requirements coming through, eco-labelling, uh, these kind of things. The delivery of environmental goods and services, this whole thing that we heard a lot in the whole Brexit debates about post-Brexit, would there be a environmental goods and services uh, delivery through from land management? Uh, the supply chain, um, this needs to be de-risked, but the, you do watch out for this fact that um, risk will be transferred down the supply chain, potentially. Uh, the additional costs and complexity to doing business, the importance of data and evidence, and this all leads through to increased investment and this risk that climate change could put people out of business. Will it do that? It certainly is going to become an increasingly uh, business relevant issue uh, when it comes to selling produce uh, up the chain. So what is a greenhouse gas? Greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere and they trap heat, the main ones being water vapour and carbon dioxide. Now this concept of CO2 equivalence is important. It's a standard unit. Think of it a bit like an exchange rate, everybody putting their currency over to the dollar or the euro as a standard unit for measuring carbon footprints. And standard ratios are used to convert the various gases into this equivalent amounts of carbon dioxide. And it's usually using the CO2 equivalent based over 100 years, the global warming potential of each gas over a 100 year period. Um, countries like the UK have signed up to the Paris Agreement. Well, every country, in, in, pretty much now every country in the world has, with America coming back into that uh, agreement, and uh, that will hopefully last now as well. And the UK government have committed to achieving net zero, as we've said. So all sectors of the UK have to measure progress towards that. Agriculture isn't necessarily expected to get to net zero, but of course, um, it has to, has to make a significant contribution. The National Farmers Union, of course, have made a commitment towards um, a target of net zero by 2040. So there's a lot of ambition and a lot of interest in, in farming to drive towards net zero. So on this slide, we're looking at the greenhouse gases. You've got carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide along the top there, and then some of the uh, pluofluorocarbons and, 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 and the PFCs and, and, and sulfur hexafluoride or industrial gases to the right-hand side, fugitive gases. But the, the important three for, for farming are uh, these three on the left. And you will see the blue figures there indicate uh, they, their global warming potential relative to one tonne of CO2. So methane being 28 times as potent, and, and nitrous oxide being uh, 200, just under 300 times as, as, uh, as, as, as potent. Uh, they're all significant and they're all contributing uh, to, to, the UK, uh, to the UK situation of its carbon footprint. Uh, as an example of that, um, so UK 
In the UK itself, agricultural emissions are about 10% of, of, the, of, the, of the UK's carbon footprint. And you've got the situation here that methane, for example, uh, farming is responsible for about 47% of UK methane at the moment. An interesting case in point there is that uh, over recent years, other sectors have um, driven down their methane emissions. Industrial emissions from methane have really driven down to a very low level. Uh, whereas in agriculture, it's, it's somewhat flatlined. And it's now, therefore, because of that, it's now the largest contributor to, to the UK's uh, methane uh, footprint. So methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, all particularly important. The other gases are also relevant. They do come into the food chain, particularly through cooling and refrigeration. This diagram is looking at these in relation to what's called scope one, two, and three. And this is a terminology that comes from carbon accounting and reporting. It's a bit mixed up here, but within the red line in the middle, I've put both uh, some farming symbols and also some factory symbols as well and business symbols here. So if this is the farm, and we're talking about the farm as the unit in question, its scope one emissions will include all of those things. If this is, say, a food processor or a food and drinks company or retailer, then we'll take out the tractor, the sheep and the cow, we've moved them over to the left and they'll be within the indirect emissions coming in from the left-hand side, the scope two and three. But this also includes the use phase, so the use, the cooking of food in the kitchen as well, that comes into the right-hand side of this diagram. So on-farm emissions do count in other people's carbon footprints. That's the way to think of this. So on this slide, I've picked out directly from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, one of the primary core international standards for GHG accounting. It's pretty much a basis for all GHG accounting by organisations. Direct emissions at the top are scope one within the business, within the land holding. The indirect emissions do do low contribute and have to increasingly factor into the uh, not just the carbon reporting but the carbon mitigation actions of the entity. So down here scope 3 is particularly interesting here. So this is other people's emissions that come embedded within the products sold into you. So uh, your, your emissions from a farm will, will be somebody else's scope 3 emissions. These, these circles on this diagram towards the bottom are graphically trying to represent one of the dilemmas with Scope 3, whereby in year one, a company will be trying to understand its emissions, and it can pretty quickly identify what its Scope 1 and 2 emissions are in that uh, cheese little wedge towards the top right-hand corner there, around about, uh, around about 1 to 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. However, the Scope 3 emissions in the rest of the circle are estimated and often are estimated, underestimated in, in early stages. By year three, after some work and uh, investigations, it's often the case that a company on this carbon management journey will have realised that its scope-free footprint is much larger. And by year 15, hopefully, the company will have driven down its emissions in a constructive way, working with its suppliers, maybe even supporting farmers in the supply chain, to drive down emissions and its broader scope three and scope one and two footprint has reduced. This is very much um, behind the concept of, um, of science-based targets that many of the large corporates have signed up to, as I mentioned. Uh, but not just the large uh, retailers and food companies, uh, this, is, this is food processors, it's coming all the way through the value chain. And it will start to become an expectation um, it may lead to some support uh, for farmers to help them decarbonize, and that is happening. Uh, at the same token, it, it, it could come through as, uh, as an expectation or requirement, asking farmers to, to actually uh, work out their carbon footprint and to evidence and demonstrate how they are reducing their emissions. It could become a license to trade, could become a business opportunity. So what information do you need? This is all fairly familiar. And on the left-hand side, you have the essential data required for your carbon footprint. And I'm using the term in a lazy way, your GHG footprint here. So this is your, this is your bills. This is what's called your activity data. All of the data around your inputs. This is, this is energy, gas, water, 
um, the business travel, numbers of livestock, if it's a livestock business, uh, fertilizer feed, um, and estimation of homegrown forage. As well in here, you'll notice there's the ownership structure, which can be relevant. For example, if a joint venture is the, the ownership, then that can lead to a splitting out of uh, the emissions footprint and, and, and allocations, respectively. And then the inputs on the right-hand side there in a little bit more detail, uh, getting into the kind of data that can be required. This is very much a... There's been a lot of work on this in recent years through developing farm calculators, and you'll be very aware that there's a number of calculators in the marketplace that are being used. Um, very significant ones that often get referenced to things like the Cool Farm Tool, Farm Carbon Calculator, AgriCalc. Um, the key thing to remember with these calculators is that they are starting to, over a period of time, starting to align and will increasingly become more harmonious in, in, in their output. The, the, the general situation is many people would advise that they should be consistently used, so pick one and use it consistently. But also it's worth pointing out the importance of hanging on to and, and keeping a record of this input data on this slide making sure that the data is collected so that uh, should the assumptions within tools change in the future, you've still got the data and it can be reworked, particularly if uh, somebody up the supply chain is setting new requirements and coming down towards uh, farmers or your clients and saying, you know, we'd like, we'd like that data reworked. So there is, a, there is a value in keeping hold of the data as well. And then there's different ways in which the carbon calculation, the GHG calculation can be uh, determined. It's worth having a word here about the balance between a life cycle assessment versus a inventory footprint, if you like, for a, for a business. So you can have your carbon footprint for a business, for the farm level, for a company, um, for a household, but you can also have a life cycle assessment that's done at the product level. can be very detailed, it can be expensive, it can be quite top line as a hot spot. Now there is some consistency through standards on this, and in the UK the government subsidised the development of the first carbon footprinting international standard, which was a British standard, PAS 2050, and that does give some consistency. And in recent years, that's been converted into, there's now an international standard, ISO 14067, uh, which is very close in its methodology. Over time, as I mentioned, you should start to see the tools and the standards harmonise. So it can be confusing in recent years and at the moment, but it should get a better picture in the, in the future. Now, this is where, as economists, you know, we have a key role, and you'd have a key role to helping farmers to um, think about reducing their input costs and maximising their cash crop yields. A lot of this, in the early stages of decarbonisation on this journey towards net zero, is about making the quick wins and what's called the low-hanging fruit. So what is it in the next three to four years that, uh, that can be done within farm operations to cut GHG emissions? In, in a little while, John's going to come back to this report and talk in a bit more detail about some of these uh, segments on here, but you can see it's often to do with feed, fuel, a fertilizer, you know, critical, critical, uh, critical efficiencies that can be made. But there's more to this as well. Soil carbon has already been mentioned and soil organic matter and this slide simply gives a little reminder on some HDB figures here on the, the carbon stocks, typical carbon stocks in improved grassland, unimproved grassland, arable cropping areas. These are, these are simplistic, there's more detail that can be put and my, more diversity across these categories. Uh, it's worth pointing out that, that they, there's a limit sometimes, so uh, for instance in pasture and grassland um, it's often mentioned that there can be a 20-year cycle and, and that once you've improved your, 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 your carbon within the soil, it can be tricky to continue to, uh, you come up against the limits to how much carbon you can sequester within to the soil. And there's permanence issues around this, how permanent are carbon stores. Now there's a lot of focus on this at the moment, but the only thing that I would say is that we could talk, have a whole separate session or two sessions on this. But do I suggest bear in mind that the way in which the international standards are developing and corporate approaches are developing, they're looking to decarbonise. And I mentioned they're looking to drive down emissions 90% and only 10% of their residual GHG carbon footprint can be offset or compensated through natural 
uh, natural. And there'll be quite strict, um, I'm, I'm sure there will be quite strict requirements placed upon those as well, which at the moment is tending to favour forestry. But everything has a problem, of course, because everything is, is uh, in the natural world could be quickly lost again, so back into the atmosphere. So we do have to keep this in context in, in terms of the role that this will play in corporate uh, environmental programmes. As it says at the bottom, the majority of UK grassland soils could be close to that, that sort of carbon, maximum carbon level. So the future, we, uh, within AHDB, we're working with uh, partners across um, industry, farmers and sectors around developing roadmaps. These are setting ambitious goals and targets through to 2050. Uh, there's already work underway on a dairy roadmap. Um, also, beef and lamb and pork roadmaps are underway, and there's reviewing situation at the moment on the potential for cereals and oil seeds roadmap as well. But in summary, no magic bullets. It's all about measuring to manage your impact and keeping hold of data and setting a good baseline is, is probably good advice at the moment as some of these standards and also the carbon markets start to develop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. That was great. So following nicely on, we've got John Foote, who's the Head of Environment at AHDB, who's going to cover the findings from the Net Zero Cropping Report. So thank you very much, John. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to uh, speak to you this afternoon and uh, uh, talk about the Net Zero Cropping Report. Now, this work was commissioned uh, in conjunction with CHAP, uh, and ADAS helped uh, provide the data that underpins what you see in the report. Um, and we thought it was important to do this because, as Nick highlighted, there is a, a huge amount of focus on climate change and some of the actions that need to be taken. But often there isn't that much in terms of baseline data for the industry. And in particular, when we started to look, well, what is there to defend the reputation of the industry, demonstrate progress in the future from you know, that, that baseline to show that journey towards net zero, we found that there wasn't a, a huge amount of reliable data that was readily available that could give us a starting point. I think also that you know, this uh, UK Climate Change Committee shows a range of actions in here. And, you know, they're all very much focused on changing agricultural practices and the way that the land is used. But there's very little in here that talks about, well, how do we ensure that we are able to continue to feed the UK's population with safe, affordable and secure supplies of food? And we really wanted to be able to be in a position to make sure that, you know, our farmers and you as agronomists are able to have the, the right tools uh, and approaches to enable that to happen. Um, so it was, again, one of the reasons why we, we wanted to commission this work. So it's very much about producing those benchmarks, you know, understanding what the greenhouse gas emissions were from UK arable and horticulture. And when we commissioned this week work, we at that time were also supporting horticulture and potatoes. So this, this was commissioned before the ballots. Uh, and I will focus largely today on the cereals and oilseed sectors, but I'll you know, flag where we've got data uh, available for uh, horticulture. I think it's fair to say that regardless of whether or not it's arable or you know, horticulture, getting to net zero is not easy. Um, if that was the case, we would have all used the magic bullet and got there. Um, but actually, it is a good, sound economic sense, and especially as we've seen the price of fertilisers rocket due to the, the, the war in Ukraine, we're going to see, you know, uh, high fuel prices, high fertilizer prices probably continue in the short to medium term. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we know that the costs, the input costs go up like a rocket and come back down like a feather. So I think, you know, the more we can focus on, you know, what we can do to sort of manage those environmental impacts, we'll also find it delivers good environmental outcomes for the uh, economic outcomes for the industry. We, you know, Nick touched on the fact that carbon will have greater monetary value, uh, and we're hoping that we'll start to see carbon offsets. Uh, and you know, we're already beginning to see some schemes coming into the market. It's very early days for those uh, for you know, building up carbon in your soils. 
uh, and you know maybe tree planting. And what we would say is, you know, where you've got those opportunities, think carefully before you jump in with both feet. But before you can go into any of that or, you know, linking it with biodiversity as well, you need to have baselines. And as I said, it's quite difficult to get to those baselines at the moment. So this is quite a busy slide. And without my glasses on, I can't see the, the text particularly well. But, it, you know, it's really about, you know, understanding uh, where... Uh, which greenhouse gases are important, uh, building that baseline. And what we, we used in, in terms of this approach was that there is a lot of literature out there, both here in the UK and globally, um, but often it's, it's dispersed, it's, it's very technical. And so what we asked ADAS to do was pull that together and look at a number of quite often what we call meta-studies, where maybe there's a, a single paper that looks at five other sort of field trials and then says, Overall, the result is up, down, or sideways. So we've used those meta-studies to help identify what the typical inputs are, what the typical yields are, what the crop was, uh, and what the, the sort of benefits and outcomes for the agricultural system is. And then we asked ADAS to look very much at, well, what are the mitigations? What are the options to help farmers reduce their carbon footprint that are cost-effective and very much available now um, before, um, uh, you know, farmers start on this particular journey. Thank you. Somebody's adjusted the screen so I can now read it. So, um, uh, now, for some crops, uh, I will point out as we go through that there isn't actually that much evidence, even though we've been looking at those. And those are typically crops that are not uh, particularly commonly grown, uh, or the quality of the studies is poor, and therefore we, we weren't able to include that data necessarily. Um, we, you know, Nick touched on some of the sort of uh, standards, you know, we, we made sure that we were comparing and where we had uh, sort of standards underpinning those studies, we used those. So we've got PAS 2050 uh, and then another ISO standard there, 14064, which was uh, one of the ones. And again, if there was a, a life cycle analysis, then 14067 would be used as well. So we use that to sort of make sure we were using the best data available and sort of pulled that together. So in terms of what crops are included, you can see by you know, the, the greatest amount of data and also the greatest amount of crop grown here in the UK, links to the, the growth of wheat and barley, very much the sort of broad acre crops. We've got oilseed rape in the mix, we've got pulses uh, and uh, sort of uh, uh, other sort of field beans, uh, sugar beet, we've got potatoes uh, and much of the field veg. We've also got, you know, tree fruit uh, and um, uh, protected horticulture in the mix. And I'm not going to go into detail on those, but just to highlight that they're there. But, you know, 70% of that data really links to the broad acre crops and, uh, you know, uh, the ones that uh, you as agronomists will be, you know, providing a lot of advice and support on. Now, this, this looks quite quite a horrible graph when you look at it, but it was by far the best way we could present the data. And there are a series of these for each of the, the sort of uh, arable and horticulture sectors, and I've really only put the, the cereals and um, the one that includes the peas, the beans, and uh, oilseed. And what you can see is that you have, you know, US uh, in there. So we, we, we're, where we have been able to do so, we've been looking at, you know, UK versus our international peers. And, you know, what that range is indicated by the grey bar and then the average uh, is shown by the green sort of line within the bar. Where you've got in some cases, so for example, UK organic, that indicates we've only got one study or a few studies that give us that average figure. And therefore, we haven't got a sufficient range. So that where you've got almost single lines, you need to treat those with the utmost of caution. Um, but it at least gives us some idea of where they appear. And you can see that generally, you know, here in the UK, we compare quite well in terms of wheat against our international peers. There's a much wider range which reflects maybe greater variability in our climate. I think the interesting one is when you look at UK winter wheat for feed, there is a much broader range than, you know, the milling wheat. And when we discussed this with ADAS, the view was that actually they think there is such a wide variation in that um, uh, wheat 
because actually a lot of farmers are trying to achieve milling wheat specification and then for whatever reason miss it. And they've put on a lot of uh, fertilizer to try and achieve that and it's having a, a significant impact on the, 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 the sort of uh, range that we're seeing there. And it means that you know, some of that potential milling wheat is now, now being sold as feed wheat. So uh, you know, it's, it gives us a, a good indication of where the UK is uh, and uh, wh how we compare against our international peers. And I think you know, we're holding our, our, our own well. Just to sort of drill down into the data in a, a sort of uh, easier sort of, sort of read format, the table again is in the report, but you can see that we give an indication of degree of confidence. And for example, linseed, we don't have that many studies to back up the, the, the data. It's a sort of relatively sort of new crop uh, uh, and therefore, you know, the, the, the sort of degree of confidence is rel relatively low. Whereas winter wheat, we, we've got good confidence and you can see where the UK benchmark is. Uh, and you can see that there is a huge range really in terms of both milling uh, and uh, feed wheat, uh, which means that, you know, as farmers and agronomists, there's a lot for us to sort of look at and see if we can optimise to get towards that bottom end where, you know, the specifications are being met, uh, but maybe at a third of those at the higher levels. And it's worth bearing in mind as well that those at the bottom end will be making a better return on that investment than those at the top end, probably because there's a lot of fertiliser that's gone on. The, the, the specification um, is, is delivering you know, what may be required in some cases or hitting the, the sort of feed wheat, uh, but the, the sort of profit is down. So, you know, where can we help farmers? And, and to be honest, 86% of that, that sort of cost is linked to the use of fertilizer and the fuel. And I haven't put pound notes on all of the, the sort of uh, areas, but the biggest chunk of all is really related to the use of nitrogen fertilizer. And um, it results in the emissions of nitrous oxide, which is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. So again, in terms of you know, reducing environmental impact, it's absolutely key to focus on that one. Uh, it, it's, it's long lasting in the atmosphere, and, and if there's a future cost associated with that, there may be you know, increased cost uh, if uh, we can't avoid those emissions. But you know, in reality, those nitrous oxide emissions are basically fertilizer that you've put on, and then that is being re-emitted to the atmosphere and is not being utilized by your crop. So that, that's a significant uh, sort of loss there. And also, again, fuel is directly related to the amount of soil you move around, uh, the, the number of passovers, cultivations, etc. And again, the more you can do to minimise that cost on farm, the better the, the sort of profit and also the environmental outcomes. This is for the legume uh, crops, very similar picture, uh, but fuel use makes up a much larger proportion of the uh, sort of... Uh, uh, cropping system uh, and that's partly because you're putting less fertilizer on because these crops fix their own carbon um, and so oh you know if these pie charts were of equal size it would be slightly smaller uh, and that uh, fuel use makes up a larger proportion of the, the, the footprint. So but again everything that comes with a high price as an input cost onto the farm results in high emissions from the, the system. And in this system, 86% of the uh, carbon uh, emissions can be directly managed and controlled through you know, good agronomy and good farming practices. So quite significant. Just to sort of prove that uh, there are other things in here for horticulture and, and sort of field veg, again, we've got similar tables, similar sort of uh, graphics showing the, the different splits. It's only really when you get to the, the protected horticulture where you know, some of the energy use becomes more significant, where you're, you're sort of heating the system. But generally, for most of these, it is you know, that, that those high carbon input uh, products, you know, be it gas, be it diesel, be it um, um, uh, the fertilizer. So maybe no surprises to you all here, um, uh, and maybe I'm, I'm sort of uh, teaching you all to suck eggs to a certain extent. 
But, you know, what are the opportunities to sort of uh, optimise nitrogen use? Well, it's about, um, you know, testing the soil. And as has been, you know, talked about by one of our other speakers, it's, it's testing the soil, understanding what the, your crop needs, uh, you know, and all the way through the development of that crop, testing the sap, uh, and, and the foliage to make sure you understand how that, that nutrient is moving through uh, and is being utilised by the crop. All of this will help optimise the use of uh, the amount of nitrogen used uh, and you know, therefore reduce the, the, sort of, um, the, the emissions. The precision technologies are really the, the sort of key to help you do this uh, and looking at your, your soil structure, your soil chemistry and making sure you've got the best conditions for you know, that root growth uh, and the soil health to sort of uh, circulate and cycle that nutrient in the soil. It's about making sure you haven't got limitations with other micronutrients, which mean that you could have plenty of nitrogen there that the crop can't use, um, and you know, uh, making sure that that's available. Looking at organic materials, you know, those. Uh, will help build carbon stocks, but will potentially uh, enable you to displace artificial fertilizer, which comes with a much higher carbon footprint than some of those organic materials, uh, to increase the amount of uh, crop that you can get off. Using cover crops uh, during periods of fallow to sort of lock up that nutrient that you've already got in the soil, making sure that you preserve as much of that valuable nutrient as po for as long as possible, and then when you've got your, your crop going, it, it's, it's there and available. And looking at how you, you sort of cultivate the soil, partly because of the, the soil structures we've been talking about, but also, perversely, some of the uh, cultivation techniques uh, or lack of uh, cultivation can increase nitrous oxide emissions. So it's finding that balance for your soils and for the system you have. Um, generally, we would sort of recommend looking at you know the min till no till systems but again it's got to be suitable for your systems uh, and if you've got to you know control weeds etc then um, uh, you may have to go back in and uh, you know uh, hit it with a, a traditional uh, sort of tillage system again not no great surprises here really it's about you know as i've been talking about the minimizing the use of the plow direct drilling all of these things can help reduce fuel use on your farm, uh, looking at the power to sort of um, needed to sort of do the cultivation um, or, uh, and get that crop in um, and uh, do so efficiently uh, on the farm. Automation uh, and the use of some of these robots that uh, you know can go in and control weeds, not only does it reduce compaction uh, on the soil but they can uh, go in, do multiple passes to keep on top of the weeds. Uh, and it also means that you're not using uh, a large tractor to sort of go across the land uh, and apply the uh, sort of control measures that you want. Again, not all of this is suitable uh, during, you know, poor weather conditions. So in terms of, you know, the, the sort of positive actions that you can take, it's really about you know, managing your fuel, managing that crop residue and finding economic opportunities to deploy some of those residues. And many of you are already doing that, uh, you know, muck for straw deals, uh, moving straw to sort of uh, livestock uh, farmers and so on. And then looking at where you've got those economic opportunities, both now, but also in the future in terms of carbon, biodiversity, uh, and maybe sort of payments from water companies to sort of uh, build carbon stocks and reduce the amount of nitrogen that you use on the soils. It's about, you know, everything that comes with that high price for inputs comes with a high carbon uh, cost and therefore looking at how you can minimize that uh, and reduce your cost base. So I shall leave it there because I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'd like to thank everybody who supported the project uh, and uh, has worked with us on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. So that was the final presentation for today's conference. We will be heading over to Anna and the panel to cover all of the questions that have just come in from that session. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Fiona. Well, hello, everybody on the panel here. Um, we'll kick off with a question perhaps for each of you. In each of your areas of research, what is the biggest gap, knowledge gap, that you're looking at that needs to be solved for you to 
take a step forward? Who wants to start? Go on, I'll start. Go on. Um, I think uh, for the organic sector, I think, I mean, there are many, but I think uh, the plant breeding and actually breeding for low input or no input systems, um, breeding mulch varieties um, rather than just, mulch, you know, clove varieties that are for forage. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think plant breeding is a, maybe a bit vague, but I think, yeah, for organics, definitely. Okay. Thank you, Annie. I think practically on farm, I think it's, it's systems. So we're very quick to just go in and do one thing and then we change, oh, that didn't work, we'll do something else. What I think we need to do more of is so we'll do things long term. And certainly with the biologicals that are coming out, we don't, shouldn't expect biological to do something really quickly in one year. We're part of what we're trying to do. So it'd be nice to get more of that done on a longer or planned longer, longer plan. Okay, thank you. Nick? So, so I think in relation to um, carbon footprints on farms, um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of progress. There's a lot of interest in more harmonisation between the standards and the tools. Um, but I would say that uh, one of the one of the main things would be um, maybe a better understanding of the mitigations in the future years. And we're trying to do that with some of the reports that are coming through that John's been talking about. Thank you, Nick. I'd agree. It's around you know those. Uh, breeds of um, crops and how they can adapt to future climate change risk uh, and low inputs and then working with farmers to understand when they're deploying those crops or maybe current technologies like biostimulants where do they work and how well do they work and is it a consistent picture so that you know other farmers can see where the pitfalls are and how they can adapt it to be used within their farm system. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I've got plenty of questions that have come through from the audience. First one we're going to look at is how confident are we that crop nutrient requirements throughout the season are accurate? He wants to take that one, Ian. Um, they are pretty accurate now. There's a lot of work being done over the years of measuring total biomass and actually analysing what's in the crop. Not, not taking the guidelines, but certainly we, we've done it for the last 10 years, we've kind of rewritten the actual guidelines of what's required because mm -hmm. it's not sitting at 3% dry matter for nitrogen all the way through. It's higher earlier on and, and less later on. So we're quite comfortable we've got those numbers. Um, biomatic growth, again, that is very much dependent on moisture. So you can't, you can't just say at T1, it'll be this T. It, it's very much based on how your crop is growing. So again, it, for the agronomy side of things, it's hard work. We've got to go out there and know what the biomass is to then create your nutrient plan. It's not a case of doing it by the computer yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm very comfortable we have the numbers, we've just got to make it live in field, which causes a bit more work by going and measuring it. Thank you very much, Ian. And the related question that we have was, um, how confident can we be that nutrient cycling from plant matter results in a reduced nutrient requirement in the following crop? So I guess we're talking about maybe cover crops. Um, Cash yeah, crops also. Uh, another one for you in. It's, it's, it's the same as if you uh, put manure on, how much of that nutrition in that manure is going to come into your next crop? That there are guides, mm -hmm. you know, 30, 50, 60 percent. My view is it depends on A, how we put it into the soil, B, how biologically active that soil is mm -hmm. to break some of it down. Um, so again, it, it, it all depends. There's no, I can't, we can't sit here and talk about silver bullet. There is no silver bullet that says it'll be 3 percent, 20 percent. It's a kind of calm down, drawback. Where are our soils on the, the, the functionality scale? The more mm -hmm. functional your soils are, the more of that crop will return to your next crop. But again, we need to get it not standing in the air. We want to go green to brown. So we want to push our cover crops, manures, mm -hmm. uh, residues to the soil to let the microbes do what they want to do to then convert it back up again. Uh, and of course, overlaying all of that at the moment is that you've got the weather and, you know, Going out and about yeah. where I live, you can see the uh, impact of the heavy rain. A lot of the crops are yellow in the fields because that, that nutrient's just been knocked out by you know, the heavy rainfall. So you can still put the cover crop in, but if there's a lot of rain, things start to soil. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And we've got a question for Henny, um, specifically about the clover trials. So what rate was the clover drilled at? And could you keep the clover left over from a three-year red clover ryegrass sward where the ryegrass has been removed? Henny. Um, so the clover was drilled, I believe, at seven and a half kilos a hectare. Um, might mm -hmm. have to double-check that, but I think that was right. Um, and then the second part of the question, um, 
I think there might be an issue with um, additional weeds present after that three year lay. So I think you may struggle um, from that side. I think also um, getting a, a cash crop established into quite a well established three year lay, I think you may struggle with that. So you'd really have mm -hmm. to look at knocking back that, um, back that lay as much as possible if you were to then go in with a crop. Um, if you maybe were implementing sort of a strip tillage system, I think that would probably reduce the risk. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, you've got to think about how that cash crop is going to get away from that lay initially. Okay, that's great. Good insight. Thank you. The next question is for Nick. Um, biodiversity links the consumer to the environment. Is there an opportunity to monitor, generate and trade biodiversity credits to commodity buyers? I think the answer is yes. Yeah, the, the, the answer is yes. Um, it's an interesting question. I've been involved with this topic since about 2015. It's been quite a long journey. So biodiversity net gain as a concept is coming through the planning system and is now going to be a mandatory requirement within a year or so now, less than a year probably, for new development. It's taken a long time to come through and there's been a huge amount of work done by DEFRA and Natural England on, on biodiversity net gain. So that will lead to what's called biodiversity credits, mm -hmm. which can be traded. And there's going to be a demand and there will be an environmental market for biodiversity as well as carbon. So it's a little bit behind carbon at the moment, but it will come through with the mandatory requirement in planning for biodiversity net gain. For farmland, um, there's this, this, could be, this could be a potential extra source of income. And there are some organizations at the moment that are starting to gear up their their trading around and preparing for biodiversity net gain it needs to be looked at quite carefully in in the sense that um you know do have a look at contracts that are coming through what are you expected you're signing up to um so there's some caution around it but but it will be um it will be developed as quite a formal uh, formal voluntary market and and it will grow in the coming years so this could lead to yeah, um, biodiversity credits um, within the landscape and, and there's no reason why that can't be on farmland as well as some of the conservation sites that you might expect. Okay, yeah. thank you very much Nick. Uh, I guess it's um, yeah, something to be looking out for and looking at the experiences of what, you know, other farmers around you, what is everybody else doing, again mm. where those conversations are becoming very important working together. Um, um, just say that baselines are going to be really important yeah. in that. It's, it's also going to be important to know what is the state of your land. There will be some gaming of the system. There will be people who will be trying to degrade a site to make it look like their net improvement is, is stronger. So um, there'll be some bad actors probably um, to, to, to look out for on that. So, so there, it's word of caution is if you can, if you can get a good baseline and uh, evidence of the condition of the site that you're thinking of, then that helps to mm -hmm. avoid trouble down the line. Okay. And what about the carbon potential for a farm? Is that something that will be potentially factored in, different soil types? So these schemes are, in, are separate at the moment. So, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, you've got mm -hmm. the Woodland Carbon Code that the Forestry Commission have developed, which is separate to biodiversity net gain. There is some crossover, but generally these have been developed as separate systems. You can use both. You can, within a site, think about whether you can use both of those. But my experience at the moment is that I, I don't think that's happening yet. I think that's something that, that could well happen mm -hmm. in the next couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's three takeaways. So probably look, look out for what's happening in terms of schemes and what we're really talking about. Um, don't be a bad actor and certainly start benchmarking now um, to get your baselines and, and know, know what you're working with. Okay, the next question is back to living mulches. Is it a viable option with the threat of losing glyphosate? I guess an organic system with some... Um, yeah, so <laughs> we've only, uh, with the trials that we've done so far, they've uh, been um, in organic systems, but we have had conventional farmers who do use living mulches, um, but they do also still use glyphosate. Um, I think it is a viable option. Uh, I think there may be needs to be a move for conventional farmers to be more confident in seeing green matter amongst their crops. I think they're quite used to seeing quite bare ground between their crops. Um, and actually, if you allow the clover to get a good cover, it will suppress those weeds. Um, you just need to give it a chance and, um, yeah, hold back on the glyphosate if you can. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, thank you. And I'm being told this is the last question that's in front of us here. I'm just seeing questions one by one. This is the last one we're going to tackle today. On farm trials are becoming more prevalent. Are they reliable enough to take the place of more structured research? Who wants to take that one? Do you want me to well, I was going to say yeah, I'm quite happy yeah. to start and then hand over to you. But yeah. So we're looking at a, a sort of option for something called What Works. And part of that is, you know, maybe having on-farm trials, almost like citizen science type approach. And I think where you've got some common rules, but sufficient numbers of farmers trialling this and providing data, I think you can get, uh, you know, a, a structured and worthwhile answer. And in fact, in many ways, probably more worthwhile than something that comes out of academic research. What's to say that you know, the work that farmers have done has got any less value in the real world than something that's been done on the lab bench? So I'm really very much in favour of having these, I'll call it citizen science, but you know, these sort of farm trials that you know, can try a, a range of techniques uh, and see how they work in the real world. Thank you, Nick. Henny? Yeah, I, I would second that. Um, there's been plenty of research done into how plot trial data doesn't necessarily mm. translate to what we then see on farm. Um, and I, I can confirm that on farm trials are also <laughs> structured, um, just maybe <laughs> in a slightly different way. Uh, and so at the Organic Research Centre, we don't have any of our own land. So all of our projects have to be done on farm. Um, and actually, we found that to be hugely beneficial. It means that we carry out trials on a whole range of soil types, um, a whole range of different systems. And I think it gives you a much better rounded result at the end than maybe if you potentially do, yeah, plot trials in um, less locations. So, yeah, I'm a, we're a big advocate for on-farm trials. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Henny, Ian, Nick, and um, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, thank you very much for your presentations and answering our questions. It's been fantastic. And I guess all that's left to say is, is just, well, thanks to all of our speakers that have uh, been here throughout the day. Um, and thank you to the team behind the scenes who've made it all happen. I can see them all in front of me. Um, uh, and thank you to the audience for, for your fantastic questions and, and joining us live. Um, just as a reminder, please do uh, complete the feedback form, which will be with you after this um, session. And thank you for joining us. Hope you have a lovely rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>